live through the night now on BBC One. Let's join Laura Koonsberg and the BBC team for results and analysis from across the country in today's local elections. Good evening. The polls are closed and our politicians might just be getting nervous, waiting for the verdict of millions of you who've been voting today in this year's council elections. Power is up for grabs and reputations are on the line. Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister in the autumn after the turmoil that brought down Boris Johnson and saw off Liz Truss. But in a year, Mr Sunak might be fighting his own general election. So what will the public say about him and his party tonight? Sir Keir Starmer spent this morning bashing the phones, reminding people to vote. He has been miles ahead in the opinion polls, but now real ballots have been cast. Can he rely on the same support? How close is Labour really to number 10? The Lib Dems want to get the big wheels turning. Their leader, Sir Ed Davey, used a tractor on the campaign trail to smash through a metaphorical wall of Tory support. But in the next few hours, we will know if he's actually been able to turn blue seats yellow. These elections will decide who runs more than 230 English councils, but they'll also give us the biggest picture of public opinion since Rishi Sunak took over, and possibly the last before the general election. Rita Chakrabarti is here to help us crunch the numbers, Rita. I'll be analysing the results as they come in. These are the seats that each party is defending. We'll see how those numbers change overnight. Professor Sir John Curtis will, of course, steer us through the tips and trends as the night goes on. And our political editor, Chris Mason, will help us figure out what it might all mean for those vying for power. Some of them will be with us live. Politicians, join us here and from around the country. So stick with us. It is election night on the BBC, and some of those all-important results have already started to come in. A very warm welcome to you for election 2023. Tens of millions of you have had the chance to have your say in England today after a wild political year. It's the first time that the ballot boxes have been out since the exit of Boris Johnson, the implosion of Liz Truss and the arrival in number 10 of Rishi Sunak, not so long after he became an MP in 2015. These elections are a reflection on his short time in office so far, but of course, Local elections do what they say on the tin as well. They decide who runs the authorities that have big responsibilities for things that are important in our lives. Schools, care, of course, the bins. So the results are a judgment on what's going right or wrong locally, as well as what's happened in Westminster. And we have, even at this start of the programme, had some results already. We've got six seats in. Guess where? From Sunderland. Of course, the part of the country where the counters are always the fastest first. I think we've actually just had the seventh result come in, but we can see there in our giant tower, Labour have got six seats, taking two, the Lib Dems one. And an interesting thing there, two of those seats in Labour wards have been taken from UKIP, who did very well the last time. We're going to be out and about around the country throughout the night. Look, the counters there hard at work in Leicestershire. I think we can show you some pictures also of Stoke, which is the kind of part of the country where politicians have been falling all over themselves to press the flesh with voters. And Medway in the southeast, counting underway there too. So we'll be checking in with our teams on the ground. I think we've got BBC representatives at about 50 counts, so we'll hear from right across England. Let's start tonight, though. Um, Chris, tell us for each of the main leaders then. Let's start with the Prime Minister, his first big test. What's on the line for Rishi Sunak? A lot's on the line because it's the kind of first verdict for him of the election, as it is for any political leader, isn't it, on a night like this? Because for all of the focus that there is at Westminster, inevitably on opinion polls, they can be dismissed by a political leader saying, well, you know, it's just an opinion poll. These are real votes in real ballot boxes, electing real politicians who will be running vital public services. And that matters, obviously, at a local level in terms of who provides those services. But it matters massively to the mood of the of the national parties. Now, what Rishi Sunak has managed to do in stabilising the Conservative Party over the last six or seven months is 
push back any sense within the party that they're in in the mood to start another start mm. another civil war. But but it matters massively for him and for the government to give them a sense of how they are how they are faring. And obviously for the other parties as well, in particular for Labour. So when you look at what the, the parties are saying, Conservatives are expecting to go backwards. Labour are expected to go forwards, as are the Liberal Democrats and the Greens in places as well. But in that Conservative Labour tussle, it's going to be about extent. So to what extent do the Conservatives go backwards? To what extent do Labour go forwards? And therefore, how do the parties feel by tomorrow tea time when we've got a proper sense of the spread of the results in terms of what it may or may not mean? for the general election expected next year. So for Rishi Sunak, he's got to show the extent to which he's been able to slow the decline. For Keir Starmer, where's the pressure? Because he's been miles ahead in those national opinion polls for such a long time, but it's whether that's real, what happens in the real world? Exactly, is it real? So, so he has managed and Labour have managed to find themselves in the last six, seven months in, in a p position via those opinion polls that they could have never dreamt of just a couple of years ago, given the whacking that they took at the, mm. at the last general election. But so much about the psychology of politics is a sense of momentum. And if you have, as Labour have had in the last six months, massive opinion poll mm. leads and then you get real votes in real ballot boxes and maybe let's see mm. it's not quite as big as that then then that will be tricky i guess psychologically because there might be a sense of Ooh, maybe it's not as strong as as they might have thought it, it might be and that's why you're already getting on my phone the mm. spin coming in from the various parties lots of comparisons this sounds quite wholesome but hey it's an election night it's a wholesome analysis we can throw in <laughs> there's lots of comparisons already being made with 1995, I'm local sure we'll elections get to that in, in 1995, <laughs> where there was a massive gap. Labour yeah. were doing incredibly well. The Conservatives were doing very badly. A couple of years before, Labour did very well at a general election, and 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 the, the parallels will be drawn uh, about with tonight and any prospective mm. result come next year in the. Well, if you're election. a nerd like you and me, then it has been a favourite parlour game to play. I'm sure some of you have played that at home if you're watching a local election program at nearly midnight. Is this 1991? <laughs> where Labour went on to lose in 1992? Or is it 1995 when, of course, they went on to have a landslide? I'm sure we'll get to that discussion at some point in the night. One little snippet hearing of significant potential Labour gains in Plymouth, where they've been busy and very hopeful of trying to take that council back, but we'll be there on the ground and thinking about that later on. But where else should we be looking out for? Rita, where should we look? There's so much going on tonight, Laura. Just want to show you, first of all, the seats that each party is defending. You've got a quick snapshot right at the top of the programme. The Conservatives are defending 3,300 or so. Labour on just over 2,000 and the Lib Dems uh, 1,200. But the councils that we are going to be watching overnight, these are the councils that each of the three main parties are defending. These over here are hung. Let's start with the Conservatives. We've got Brentwood at the top of the list, Brentwood in Essex. And it's top because it is a very uh, marginal council for the Conservatives. They have a majority of three seats and it's the Liberal Democrats who are their main opponents here. The Lib Dems used to run this council in the 1990s and last year they started nibbling away into the Conservatives' support. So we'll be watching that very closely. The Lib Dems are also the main opposition in Windsor and in South Gloucestershire. So Windsor and Maidenhead, Maidenhead, Theresa May's constituency seat. South Gloucestershire is near Bristol. Both those councils, there's a big challenge being launched by the Liberal Democrats. Then in northwest Leicestershire, which is around Ashby de la Zouche, and East Lindsay, which is in Lincolnshire, around uh, Skegness, uh, the Conservatives are in danger of losing those councils to no overall control. And then there's a whole swathe of councils in this Conservative list, uh, which are Conservative now, but used to be Labour under Tony Blair. Uh, and they include Harlow, Tamworth, Basildon, Redditch, Medway, Dudley. And for Labour, the challenge is to see whether they can really come back in these councils, either take them or significantly improve on their performance, uh, if we're to believe that they are indeed on their way back to national power. Under the Labour councils, Bolsover at the top, um, that is a, a Labour council uh, in Derbyshire. Uh, it is where uh, Dennis Skinner was the MP for many, many years, but there is now a Conservative MP since the last general election. Um, Stevenage, uh, is Labour as well, um, and it has been since the 1970s. But uh, in 2021, the Labour Party lost five 
seats to the Conservatives there, so there clearly is some volatility going on there. Uh, Exeter, Lincoln's interesting too, so that has been Labour since 2011, um, but at the general election they lost the seat to the Conservatives, and it's a fairly marginal seat. The MP has a majority of about three and a half thousand, so that is an area where Labour wants to be coming back quite strongly. For the Liberal Democrats, we've got Hull at the top because it's an ultra-marginal for them. They have have a majority of one seat there. They took this council from Labour uh, last year, so Labour is going to be taking the challenge to the Lib Dems there. Um, in North Devon and in Cotswold, uh, the Lib Dems have a small majority as well of just two seats. So we'll be watching those very closely. And among the hung councils, well, Plymouth is a top Labour target, as uh, Laura's just said, Portsmouth a top Lib Dem target. And a word for these three councils down here at the bottom, Rochford in Essex, West Lindsay and Boston in Lincolnshire. They're all hung, but they were Conservative uh, at the last election and they've become hung through defections. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see whether the Conservatives can take them back. So a great deal to be watching. Laura. So thanks very much. I'm glad you're here to keep us right through all of that detail and that map of the country and all of those graphics there. Now, in a couple of minutes, we're going to hear from our political guests. I want to introduce them. Paul Scully, Technology Minister in the government. West Street in the Shadow Health Secretary wants to be the Labour Health Secretary if you're lucky enough to win the general election. And Sarah Olney, who's here for the Liberal Democrats. Welcome to all of you. We'll hear from them in a few minutes time. The first hold of a council has just come in. Halton, which is in Cheshire, but the sort of Liverpool side of Cheshire, that's been held by the Labour Party. Not a surprise, but that's the first council hold result to come in tonight. Um, let's take a closer look, though, at what happened in, what's been happening in Sunderland. Now, they are still counting there. There's still 14 seats to declare. Now, that's somewhere where Labour was always going to be the biggest party, but they were very desirous, really wanting to show progress. They've got 37 seats there, 12 to the Liberal Democrats, 10 to the Conservatives. Um, you can see that Labour have gained two and UKIP, of course, who were standing candidates in 2019, were down two. So an interesting result there in Sunderland. Let's hear from somebody with a giant brain who's going to help us with all of this through the night, Sir John Curtis. Now, just from that initial result, John, does that tell us anything or suggest anything in a wider sense at this stage of the night? It does. Um, we've got results, actually, most, as you said, from Sunday. We've also got a couple from Newcastle. Um, now, one is a very Remain voting area, Viz Newcastle, the other very uh, Leave voting area, Viz Sunderland. Um, so what we're looking, however, is pretty consistently in these wards is a swing from Conservative to Labour, of around the order of 5% typically uh, as compared with 2019 and also certainly three or four points as compared with last year. So it's very early doors, but certainly the expectations of the opinion polls, which were that indeed the Labour Party was going to make a significant advance in these local elections and perhaps with a capital P at this stage on a scale that might be commensurate with what we would expect from the opinion polls, uh, that so far at least at least looks possible for the results in Newcastle and Sunderland. I think one other thing we should point out to people is the turnout is down, both as compared with last year and as <coughs> compared with 2019. Now, of course, again, it's early uh, early picture, but if that were to continue, then I think we might begin to get some discussion during the course of the night about whether or not the requirement to uh, show voter ID has in fact had an impact on the level of uh, participation in these local elections. I'm sure we will discuss that fact. There's already been a statement from the Electoral Commission about that and there have been lots of anecdotal reports of things going on around in the country and we'll do our best to give people a full picture of what effect the introduction of voter ID at these elections has actually had on people. But John, before we get into the debate with the politicians, mm -hmm. give us what the real benchmarks we should be looking for. Yeah, well, well, well you, you'll have heard a great deal, Laura, about the seats that will be gained or lost. But what we have to very gently point out that is that of the 8,000 seats that are uh, up for election uh, today, 5,000 of them are in the relatively small Shire Tory districts, which are certainly not typical of the country as a whole. Many of them are, have whole council elections, where as a result, 
Each ward is not just electing one councillor, but two or three. So quite small shifts of votes can result in quite dramatic shifts of seats. So the picture created by seats gained and lost is frankly at risk of not giving us a clear impression of what's going on in England, uh, let alone uh, what the implications might be more broadly. So in the end, and I'm afraid this isn't something we'll be able to do tonight, but in the end we will need to look at the votes and to try to turn those votes into a measure we use every year, the so-called BBC projected national share, which is our attempt to say, well, look, if the whole of the country had had local elections on Thursday, given the way that people behaved in the places that did have local elections, what do we think the re result would be? And the point about that is we are then no longer comparing with what happened in 2019, which, by the way, was a very unusual year with both Conservative and Labour doing badly. But rather, we can then compare across the piece. And as uh, Chris Mace has been pointing out, some people are quite keen, uh, not quite sure why, to make a comparison with 1995. But doubtless we will get to that at some <laughs> point. Um, but the crucial thing perhaps here to point out is the opinion polls are saying Labour are now in a stronger position relative to the Conservatives than they have been at any point since 2010. So certainly the simplest of benchmarks is to say, well, if Labour are going to prove that they are in a better position, then they should, on the PNS measure, be doing better than at any point since 2010. Well, our viewers might want to take note that the best performance by Labour since 2010 was under Med Miliband in 2012, when there were seven points ahead. But we might also point out that, and this gets us back to 1995, uh, you know, before Tony Blair won in 1997, Labour regularly had double-digit leads of varying sizes. The Conservatives also, by the way, had double-digit leads under David Cameron before 2010. So I think if Labour really want to demonstrate that they really are breaking through amongst the electorate, then they would probably like to be at least in double-digit territory. But it's, I'm afraid it'll be a long time before we'll be able to give you a, a clear idea of what's going. In the meantime, if you start hear us talking about swings to from Conservative Labour of 5, 6, 7 percent, you will know that Labour are doing pretty well. OK, I'm sure we'll get into that in a few minutes with our political panel. But I want to take you around the country and show you some pictures of what's going on at the Medway count. Thousands and thousands of people across the country busily tonight getting on, cracking open the ballot boxes, that magical moment where the decisions that you made actually translated into real results. Keir Starmer has been in Medway. There he was. I think he was there yesterday. And when you see a political leader in a part of the country, that means it is somewhere they are hopeful of taking because they don't waste their time going to places where they don't think they've got a hope. And it is somewhere where they want to be seen pressing the flesh. And our reporter, Anna Collinson, is there in Medway for us tonight. Anna, tell us, what's the significance of that part of the country? Yeah, good evening, Laura. Uh, so welcome to a very bustling count in uh, Gillingham. Uh, we were expecting it to be a very long night of counting, expected not to get a result until around 6 or 7 a.m. Uh, the returning officer said right at the beginning, while speed is important, accuracy is more so. So everyone's sort of taking heed of his words. For those who don't know that much about Medway, what you really need to know is aside from a blip in the 90s, it really has been dominated by the Conservatives since the 70s and the local authority has been in power for 20 years. Um, it's got three local MPs, all Conservative, as, it's, as is its mayor. But as you mentioned, Keir Starmer and the Labour Party see this as a really ambitious target. Keir Starmer came on here on his first day of campaigning and also was here yesterday afternoon, hours before polls opened with Angela Rayner, his deputy leader. They see this as a really important area for them to take hold of. I've been speaking to some Labour activists who've told me that they've said they've been speaking to people on the door, a lot of uh, lifelong Tory voters who say that they've turned their backs on the Conservatives, they won't be voting Tory this time after everything that's happened with Boris Johnson and Partygate and with Liz Truss and the emergency budget. There's also a sense of quite a lot of voter apathy and that is a concern for the Labour activists here tonight, that there might be a low turnout and people might not turn out. And Anna, just tell us quickly, have you heard anything, even anecdotally, about voter ID? That might be a theme of the night, but from your conversations with people being on the ground, have you heard anything about that? 
Yeah, so it's interesting. When I um, was in Medway yesterday, I did one walk from one end to the other and I asked every single person whether they were going to vote or not about photo ID and every single person knew they needed it. So that was my sort of anecdotal, very unscientific take on what's going on. But I was speaking to a Labour activist this evening and he said that he was very concerned about the voter ID, that people had told them that they wouldn't be voting because they didn't have the ID and he was worried they wouldn't appear in the data. Uh, so that's what I've heard from one person tonight on that. OK, and I thanks very much. I'm sure we'll check in with you a bit later on. Thanks for now. Right, Sarah, Wes, Paul, very welcome, very warm welcome to you here in the election 2023 studio tonight. Let's start on that issue. We do not know at this stage if voter ID is going to be a big problem of the night. But Sarah, I saw you nodding when Anna was saying that earlier. Have the Lib Dems heard significant evidence of this? Do you have a picture of it? Well, it's just anecdotal, but I mean, some of the things that we've been hearing are quite concerning. I've, I've been hearing, again, anecdotally about voters who, for example, are registered on the electoral register in their married name, but their passport that they've brought with them is in their maiden name. Obviously, a lot of women will be in that situation uh, and haven't been allowed to vote. I'm only talking anecdotally, but one of the things that really concerns me is that I don't think the government... Uh, have planned to really uh, collect the robust data that we really need to see to see what kind of impact this has had. We know there's been a bit of uh, confusion about the role of greeters, for example, outside the polling station. Mm. And if you've arrived at your polling station today and been greeted by someone mm. and told that you don't have the appropriate ID, then the polling centre staff won't be writing down your name mm. as somebody who's been turned away. So we won't even know, I think, after the election quite what impact that's had. And never mind, as your reporter was saying there, people who haven't even come to the polling station because they didn't have the right ID to start with. We should emphasise, though, that we've got no idea at this point how widespread it is. But it's interesting, the Electoral Commission have put out a statement. We can show you what they've said. They've said, we already know from our research that the ID requirement posed a greater challenge for some groups in society and that some people were regrettably unable to vote today as a result. They go on to say it'll be essential to understand the extent of the impact and the reasons behind it. Um, Paul Scully, there was a pretty vigorous debate in Westminster about whether or not this was the right thing to do. Yeah. The opposition parties articulated concerns. The Electoral Commission is admitting tonight there were some people who weren't able to vote. I think the... Uh but the, electoral, the chief exec of the electoral returning officers has said uh, in his view that um, it's, it's worked pretty well. It hasn't had um, uh, much an effect. But we do need to see. We clearly need to see after this. I think when it was introduced by a Labour government back in, in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, yeah. It's been up and running ID, there for a while. Yeah. The, 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 Nor the then Northern Ireland minister said um, at the time it was introduced. It was introduced well it would, and there was it had no um, effect on um, suppressing the vote there. But the Electoral Commission is so, saying already it has done. Well, some people no, were unable to vote but and that's not good enough, is What it? we've got to find out is whether those people weren't able to vote at the time or whether they went back and got their ideas, as we've heard a, a couple of examples. But it's not good enough to use anecdotes. To, we've got to make sure that we can actually, uh, yeah, and, you know, and we just, should be uh, very, take, very take clear a view on this. That we, have to, that we have to, um, you know, wait and see. But clearly the Electoral Commission are already saying on the record there has been an issue. But important to point out, we don't know how big it is. We can see some shots of the count in Bolton. It's another part of the country where people have been working hard. That's a council that has been in no overall control for the last while. Um, from what we've seen so far, West Street, what would be your expectation of tonight? Well, I think Labour's expecting a good night. We've run a really good campaign. We've stayed throughout on the issues that voters really care about, cutting the cost of living, cutting NHS waiting times, cutting crime. And whether it's holding the Conservatives to account for their record of failure over the last 13 years or putting across Labour's positive uh, plan nationally, as well as all of those brilliant local campaigns, I think we can be really proud of the campaign that we've run. I hope that's reflected in the results overnight. I expect that will be re reflected in the results overnight. And I think it demonstrates, actually, from where we were in 2019 when these elections were last fought, which, of course, was before we were brought to a crushing defeat in the general election, that the Labour Party in terms of policy, in terms of organisation and in terms of leadership uh, is very much back in business and in a position where we can win the next general election. And, and beyond tonight, that will be the focus of the coming months. So I doubt the Prime Minister is going to be in a hurry to call one uh, by the time he sees all the results come in. But whenever that election is, we'll be ready. Well, we can see there's some Labour activists looking extremely happy and stoke. Hugs all round already, it appears. We don't know anything about the results there yet, but people are clearly happy about something. But it's interesting, though, John Curtis very clearly has laid down the gauntlet. He said you have to be looking at a double-digit lead 
in the projected share, which is a long way off. That's mm. going to be sometime tomorrow afternoon. But are you confident that you'll I mean, get look, to that kind of To be of honest, level? whether it's um, very respected people like John Curtis or some of the absolutely shocking punditry Paul's party has been putting out in the last few hours. Um, we know what the challenge is. We are looking at these results closer than anyone else because what we will be judging ourselves against is are we making progress in those communities, in those constituencies that Labour will need to win in order to form a government? That's the test we set ourselves, regardless of the test anyone else sets us. But it's important and I think we will be seeing progress though, in those areas. But it's important for our viewers, though, to understand what the benchmarks are. And John Curtis says the benchmark for you is a double digit lead in the national share. Are you confident you're going to get that? Well, we'll see as the results come in. I'm, I'm not daft enough to uh, make predictions of what this time of night, but um, I think we're in for a, for a. I think we're in for a good night, and I'm I'm very proud of the campaign the Labour Party's run. I haven't seen a campaign like this for, from the Labour Party for some years, actually, and I think that will be reflected in the results that we see. Chris, just uh, one source, Laura, chipping in uh, from uh, Labour HQ, watching our analysis and hearing Sir John's analysis a little uh, a little earlier around. Uh, what was described as a very high bar of a double-digit lead mm. and saying that uh, an eight-point lead uh, would be their best result since uh, 1997. A couple of other things just I'm hearing, Laura. Uh, Lib Dems uh, getting very excited about Hinckley and Bosworth mm. in the Midlands. They think there has been, or they claim there has been, a total Tory collapse, as it was described to me. Uh, the Conservatives are nervous, very nervous, about Windsor and Maidenhead in Berkshire and bits of Kent, uh, more optimistic uh, in the northeast of England in Darlington and Redka, and uh, Labour pretty chipper about Plymouth. Now, let's test that out then with Sarah. Um, Chris just gave a list of places where the Lib Dem sound pretty happy. Can I add one? Yeah, but, <laughs> but by all means, we're, we're here for tips and trends and your insights. I've just heard from Sunderland. We've taken a seat off the Tories there, which puts us, makes us the official opposition now on Sunderland Council, which is fantastic news and really, really a huge tribute to uh, Sunderland Liberal Democrats. But I mean, I, we're really looking forward to the results coming in. We're, we're preparing ourselves actually for a really, really good night. We've had a brilliant campaign uh, up and down the country. Um, and uh, we, we think we're going to make real progress, real gains. And that's coming off the back of 700 seats that we won, you know, the last time these were up. So, we're, you know, it's, uh, we're not just holding on to those fantastic gains we made, but making even more progress. And I am going to press you on your adjectives. So a good night. What does that mean? So someone in your party said to me, well, if we get over 200, that will really be pretty good. Less than that. Mm, go on. I'd be happy with 200. That sounds good to me. But I mean, I think the important thing for us is that we're not only making progress in some of those uh, constituencies that we're looking to win at the next general election, but we're making progress in all sorts of places where, you know, that aren't target seats for us. Sunderland, as I was just saying, mm -hmm. Windsor and Maidenhead is not somewhere that we have, uh, you know, had much uh, representation before, but we are hoping potentially that we might even take that. And places like Decorum in Hertfordshire also mm -hmm. going really, really well. Uh, South Gloucestershire, we've mentioned, East Cambridgeshire, we think, all across the country. And, you know, some Labour facing seats, although primarily uh, we're looking at taking seats off the Tories. And you mentioned there that challenge for the Lib Dems, you're trying to face both ways, but actually all of the big parties are doing that. You're hold, trying to hold off the Liberal Democrats in Hull while trying to take seats off Tories in the other places, and you are fighting both mm. the other parties on several fronts. All three of you, thank you very much for now. You're staying with us. Worth reminding, as Sarah was saying, that the last time these council seats were fought, was in 2019. Now that's not 2019 when there was a general election when Boris Johnson stormed it and seemed to redraw the map. It was the 2019 local elections. Cast your mind back, that was a completely different political world. Theresa May was still in charge, although hanging on by her fingernails. Jeremy Corbyn was still the leader of the Labour, the Labour Party. Um, Vince Cable was still the leader of the Lib Dems. So we must remember that when we're talking about the last time these council seats were fought, it was a completely different political universe. So bear that in mind when we're thinking about things and seats changing hands around the country. Let's get out around the country now. Let's go to Nisha Chopra in northwest Leicestershire. Now, currently the council there, Nisha, has got a small conservative majority, but are those with the blue rosettes looking nervous tonight? 
Oh, they very much are. I mean, this particular area, there are 38 council seats up for grabs. So it's quite a simple one to understand. That's 38 council seats. That's each ward has one councillor. And as you said, in 2019, yes. the Conservatives just held on to a majority of 20 seats. Later, two Labour councillors actually defected to the Tories. But that's the picture here tonight. The Tories are very much worried that Labour are going to gain here. And interestingly, interestingly enough, I turned up here and I wasn't expecting as many Tory candidates as, I, as I've seen. And I've just spoken to the district council leader, Richard Blunt, and he basically said, we're going to need some independence. So suggesting that it's going to go to no overall control. And that's what we're seeing here. And I wonder also, there's been controversy there locally because the MP, Andrew Bridgen, who was a Conservative MP, he's recently been booted out of the party over some of the very controversial things he said. But it was, you know, I remember from covering the referendum campaign, it was a place where Boris Johnson turned up and there was huge excitement for him. It was a place where the Conservatives felt were, you know, pretty secure in terms of the, 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 the uh, result. But do you think what's happened with Andrew Bridgen and maybe also what's happened with Boris Johnson has had an impact on people's views there. Well, definitely, because if we look back to 2019, when it was all about Brexit, Boris and Andrew Bridgen were very much hand in hand. He was vote leave and many people backed him on that. And they voted to, you know, come out of Brexit in North West Leicestershire. But that has changed now. And many people are saying, is there going to be an Andrew Bridgen effect here? Because, yes, as you said, because of his comments on COVID, he basically was expelled from the Tory party. So he's now standing as an independent. I haven't seen him just yet, but it'll be interesting to see whether that's had an impact. I actually did ask some people in the ex-mining uh, town of Colville, um, who is it's normally a, a Labour stronghold, I asked, you know, has Andrew Bridgen had an effect here? And they said, you know, they, they, they don't really care about him so much. So that's quite interesting. Perhaps for, for local people, you know, he's I've also heard that he's been very much seen as a pantomime dame over the years, but he has very much supported what local people believe in, especially on issues like HS2, which he's very much opposed to, as well as most recently in Kegworth, a sleepy village town, there was an issue over asylum seekers being housed in a local hotel there, which happened overnight, and Andrew Bridgen was very much against that. So he has been at loggerheads with national government decisions over, over the years, so perhaps there may be some people that do support him, despite the fact that he's now defected, well, he's now been expelled from the Tory party. Nisha, thanks so much. Interesting stuff. And a reminder, in these kinds of elections, in any election, there's always contrib contributions from both the local and the national going on in voters' brains. Um, let's go to another part of the country, not that far from where Nisha was. Let's talk to our political editor in the Midlands, Lizzie Glinka. Now, you are in Stoke in Staffordshire. As you said a bit earlier, that's the kind of part of the country where, you know, people innocently going about their business might be challenged by a political leader at almost any time of day or night during an election because they fight very bitterly over it. What's your sense of the way it's going to go tonight? Yeah, absolutely, Laurie. You could meet a front bencher on any corner in Stoke-on-Trent over the last few weeks. Uh, this is a very hotly contested uh, election here in the Potteries. So, Labour lost this council back in 2015. That was kind of the beginning of a downward spiral for Labour in this part of the world. Uh, in 2019, uh, they, uh, this council went to no overall control. At uh, the same year that all three of the MPs in the city, which had been Labour, went Conservative. And the Conservatives are the largest party on the council, so they've been running it for the last four years. Now, Labour have thrown resources here over the last few weeks. Lots of campaigning. The Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, launched his uh, crime uh, platform here in the city. No coincidence. And a, a big focus because they would love to take back control here. However, I don't know if they're going to have it all their own way. There's an added complication here in the potteries of quite a number of very well-known, embedded in the community independents, which will make it more difficult for them. And also we think that turnout, we are hearing that we think turnout is going to be quite low here in the city. So that may make things difficult for Labour as well. However, very early days, but as you saw, there was some celebrating going on uh, here in Stoke earlier. That was a Labour hold. And we are hearing from Conservatives sources that they think they've lost one of their seats to Labour. They think they've lost Abby Holton. Uh, we don't know that yet for certain.
certain, but it is conservative sources who are telling us that. So um, uh, very early days here, but it's definitely one to watch. And Lizzie, when we think more broadly about that part of the country, I mean, we're showing viewers some of the councils in that part of the world. You've got Dudley, Redditch, Worcester. Now, these are important, of course, for local reasons, but it's a bit like a roll call also of those kinds of places that will be vital marginal seats when it comes to a general election and lots of places where Labour lost out at the last time round. Yeah. What's your sense of the wider balance of support there at the moment? Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, traditionally, you would always think of the Midlands as the bellwether in England for elections anyway. I think that's perhaps even more so the case now because as well as the, as the traditional bellwethers, places like Worcester or Stafford, we have got these areas that formerly referred to as the Red Wall in Stoke-on-Trent and the Black Country where Labour have to get back. They've got to show progress here if they've got any hope of uh, forming the next government after the next general election. Now, I think the sense on the ground is that people are a little bit trepidatious. We've got those national polling uh, figures that show Labour far ahead, but in some of these communities, we're still trying to sense whether the changes that happened over the last five or six years, that big shift we saw in 2019, whether for some people that is a permanent shift on issues like immigration. Do some of the people who voted for the Conservatives for the first time in 2019, do they now feel more at home with the Conservative Party than with the Labour Party, who they may have voted for you know, previously for the rest of their lives? So that is a kind of interesting thing that we're sort of watching here in the Midlands. Uh, to see whether that is borne out in these local council elections. I think in places like Dudley and Warsaw that you mentioned, Labour are hoping to make gains there, but because the councils are only up by thirds, we're less likely to see perhaps Labour taking control of those councils. However, if they do have a storming night and do brilliantly well, there is a chance they could take back control in somewhere like Warsaw. Lizzie, thank you very much indeed for that. Amazing how the phrase take back control is something used by all the political parties now. Become part of the political lexicon, hasn't it? But we all remember where it came from in the beginning. Um, we do have some more results that have come through. Let's just take a skip through some of the latest ones. Newcastle Council has been held by Labour, South Tyneside 2, Halton 2 um, in Cheshire on the Liverpool side. None of them are really a surprise. Broxbourne held by the Conservatives and Labour holding Chorley and Sunderland. So some of the latest results of councils holds there. As Lizzie was saying, a reminder that in lots of parts of the country, only a third of the council seats are up for grabs, which means that we might not be seeing many councils themselves actually change hands. It might be more a change here and a change there in the numbers of seats, but we'll be trying to make that clear for you all as the night goes on. I want to show you Brentwood in Essex. The count is going on there. And the reason for telling you that is there's an interesting result there. Now, Brentwood is somewhere where the Conservatives have been pretty secure, but there are some changes already. The Lib Dems have gained a seat from the Tories in Hutton East Ward there. And the interesting thing about it is they've taken it on a 24% swing. In a second ward there, same part of the world in Essex and Brentwood, the Lib Dems have held another seat, but even in that seat they already had, they've had a 14% swing. So those are pretty big numbers when it comes to elections. Um, only very early whispers in the wind, Chris. But, but are, what do you make of what we've seen so far? They're kind of loud whispers, if such a thing is possible, aren't they? <laughs> when you look at those numbers, and quite strikingly, Alex Burgart, the uh, Conservative MP in Brentwood, is saying at the count that he fears the results could be worse than expected for the Conservatives possibly losing their uh, majority there. One of the little uh, nuggets to bring you from the southwest of England in Plymouth, senior Conservatives there uh, predicting something approaching a wipeout and a big majority for Labour. You might recall there's been a row there about trees and the future yeah. of trees in the city. A uh, hugely contentious local issue may or may not have uh, you know, informed voters' minds as they headed to the polling stations, but it's significant movement there, it would appear. That's interesting. And Plymouth, of course, important to both parties when it comes to a general election uh, with those local things, because at the moment, Labour represented there, so are the Conservatives, Indeed. and it's definitely somewhere on Labour's target list. We're going to talk to Rita just in a second about projected national share. Now, John Curtis introduced that concept to us. Yes. The numbers for the next 18 hours will go into a giant calculator and sometime tomorrow afternoon we'll come up with a projection of what 
would have happened today if the whole country had been voting, what that would mean for the share of the parties. How much do the party headquarters look at that? Big time. <laughs> Absolutely, they look at it. Because, of course, there's, there's all of the individual results that we'll unpick through the, the small hours and throughout tomorrow, which will matter on a local level for all the obvious reasons. But once all of those numbers are thrown into Sir John's brain and computer and all of the sophologists pour over it and churn out that number, that is what gives that broader sense of how things might have been today, tonight, mm. tomorrow, had it been a, a general election. Clearly it isn't a general election, people are motivated mm -hmm. for vote, to vote for lots of different reasons and the geography is different, mm -hmm. but the projected national share attempts to take account of that mm -hmm. and then come up with a number uh, which is a massive mood maker mm -hmm. for the parties and gives them a sense of, well firstly, whether their own intelligence turned out to be right, and then secondly, is their campaigning, their techniques, their ground operation, their local media officers, their digital approach, are they working or not? Mm -hmm. Are they focusing on the right areas? Are they putting their resources into the areas where they can maximise the benefit? So hugely important intelligence for them mm -hmm. uh, in the year, 18 months or whatever it turns out to be mm -hmm. between now and the, and the general election. And who knows what will have happened by then, but it will be a statistic that people will look at carefully. Now, Rita, give us the history of this statistic that people obsess over so much. Here it is in graphic form going uh, back two decades. Uh, projected national share, as Laura has described, is our extrapolation of what would have happened if the whole country had voted in local elections in any one year. And you can see that last year, 2022, Labour was on 35%, the Conservatives on 30%, the Lib Dems on 19 and others on 16. But actually, what we want to compare with uh, are the elections that took place in 2019 because the vast majority of the seats that are up uh, tonight uh, were voted on in 2019. And there you can see that both Labour and the Conservatives had a poor night of it, a very poor night, neither of them getting more than 30% of the share of the vote. Uh, and the others who include the Greens and the Independents actually had a much better uh, performance that time. So we'll be looking to see uh, whether both parties do better than they did in 2019 and particularly with Labour given their big lead in the opinion polls we're going to want to see how far ahead of the Conservatives should this be what happens how far ahead they are because it is the gap between the two that is so important is it the double digit lead that some people are talking about is it eight percent we'll be in a position to know that in a few hours time uh, it's important the lead because you if you go back to the high point on this graph for Labour. That was in 2012, uh, where they had a seven-point lead over the Conservatives. But as we all know, Ed Miliband did not become Prime Minister. Seven percentage points at that point was not enough uh, to get him eventually into Downing Street. Um, a word, too, about the Liberal Democrats' performance over time. So 19% last year. Uh, the Liberal Democrats uh, usually poll... Uh, do well in terms of the share of the vote in local elections. Um, but 19% compared to what they were getting uh, in 2004, 2005, where at one point they overtook the Labour Party. Well, you can see if you follow the yellow line down, the plummeting in Lib Dem support that happened after they went into government with the Conservatives. Uh, so uh, lots of food for th thought there. Laura. Thank you very much, Rita. Well, that is a big, big historical picture. And what we're doing in the next few hours is looking at lots of individual little jigsaw pieces as they emerge. One of them's just popped up there. We were just talking about Brentwood in Essex. There's been another Lib Dem gain there, which does mean that the Conservative majority is likely to go, not confirmed, but as Chris was suggesting uh, a moment ago, another little jigsaw piece seems to have just made that more likely. And the local MP has been tweeting about that. Also want to bring you the first news of the Greens. The first green seat um, has been won. They've gained the West Park Ward from Labour in South Tyneside, so up in the northeast of England. Um, and the first green gain of the night. And there may well be, the Green Party has said on the record, they hope to take about another 100 seats in these local council elections. They've got hopes also of taking the first majority council which would be making history for them. So we'll be keeping a close eye on what's happening to the Green Party and we'll be talking to them, of course, through the course of the night. Right, 
Let's get a bit of perspective about what might be going on inside the political parties as they're watching nervously in their headquarters. Maybe people can say things privately to each other. Let's talk to Sonia Soda, who's the chief leader writer at the Observer newspaper, and also Harry Cole, the political editor of The Sun. Welcome to you both. Good to have you with us. Harry, so far, what are you hearing from Tory HQ? Um, actually, they've got a bit quiet, I have to say. There was an initial flurry of activity about 10 o'clock where they were saying that Labour needed to gain thousands and thousands of seats to be on course for, for number 10. But I think most interestingly was what Rishi Sunak said publicly last night. He was out about on the Tory sort of party circuit last night and he said this was going to be a very, very tough evening for the Conservative Party. And so far... We've seen very little to disprove that. I think he's probably right. Those results from Sunderland, which were the only release of data we have so far, um, UKIP were a very high point at the nadir of uh, uh, Theresa May's administration in May 2019 when those seats were last bought, and UKIP did very well. That UKIP vote seems to be splitting for Labour, and that will be a very, very bad sign for the Tories. I can see, Harry, I can't resist mentioning the poster behind your head that says loose lips sink ships. I just wonder if the Tory losses add up to as much as people in Party HQ have been suggesting they might with the thousand seats that we've had a dollop of salt poured all over it in the last few days by um, experts like John Curtis. But the Tory chatter, if this is a bad night, from your assessment of the sort of current state of the party, could Rishi Sunak actually end up in trouble if they are, you know, 800, 900 seats down? I don't, I don't think so. Frankly, the Tories have had a fairly hectic year of changing their leader um, last year. I think they'd lose any shred of credibility if they were even to begin to try to move against another leader this side of an election. I just can't see it happening. That's not to say there's not going to be a lot of grumbling about the direction of travel, perhaps um, the ambition of Rishi Sunak sticking to those five pledges that he's hammering and hammering again. Some MPs will want to hear more from him about his vision, about his leadership and how he's going to win the next election, how he's going to turn it around. But frankly, I think the, the Tories have made their bed now. There's very, very hard for them to even begin to contemplate a, a massive change of direction. Rishi Sunak has been beginning to edge ahead in some of those opinion polls nationally. He's closed the gap. He's nudging ahead as the best leader. But tonight, it looks like so far, and obviously it's very early days, there's very little little so far in the first hours or so of this of, the, of this of these results for Tories to cling to and um, it's going to be a rough um, a rough year for them I mean an election is basically 14 months away and um, on these results it doesn't look great. Um, Sonia when we think about the Lib Dems um, they've you know traditionally local government is where they build back it's where they have their foot soldiers it's where they fight often very successful, sometimes quite testy campaigns. Do you think that they might end up actually by tomorrow afternoon being the ones who feel massively chipper? Well, it's, you know, obviously we haven't had enough results in so far, but the couple that we have had um, are looking quite good, it has to be said, uh, for the Lib Dems. I think the real test for the Lib Dems in these local elections is can they build on where they were in 2019? The really key places to look for will be where they're competitive against the Conservatives. Um, and that will be a real sign, I think, of whether we might see a bit of a comeback from them um, in the next general election when it comes to parliamentary seats. Um, I think they did better than many were expecting uh, in, when, when these seats were last contested in 2019. We've seen some quite positive by-election by results um, for them as well in the last couple of years. Um, and it does feel like, you know, the Lib Dems really did hitch themselves to um, Brexit uh, and, and sort of being on the Remain side of the equation in recent years. And there's no question that that that, that, that harm them somewhat but now it feels like if you look at seats where they're against the Conservatives it does feel like local elect you know they've always done best on local issues and it does look like those are what what are coming to to the fore again and in, in those seats where they are competitive against the Conservatives. And just let's think for a second about this campaign in the last few weeks we're just showing some people people some of the latest results as they've come in actually interesting that the Conservatives have held Harlow and know Labour were hopeful of making gains there but the Tories have held on to it. We'll see later whether seats have changed hands or not. Some other results coming there. Um, some we've already mentioned, Chorley and Sunderland being held by Labour, Broxbourne and Hertfordshire being held by the Tories. But in the last few weeks in this campaign, what has stood out to you? 
Um, do you mean sort of from the Labour p perspective? Um, I mean, I think it is really actually if you look at the polling and the fact that in recent weeks, um, you know, the gap has closed a little bit, but Labour have been, you know, so far ahead in a way that I think lots of people just simply wouldn't have predicted given the general election result in 2019 under Boris Johnson. I mean, obviously, so much has happened since then. So to me, that has been the kind of real standout of our politics over the last few weeks. But this, these set of elections, of course, are Keir Starmer's um, big test. It's one thing when people say in an opinion poll, oh yeah, if there were a general election tomorrow, I'd vote Labour. But will they actually turn out and vote? Local elections aren't a perfect predictor of that, but they are in some ways a more reliable predictor, many people think, than opinion polls. So I think the real question is, you know, Labour's lead that we've been seeing in the polls, is that going to stand up in the set of results that we see from uh, today? Sonia, Soda and Harry Cole, thank you very much indeed for joining us at this late hour. As Sonia was saying now, these are the magic moments elections when everybody's vote, your votes, go into the ballot box and the politicians can only wait and see what you've told them. We can see votes being counted in Bolton, critical part of the country when it comes to the Labour Conservative one-on-one -on -one fight. Ipswich will be there a bit later on in Suffolk. All sorts of interesting things happening in that part of the country. We mentioned earlier the Greens hoping to take the first council as a majority in mid-Suffolk. And also busy bees in Leicestershire. Although maybe some nervous faces. I'm trying to see if there's a rosette on that person chatting there. Oh, it looks like a green rosette. Anyway, people waiting nervously to see what happens as the results start streaming in. Let's go to somewhere where we've already told you about. There is an interesting fight going on, quite an exciting one that could be pretty tight. Let's go to Plymouth in the southwest and our political editor there, Martin. Now, we've already heard, Martin, it's tight there. It's been a tough fight between Labour and the Conservatives. Local controversies, yes. But what do you think this is going to end up as being? What are people telling you right now? Well, uh, we're in quite a remarkable situation where not a single seat has been declared, but I've spoken to a host of senior figures from both the Labour and Conservative camps, and there seems to be a consensus that Labour are heading for a very significant majority, and as one senior Conservative told me, they are facing a uh, wipeout. Now, uh, it is the case that uniquely in the South West, Plymouth, is pretty much a straight fight between the two parties. It does seesaw between them. It is to some extent uh, a barometer of the national political mood. Uh, but on top of that, as you say, there have been some extraordinary local circumstances. So that decision on the eve of the election campaign by the then Conservative leader since resigned to remove all of those trees in the city centre. Uh, but that was just the latest uh, act, if you like, in an unfolding performance of, uh, of, of Tory discord and chaos here in Plymouth. So we had a lot of uh, uh, Tory councillors leaving the group to become independents. And in fact, this is the second year in succession because Plymouth elects in thirds where the Tories have gone into an election campaign having just lost their leader. So last year the leader was toppled and a vote of no confidence. This year he resigned. So you can't imagine really uh, circumstances in which uh, a party was in more disarray going into an election. Interesting though, Martin, you used the word wipe out there. I mean, that sounds like it could be something very embarrassing for the, part, for the Conservative Party. Indeed, and one detail, and I say the caveat here is not a single seat has been declared. Uh, hearing from Labour sources that they've done extremely well in the area of the city which is represented by the Veterans Minister and Plymouth Moorview MP Johnny Mercer. And of course, inevitably, uh, with these elections potentially being uh, the penultimate test of the electorate before a general election, there will be a great deal of interest in uh, uh, whether these kind of results can be carried across uh, onto a potential general election result. Really interesting. And of course, the wider regional implications as well are interesting. One contact has just um, suggested to me there's a massive worry in the Tory party about the South and South West in general. So we'll see if that picture is borne out. Chris, you've just got something to it's chip a, in it's there. It's a nugget picking up on just the conversation mm. you've had and, and just what you were saying there, Laura, which is the Conservatives in Bath and North East Somerset uh, very nervous. Now, we should say this was one of the Lib Dems' best performances back in uh, 2019 when they flipped the council from the Conservatives, but the Conservatives uh, locally there very nervous about how they are going to fare.
Okay, well we've talked a little bit about Brentwood in Essex. Let's take you there and check in with Harry Farley who's there for us tonight. Now Harry, can you <laughs> describe what you're hearing on the ground? We've already talked about it, an interesting picture developing. Yes, very interesting, Laura. This is one of those seats that in the general election, the Conservatives have quite a strong majority. But in the locals here tonight, the Lib Dems are doing very well and they are pushing them hard. The Conservatives have a wafer thin majority on Brentwood Borough Council of just three. And Lib Dems have already tonight made two gains off the Conservatives. So they are pushing the Conservatives hard. They're trying to take off, take the Conservatives majority off them, take it to no over, or, overall control. And I'm even hearing some very optimistic whispers from some some Lib Dems tonight who think they might be able to get, gain a majority when the next set of seats come up next year. So it's a very interesting picture here uh, in, in Brentwood. The Conservatives, I have to say, looking very nervous. And the local MP, Alex Burkhardt, uh, said to me earlier he thinks that uh, the results are going to be worse than he fears. And Harry, we're just going to show people the change in the vote share there in Brentwood because it's very clear when you see it. The Liberal Democrats up 3%, Labour up 4%. The Conservatives down 6%. Now, they're still counting votes. This is not the final picture. But why do you think that has happened from people you've spoken to in that part of the world? Well, we, always, we talk about whether people vote over national issues or local issues. In this part of the world, it's a green belt area on the edges of London, just outside the M25. Housing is a key issue, I'm told, from people across the different parties here. Two uh, new developments Good. in Brentwood uh, in the last few years, approved by the Tory majority on the council. And that's made a number of people, a uh, number of voters in particular, particularly uh, concerned about that. They don't like the new developments in their local area. Uh, and the Lib Dems have been campaigning hard against that uh, new development and so housing a key issue in this part of the world in particular. Harry thanks very much we'll come back to you I think a bit later on thank you for now. Um, Paul Scully you've been the Minister for London you've done lots of different jobs in the government um, but we've heard a few times already tonight how much discontent there seems to be bubbling up and particularly an issue of housing and for people in the South East. Are you worried about what you're hearing concerned? Well look, I think we know We've, we've known this is going to be a, a, a bad night for us, absolutely um, a bad night for us because, you know, we are midterm, it's a difficult um, set of elections for us. We, um, professors uh, Rallings and Thrasher and I think John Curtis at one point were talking about losses of a thousand uh, for us. Um, no, the consensus from most election uh, experts is that that's very much at the well, yeah, worst the, the, end of the, expectation. The, maybe, and, that, and the but, people who came up with that figure have been clear since then. That's at the worst saying, end that, of that, expectation. But that's still, that, that, nonetheless, that's still their figures. Um, and uh, and so, you know, there's lots of good councillors going to be losing their seats tonight. We've Could already, you lose a thousand we've seats We've then? already heard. Well, uh, you know, let's, let, let's see. I mean, it's very, very early days. Uh, there's lots of good councillors going to be losing their seats. We've heard from Wes when they talk about the NHS and all the other things like that. Actually, none of that is going to change as a result of this election. There's going to be lots of council, good councillors running good public services that are going to lose their seats. And I say that as an ex-councillor myself, how, and having lost my seat at the, on the same day as the general election, then you tend to find that constituents often get buyer's regret three and a half years into it when realising what happened. But in terms of housing, there's a really difficult balance to be struck here because everybody, you know, this isn't about what happens within one party, a political party, or even across the parties. It's actually communities because everybody wants more houses that don't necessarily want them next to them. And you so have had 13 years how, to try how do you to come up with something but that how do you people would be happy that, with. How do you square that circle? We've actually built more houses last year than, uh, than I think, the third highest um, house building over the last year, over the last 30 years. So we're doing our best to try and build supply um, but, it, but it is an incredibly difficult dynamic to get right. But if you do lose that thousand seats, which you're, I know you're still sticking to that as a possibility. Yeah. You still think that well, could I mean, happen? It's a, it's a possibility. I mean, you know, let's see, let's see what's happening. Because as I say, if you, you know, none the, you, you know, we are in midterms and, and Rishi Sunak has come in with his five points uh, plan of, you know, halving, halving inflation, growing the economy, reducing the debt, uh, cutting uh, the backlog in the NHS and stopping the boat. But if you lose They're a thousand... Measurable. But we're only quarter of the way through that, through the year. But if you lose a thousand seats, and Theresa May, when she was fighting these seats, lost 1,300. So if you lose a thousand seats, then whatever Rishi Sunak's saying whether he's got a five-point plan, a 20-point plan, or a 1,000-point plan, people aren't going for it. No, what I'm saying is that the, the, that plan has specific outcomes that can be measured. We're, we're quarter of the way through 
um, if, if, the, if even that, of him being able to deliver that. So it's really early doors for him doing that. We've seen the polls start to close, the national polls start to close, but as Chris was saying earlier on, you know, these are uh, far more measurable when you get the, when you get the results um, tomorrow. Uh, but nonetheless, the fact is that people are seeing Rishi, they like what they see it, uh, over the whole, but it's very much job unfinished yet. We've got to go through that process. Well, Wes, you're making faces, so let's see what's on your mind. I just, I, think I find this totally implausible. On one hand, Paul Scully saying, you know, poor local Conservative councillors being punished for national issues. And then in the next breath, he's saying the voters like Rishi Sunak. I mean, let's remember that Theresa May had to apologise to Conservative councillors who lost their seats in that terrible election in 2019 when we were told that the Conservatives had hit rock bottom. And now they're plumbing new depths. And I'm not sure whether when the Conservative Party chairman said we're expecting to lose a thousand seats, whether that was an expectation or an ambition because they have done precisely nothing to speak to the voters' concerns during the course of this Absolutely election. Not. They tried to pretend the elections weren't happening at one point. Remember, Rishi Sunak launched his campaign but didn't tell anyone about it because he was so confident about delivering against his priorities. These are local and this elections, Wes. These is are not, local no, elections. No, they are, but you've, just, about, but you've, but you've no, acknowledged but that Conservative councils are losing their seats because, because of your government's can, record. No, and we're actually, not in the midterm. Actually, we're at the end Wes, game. You've been in for 13 doing, years and four years in this Without any concrete plan, you've been waving a finger talking about national issues, not talking about local issues. And these council, these are council elections about local issues. There are some factors, you talked about Plymouth being a really, a really good example of where there's some local uh, factors at play. But actually, people are going to be really, um, you, you're leading people up a garden path if you think that the, what you were talking about early on about the NHS is going to change tomorrow. No, because it, needs, they, well, it, because they, it needs to because change they, at a general election. I'm glad you've acknowledged yeah, that because as well. Because, Paul, because, they've, changed, because they've changed the councillor. But it, it doesn't set anything in train um, that, that you, you are expecting people to be what? waking up tomorrow and thinking, oh, thank goodness, I'm, I haven't got a Conservative councillor, therefore we're on train to changing the NHS. There is no link. Either you believe in devolution. And therefore, when you, you allow councils to be councillors to be accountable for their decisions, otherwise, or you start muddying the water, as you have been doing throughout this campaign. I'm sitting there. You rightly said I'm minister for London. I've had three years of watching Sadiq Khan wavering a finger of absolutely everybody. I mean, there are no elections in London. Let's be clear today, mm -hmm. um, and absolutely wagging a finger at everyone rather than delivering himself. I mean, it's a really good hiding place for politicians I, I've, when you muddy the I've water. Never, I've way. never seen anything like this on an election night where. The Conservatives come on and basically complain that their opponents ran a better campaign on the issues that matter to well, voters, no, 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 and then say, "Oh no, we've I'm, lost these seats I'm, because I'm they ran a better talk, campaign." I'm saying you're talking about that's no consolation to Conservative councillors. It's about a better campaign. I'm actually saying that you're talking, you're, you're dealing with the wrong campaign because you're, you're dealing with the issues that are not. Actually, well, I'm not sure the numbers will say that by the end of the night. No, that we're the wrong campaign. Here, you're not dealing with the issues that actually those councillors. Cost of living, being, being, NHS crime. These are the issues the voters are raising. These are the issues the voters are raising. We're speaking to those issues. But West, West Prime Minister Street, there is a point though here, though, isn't there? You ran a campaign absolutely voted on voting or asking people to vote on things that are not directly in council control. Every day we heard Keir Starmer talking about the cost of living. Now, most of the decisions that are made relating to that are made by national government. He was talking about the NHS. He was talking about crime. Now, most of those things, not all, local councils, of course, have influence in all sorts of ways. But there's no doubt that you ran a nationally focused campaign. Well, I'd and say, is that fair in these kinds well, of Well, I'd say two things. Firstly, uh, local government does have an impact on cost of living and on the NHS and in terms of crime and has powers they can use. And of course, nationally, we've been speaking to voters right across England with national messages on the voters' priorities. But ask Tudor Evans down in Plymouth whether or not we've been running a national election rather than fighting on local issues. Of course, in local communities, Labour councillors, Labour candidates, Labour group leaders have been running very effective, I think we'll see, local campaigns. But of course, Keir Starmer, as the person who wants to be our next Prime Minister, is talking directly to voters about the issues that matter to them, that they care about, and giving people a sense of Labour's direction so they can anticipate not just what Labour will deliver in local government, should we win councils tonight, but what we'll deliver after the next general election. We're not mid-term. This is endgame. A confident government 
calls an election and after four you, years, we're going to be going yeah, right to the tail end of this government. government and, and, you know, you find, and yet you find that actually when you get poll after poll, it's, uh, you know, Rishi is, uh, is, is um, around the area when he's mm -hmm. seen as the best leader. Okay. Well, that's not constellations well, of people losing their seats, We're going to leave it there with you two for now. Thank you for your contributions. You're not going to agree, but you're doing it in good spirit. Sarah, you were looking at your phone. Now, what is going on? What are you hearing? Well, no, I'm looking at the Cotswolds. We're doing really, really well in the Cotswolds. We're seeing some really good results uh, coming in there. And actually, and this and the uh, excellent results we've also had from, from Brentwood really reflect the sorts of things I've been hearing on the doorstep that so many voters have been saying to me, you know, they just can't vote for the Tories anymore. Uh, and that, I think, is really being reflected in, in uh, results coming in from all over the country tonight. I didn't expect uh, to be quite, uh, you know, that large swing you were talking about in Brentwood earlier. I wish we could see the projected national vote share just on that board. <laughs> what, what, that stop would the be clock great. Now, um, uh, uh, <laughs> 16 just that, minutes just that. to one, and that's it. The projected national but share based I, on one really, ward. It really does reflect. Swing to the it Dems. really does reflect <laughs> <laughs> everything I've been hearing. People are fed up with the Conservatives. They feel taken for granted. They feel, and, and, you know, and a lot of the people I've been talking to, I've been mostly out in places in Surrey, like Surrey Heath and Guildford and Elmbridge, their mortgages are going up by so yeah. much mm. because of the, the Tory chaos that we saw last autumn. And people are yeah, still yeah. feeling that and will continue yeah. to feel it. Their taxes are going up. Prices at the tills are going up. And the Tories are doing nothing about it. And I hear, North I North hear North what Paul is thing. saying. I, and this mm. is a, you know, it's a mixture of local and national. But voters will make their own yeah. decision well, about they why they in, make as, that as choice. They and they have been sending as, a very, very yeah, clear As they have in Backton in North Norfolk, where we were just one seat off the Lib Dems. So, I mean, you know, obviously... You mean in Surrey, you should go to North Norfolk and see what's going on with Duncan Both Baker and his colleagues. Both marvellous parts of the country. <laughs> Absolutely. We like everywhere here in this studio. Um, there's going to be more vigorous conversation shortly, and we should just remind everybody, it is still early, but we do have results coming in. Let's look at our big tower tally. Um, Labour on 64 seats so far. They've gained two. Liberal Democrats on 25, gaining six. That's why Sarah's so chipper. <laughs> the Tories on 23, losing nine. The Greens there taking two. Independents and other smaller parties gaining one on eight. And RA, that's an important acronym. We have it on local election nights. Residents associations, who are a really strong and powerful factor in some parts of the country. Now, all three of the politicians were tangling there over what we can read in so far, but I bet they, and you and me, probably all want to think to hear what Sir John Curtis <laughs> thinks we can read into what we are hearing so far. John, you've been looking at some of the key wards, the places mm -hmm. that we select mm -hmm. as good measures to put into your giant calculations to give us a flavour of what it might mean. What are you seeing so far? Well, let's remind uh, uh, viewers, we are collecting the detailed ward by ward results in 45 councils that elected uh, yesterday. Uh, and we've now got the results from over 50 of the individual wards within those councils. So it's still relatively early doors, but a pattern is beginning to emerge. First of all, <coughs> let's look at the change since 2019, which is when the seats up for grabs on Thursday were for the most part contested. Now, let me give Mr. Scully a little bit of good news. <laughs> the Conservative share of the vote in these wards is so far up. But of course, what we have to remember about the May 2019 local elections is that both Conservative and Labour did very badly. So it wasn't exactly terribly difficult for both of them to register something in advance. So of course, the crucial thing is what's the difference between the two? Well, if you take the nine up for Labour and the one up from the Conservatives, we're essentially talking about a 4% swing so far from Conservative to Labour, which perhaps is a little bit less than what we might expect from the national opinion polls, but certainly is going to be enough to result in quite a lot of uh, conservative losses during the course of tomorrow. So, John, you... I just want to take people through those numbers again. You've mentioned them and we're yep. showing them on the screen. So the change since 2019, when these seats were last fought, which was Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn, Vince Cable, end of that era. Labour up 9% since 2019. Tories up 1% since 19. Lib Dems up 2 I can show people also the change since 2022, because yep. that's one of our other benchmarks, isn't it? Labour only up so far 1% from those key wards you've explained. Tories down 5% and the Lib Dems up 2%. So just to show people the numbers as you are talking through them.
Yeah. So again, if we take the difference between the Labour and the Conservative figure, uh, we're talking about a 3% swing from Conservative to Labour as compared with last year. So on both measures, we're not seeing a dramatic swing to Labour. And, you know, you will notice the Labour vote is only just up on last year. Uh, but we're certainly uh, seeing quite considerable progress by the Labour Party. I think we might, however, also note that the, Conser the Liberal Democrats are indeed up by a couple of points on both these measures. Now, uh, both last year and in 2019 are pretty much equally the best performance by the Liberal Democrats so far and since they entered into coalition with the Conservatives in 2010. So we might be looking at the best Liberal Democrat performance in local elections since then, although still not back to the level that they were getting before uh, 2010. But that said, before Sarah Olney gets too ecstatic about results <laughs> she's saying for her, if I were to tell you that I've also seen one or two results in Brentwood where actually there was a swing from the Democrats to the Conservatives, uh, the truth is one of the things we do have to remember about local elections is that local factors do sometimes make a difference. And therefore, as a result, we never, ever make too much of results in individual wards. <laughs> um, but certainly, I mean, that said, Liberal Democrats made it uh, The other thing, perhaps less obvious, the Greens probably, if you actually look at the places where the Greens have fought this time and also fought last time, they're probably not doing as well as they did in 2019. But that, of course, was their best set of local elections ever. John, thank you so much for taking us through all of that. I think Sarah and Paul Scully have both, you know, Paul, you crack a little smile oh, yeah. Sarah you said you know take, take, take a breath um I want to bring in Chris our, our political editor it's early we know that but some pretty interesting things starting to emerge from what John was saying there yeah it's it's it, 10 to 1 in the morning wholesome ward by ward declaration what, followed what by Olympian want? extrapolation <laughs> feels kind of feels like kind of good for the soul in its, in its own way doesn't it and keeping us all uh, going through the, the the small hours just bring you a couple of other little nuggets uh, whilst you were chatting uh, there Conservatives uh, feeling pretty pessimistic in Bolton. Uh, they are repeating their pessimism uh, from uh, Windsor and Maidenhead uh, in uh, Berkshire. Uh, but yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? I, I, as we begin to see it, this very, very early stage That's about fine. what gap, if any, there is between where Labour have been in the opinion polls and the Conservatives have been over the last six, seven months and where we might get to when we start crunching through all of these results by the tail end of tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow tea time. Those beginnings of straws uh, in the wind, particularly, as John was saying, in those key wards, which mm -hmm. are looked at particularly yeah. because they account for how the rest of the country might uh, might uh, be reflecting on things, including those parts that obviously weren't voting, and, uh, as is now yesterday. And sentiment is so important, isn't it? So we can see, we're starting to see pictures of... Um, happy Labour faces looking in Ipswich. Measuring smiles. Measuring smiles. All people in Leicestershire, people in Stoke, people around the country. Now it is, this could completely change by 2am, which is why this is exciting. It could completely change again by 6am tomorrow and, and it could certainly all change by 6pm tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening. Absolutely. But the sentiment of all of this is such a sort of valuable commodity, isn't it? Yeah, because sentiment builds energy or the mm. lack of it. It builds enthusiasm or the lack of it amongst the grassroots of political parties who are the door knockers and the uh, envelope stuffers mm. and the, the backbone of the campaigning enterprise of a party, the voluntary party that give up their weekends and their wet Wednesday nights to go out and campaign for their party. Mm -hmm. And when you get a set of results like this and all of the analysis that comes after Afterwards, that will infuse or otherwise those activists, depending on how a party does. Now, obviously, that breaks down locally and regionally as well as nationally, but it's so important in kind of setting that sense of how a party thinks it's going to do. And, you know, and for those who might be marginal in their enthusiasm for their particular political party, might tempt them to think, you know what, I'm going to get stuck in for the mm -hmm. next year or, oh, you know, it, I'll go and play a round of golf instead. You know, so there's that so kind of that, that sentiment really, really and enthusiasm. Uh, so, so important. Just having a quick scroll to see if I can, there's anything else I can bring you. But actually, no, yeah, it's, I think the take, it's a paragraph or two to read. So I'll have to read a bit. Conservatives have just held Redditch in the Midlands, um, which is just worth noting. Interesting One of marginal those seat at the Westminster context. Interesting marginal seat. Absolutely. No doubt about that. Lib Dems getting very excited about the Cotswold results, but somewhere they would have expected to do well. We could show you some pictures of what's happening in Scunthorpe. Now, that is a part of the country where there has traditionally been quite a tussle over things. Tory's very keen to hang on. Um, but we were hearing, as Chris was just saying there in Bolton, uh, worries there from the Conservatives. Let's take you straight to 
our colleague Kevin Fitzpatrick, who's in Bolton for us tonight. Now, Kevin, Bolton's not currently held by anyone, but there's still been quite a tussle. What's happened? Yeah, so far, um, just talking to the parties here, and you're right, uh, the, the Conservatives are feeling pretty pessimistic about how might, this might unfold. The optimists among the Labour Party are hoping they could potentially become the largest party because there has been no overall majority here since 2019 when a long-serving Labour Council was pushed out. Since then, the Conservatives have led a minority uh, administration, a cobbled together coalition of smaller independent parties al alongside the Lib Dems as well here. And, and odds on, odds are, are that that's going to remain the case after tonight, but it does sound like the Conservatives could be a few seats down, the Labour Party uh, six behind them at the moment, so potentially they could uh, come up behind them. But because it's an all-out election here, there are 60 councillors, uh, council seats up for grabs. And what that means is that talking to some of the parties in some of the wards, they're saying depending how it goes, the Conservatives think they could hold on to all three or they could lose all three. So there's quite a bit of jeopardy in how swings, uh, very local swings could go here and there for or against the bigger parties and a key feature of Bolton over the last five or six years has been the growth of these hyper-local independent parties mainly on the outskirts of, of the, the bulk of the town centre in communities where they feel the larger parties labour over the years haven't really paid them much attention and these hyper-local parties um, Farnworth and Kersley first, Horwich and, and Blackrod first independents have sprung up saying listen we're the local people will represent you properly uh, there's no fewer than six of them have councillors on Bolton Council now, 11 councillors between them, and over the last couple of years they've increasingly become influential and the kingmakers. The independents also hoping to pick up a couple more seats today. So uh, at the end of this election it could be the Conservatives still in power, potentially the independents more influential, but also Labour potentially with a bit of a comeback when you compare it with just a couple of years ago. Kevin, thanks so much. Lots and lots of jeopardy there, as you say. So we'll check in later with what's happening in Bolton. I know it's somewhere that the big parties are watching very, very carefully. Rita, we have the opportunity to delve into some of the detail into some of the results we've had in. You've just said uh, that Redditch is a Conservative hold, Laura, and let's take a look now at some of the figures behind that bold result. So yes, Conservative hold, there is Redditch uh, in the Midlands there, you can see it flashing. Let's take a look at what actually happened though. Uh, the Conservatives got 15 seats and Labour eight. Um, and this is the Conservatives lost two seats, Labour gained them. Labour gained three seats from the Conservatives last year. But what's really interesting here is the change in the share of the vote uh, compared to four years ago. And look at that. How dramatic is that? A collapse in the independence vote and UKIP will have been a large part of that. And that has just translated back to Labour, Labour up by 16 percentage point. So does this presage a return, a recovery for Labour in areas, swingy areas like that in the West Midlands? Um, we'll watch and see whether that's replicated in other similar uh, councils in that area. I want to show you Brentwood as well. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about Brentwood, a really tight race going on there. Brentwood in Essex, you can see it flashing over there on the little map. Uh, the winning post is 19 seats. There are still three to declare. The Conservatives on 17, the Lib Dems on 15. Um, let's do the same and look at the change in the, sh in the seats. So the Conservatives have lost two, the Lib Dems have picked those up. And what's happened to the share of the vote here? Also fascinating, isn't it? Conservatives down by uh, five percentage points and, la and Labour up by five. The Lib Dems actually a more modest increase, um, but still three seats to play for. So we'll be watching that one very closely. Laura. Rita, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's talk to a couple of people who've got pretty good knowledge of what will be going through the politicians' minds. Let's talk to Aisha Hazarika, now columnist broadcaster who worked for Ed Miliband for a long time, wrote his jokes, but also did do a lot of his political strategy. And Mo Hussein, conservative advisor, who worked for Amber Rudd, among other people, during his time serving in government. Um, Mo, firstly to you, are you surprised by what seems at this early stage to be looking pretty grim? Paul Scully certainly looked pretty downcast with some of the last half hour. 
Uh, I'm not surprised, no. I think uh, it was clear it was going to be a very difficult night for the government and for the uh, Conservative Party, even though there has been uh, the usual expectation management and lots of numbers being banded around, I think the reality is people were bracing themselves for um, apathy on the doorstep for 13 years in government and also for um, issues that people are really facing and uh, finding challenging right now that um, you know, the government under this prime minister is trying to resolve, but it's clearly has got much more progress to make on that. So uh, I, no, I'm not surprised at all. Um, Aisha, in terms of what Labour is seeing so far, um, do you think that they will be, uh, you know, and I know it is early before before we say we should say it again and again, but, but from what you've seen so far, does this match Labour expectation? I think Labour is going to be pretty pleased uh, with how tonight goes with all the caveats that you've just set out uh, for a number of reasons. I think they will probably feel quite vindicated about their sort of broader political strategy paying off in some of those red wall seats. It was very interesting seeing in Jonathan Gullis' seat that big uh, swing to, 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 to Labour. And also another thing which I think they will will be pleased about. It's interesting seeing how some of those smaller parties are doing. The Reform Party, for example, and again, it is early in the night, but it's interesting that like that former UKIP vote seems to be swinging behind Labour rather than swinging to the Conservative Party. So I think, you know, as early as the night is, there will be some, you know, good green shoots for, for, for Labour. Certainly people I've been speaking to, they're feeling quite cautiously optimistic, but I think they are also happy that they have run this as quite a, a brutal, ruthless uh, kind of pitch rolling ahead of the general election. I've heard a couple of commentators make the point, oh, well, you know, Labour you know, didn't just go on local issues, they were going on national issues. Elections are elections, and it is about the air war, and it is about that messaging which taps into the concerns of people, which right now are things like mortgages, the state of the NHS, crime, the general broken Britain narrative. So I think the fact that people are attacking Labour for sort of running quite a good campaign and being quite ruthless about those big issues, they'll feel quite pleased about that because that means that they're probably on the right track in terms of this being a good dress rehearsal for the next general election. There were a lot of people though in the Labour Party and I think some of the wider, pe wider public as well who looked at some of what Labour was doing in the campaign and those adverts I'm sure a lot of viewers will remember that sort of implicated Rishi Sunak and saying he didn't care about certain kinds of offenders because of various different you know, crime rates and things and how they changed. Extremely personal. Also suggestions of going after Rishi Sunak's wife. Now, do you think in the Labour movement there will be unease about that if that's how they run a general election? Well, I think there's two questions there. Like, unease amongst the Labour movement. There's always a lot of unease amongst the Labour movement. The Labour <laughs> movement is quite a broad church. There's lots of people who don't want Keir Starmer to do well, who are former Jeremy Corbyn supporters. So they're always going to criticise what Keir Starmer does. I mean, I think he and his team are setting out some quite ruthless red lines, if you pardon the pun. And they're also kind of showing, um, you know, that they are prepared to sort of go in and really fight hard. And I think in the past, and I remember this in my own time working for Ed Miliband and others, like sometimes you did feel like Labour would turn up a sort of at a knife fight with a baguette, you know, if it was like we're sort of not quite ready to really go in and, and fight hard. And I think Keir Starmer and his team are really, really focused on winning. Mm -hmm. However, and lots of caveats, and John Curtis, of course, will be all the expert in this, Labour still has such a big mm. mountain to climb. You know, if Keir Starmer gets the same swing that Tony Blair did in 1997, he only gets a working majority of one. And yes, there are things in his favour, the collapse of the SNP at the moment and the fact that Liz Truss caused a huge amount of damage to the Tory party. But there is still a long, long way for Labour to go. And I think these poll results will narrow as we get closer to the general election. And, and I think Rishi Sunak, even though, you know, the, the tonight might be terrible for the Tories, mm -hmm. you know, his own personal ratings are, are creeping up again. Mm -hmm. So Labour will be pleased, but there's no room for complacency. And the general election is still, in political terms, centuries away. Uh, Mo, briefly to you, if Labour carries on setting out what Aisha described as ruthless red lines, what will the Tory response likely be? I think they'll probably have a few um, things that they'll throw back at Labour as well. But it seems to me that the focus for the Conservatives and the government is to rebuild credibility after uh, the mess that we saw under Liz Truss and the legacy issues from Boris Johnson. And uh, 
shortly after that, we will try and see some vision for the future and probably a plan for what things would look like going forward. But you can't really do that until you build that credibility back. So you see the Prime Minister just trying to get on with delivery, trying to get on with addressing the issues that matter to uh, people. But there are questions being asked amongst mm-hmm. the backbenchers. Is that enough? Is that bold enough? Is that ambitious enough? And I think that debate will continue to rage within the party. OK, Mo and Aisha, thanks very much for giving us your time this evening. Great to have you with us. Um, Paul Scully, let's put that great to you then. It's straight to you. Bo Hussein says the people in the party already asking whose voices will get louder if what Rishi Sunak is trying to do is ambitious enough. Um, I think, look, he's, he's set out those, um, those, those five points that are measurable. What he's doing, as, as Mo said, he's, yeah, he's right to talk about the fact that we are talking about credibility. We're talking about because it's all about confidence, not just confidence politically, but confidence economically. People look to uh, to governments and they don't worry about some of the machinations and the, uh, you know, the, the mud slinging. It's ha- what's happening to my mortgage, what's happening to ba- the, you know, the backlog, what's happening to the small boats and these kind of things. And so that's what Rishi said he's going to be doing over this year. Clearly, as we get closer to a general election, you then need to start talking about having regained that sort of confidence. You then need to start talking about what we're going to set as setting out stall for the next few years, the hopes of constituents and, and people across the country over the next few years. But you can only talk to that subject if you get the basics right. And that's what he's concentrating but on. But he the would moment. have to step it up a bit. You just just said, um, Wes, you've um, looking pretty chipper so far. But I just wanted to ask you this, you know, Harlow Council, Redditch Council, Basildon Council, they've all been held by the Conservatives. Now, they are all parts of the country where, at a general election, Labour needs to be looking competitive, but the Tories have held them all. Well, as we saw in Redditch, you know, there's improvement in our vote share. Redditch mm-hmm. wasn't a target council for these elections. It will be a target seat for the general election. We have Blair ruthlessly we country. have ruthlessly targeted at uh, these elections. And if we saw um, an, an 8% improvement, improvement, for example, uh, that would be the best result for Labour since 1997. So... Um, you know, uh, there are always local variables, um, you know, thinking about one of those seats in Sunderland, won by the Greens, where uh, I know the one of the candidates and the issues very well, very local issues. There will be some of those results throughout the night where local factors are at play. But overall, I think this has been, um, I think, a great campaign for Labour. And I think for the Conservatives, they've got a double punch in the gut, really, haven't they? Uh, they've been let down by a leader they didn't vote for. And he has spent the last few days trying to sort of manufacture a controversy around things like Sue Gray, the job of one person, rather than the jobs and the, li- and the livelihoods and I the think, cost of living I for millions. I think Sue and Keir manufacture that all it's among bonkers. themselves. Well, I was, I was, well, it's not worked, has it? What time it might me, get yeah. to before somebody uh, from Westminster mentions something that I think has been important to some people, but quite incomprehensible to a lot of people but watching it's, but the, the, the Conservatives' big message but going Sarah, into the election, we're, we're in, a, in a minute, we're going to take people to the news. Um, but Sarah, before you leave us, you, you're leaving tonight with a, a spring in your step, it seems. Um, but I suppose the bigger question for you is, if you have the kind of set of results that you get, what would that mean for you in the coming months and years? I think it would just mean we'd be able to send a very positive message to the country that Liberal Democrats are, you know, working for you in your communities. We're here. We're your local champions. And we really want to listen to the voters and really, really respond to their concerns. I would like to think that going into the next general election, however many political lifetimes in the future that is, um, you know, people people will, you know, take another look at the Liberal Democrats. You know, we are in certain parts of the country. We are the main uh, main contenders in, in many, many Tory held seats. And I want people to look at us and think, yes, I'm going to vote for the Liberal Democrats because I think they're the right people to represent me in Parliament. And obviously we want more Lib, Lib Dem MPs in Parliament. OK, well, you are leaving us with a smile on your face. Let's see Very if much. your colleagues through the night still have by 6am. But Sarah Olney, Wes Streeting, Paul Scully, thank you for being with us for the thank first you. hour of our coverage here on Elections 2023. As I said, we're about to go to the news, but I want to give you our total as we leave you for a few minutes. Our big terror tally there, Labour on 87, having gained five seats. The Liberal Democrats on 38, having gained eight, and the Conservatives on 37, having lost 12. Now, let's take a pause. The news with Luxmi Gopal. Laura, thank you. Good evening. Here's a summary of the BBC News. As we've been hearing, counting is underway in the local elections in England in one of the last major tests of public opinion before next year's general election. 
Voters have been deciding who will run services at 230 local councils, with around 8,000 seats up for grabs. Mayoral elections have also been taking place in Bedford, Leicester, Mansfield and Middlesbrough. Here's our political correspondent, Jonathan Blake. Voters have given their verdict and the counting can begin. Ballots have been cast in towns, cities and rural areas to elect around 8,000 councillors across England who will decide how local services are run. Some last-minute campaigning from the Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer, who knows a strong showing from his party is needed to prove it can turn a lead in opinion polls into results. The Liberal Democrats are hoping to make gains from the Conservatives in their traditional territory, claiming voters are fed up with the Tories. There was no sign of Rishi Sunak on the doorstep, but the Conservatives are expecting a tough night, hoping only to limit their losses rather than count up the gains. In a first for elections in England, photo ID was required at polling stations, which left some unable to vote, but it's too soon to say what impact the change has had. Only around a quarter of the councils holding elections are counting votes overnight, so early results won't give anything like the full picture. But in the hours ahead, these local elections will be closely watched as a crucial test of the national political picture. Jonathan Blake, BBC News. And all the local results will be available online, of course. To see who won in your local area, you can use our postcode checker, which is available on the BBC News website and on our app. Well, we'll be back in an hour with the latest news updates, but for now, it's back to our special election night coverage with Laura. A warm welcome back to election 2023, just after one o'clock in the morning. And we've had a fair number of results in from local council elections happening right across England. More than 8,000 seats were up for grabs. We are going to, in the next hour, have some lively political conversation with our guests who've just joined us. Richard Holden, Transport Minister for the Government, joins us. Bridget Philipson, who wants to be the Education Secretary if Labour does win the general election. And Manira Wilson, who also speaks on education, but for the Liberal Democrats. You're all very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Now, before we do anything else, let's remind you of the total tally as these seats start to come in. You can see there that the Conservatives are a dozen seats down. Labour overall has gained five so far and the Liberal Democrats are up by eight seats. And we have just had another interesting result in Brentwood in Essex. Now, in the last hour, we were talking about Tory concerns that they might lose this council in Essex, should be the kind of parts of the country where they're pretty confident of holding on. But actually, we can confirm they have lost control of Brentwood Council. They've still got 17 seats more than the others, with one seat left to declare. You can see 17 there to the Liberal Democrats, 16. But then look at the change in the seats. The Tories have lost two. The Liberal Democrats have gained two. Then let's show you the vote share. Now, this is interesting. The Conservatives, 37%, and the Liberal Democrats, the largest share on 41%. Labour down on 16. And let's look at the crucial change in the share of the vote. You can see it there. Labour up five, the Conservatives down four. That's the change. Remember, since 2019, the last time these council elections were fought in May 2019, which is another political lifetime in so many ways. But let's hear about exactly what's happened in Brentwood with Harry Farley, who's on the ground there for us tonight. Harry, what's happened? Yes, well, Laura, you're right. So Lib Dems have taken the uh, Conservatives' majority. It's now no over overall control. At the start of the night, I was speaking to a number of Conservatives here, and they thought they might just hang on. They had a wafer-thin majority of three. They thought they might be able to protect that if they could... Uh, if they could win a couple of key wards. They haven't. The, con uh, the Conservatives, they are still the largest party, but they have lost their majority here in Brentwood. As you say, a part of the country where in general elections, they're very comfortable. They tend to win uh, these seats in the general elections 
pretty easily. But in the local elections here, the Lib Dems have pushed them very hard. They've taken away their majority and it's now no overall control in Brentwood. And what do you think was behind the result from the people you've spoken to? There's a few factors here. Housing is a big thing here in Brentford. We're just outside the M25. It's a green belt area. And in the last few years, under the Conservative majority on the Borough Council, two big housing developments have, uh, have been uh, uh, granted and they've, been started, they've started to be built. And the Lib Dems campaigned hard against those uh, developments, against new houses in this area. So we've been talking about housing a lot in the programme throughout the night as an issue that's both a national and a local one that voters come to the polls up with. And housing is certainly a big issue um, for, uh, for the Lib Dems in particular. Another key issue, the ultra-low emission zone, ULES, which is the, uh, the, the tax on some, on some vehicles in London. That has been pushed out to the edges of this area, so another, another key local issue there. But, um, but really, I think for the Lib Dems in particular, it was housing that they campaigned against, against those uh, new developments in this area, and that's obviously has paid, paid dividends for them. They've taken, the off, they've taken the Conservatives' majority off them, and it's now no overall control in Brentwood. Harry, thanks very much indeed. Well, housing we had already touched on. Interesting, Harry mentioned there, though, the ULES. Now, if you don't live in a part of the country where there is one of these low emission zones already, believe me, they have been a source of big controversy. And by a happy coincidence, actually, the Roads and Local Transport Minister, Richard Holden, is with us in the studio. So we'll ask him about that in a few minutes. But I want to bring Chris Mason, our political editor, in at this moment. We're just 1.15. It's a lot of information coming in we it's we're cautious about the overall picture but we are learning quite a lot aren't we we are so just to pick up on that conversation you're just having there on the mm. on the issue of planning it's fascinating seeing the influence that Harry was speaking to and political sources are acknowledging around uh, the, the battle there in Essex on housing developments and how it would appear the Liberal Democrats were able to politically kind of weaponise that. We've seen, haven't we, the Cheshire and Amersham by-election of mm. a couple of uh, years ago uh, where planning a massive issue there uh, as well and such a source of uh, well, political argument in so many in particular of those battles between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats in a ring of sort of suburban seats around uh, around London. Mm. Stepping back to the bigger picture though, I mean as you say the numbers are still relatively small, mm. almost as small as the hour of the night as we trundle on into the small hours, but we're beginning to get a sense aren't we of how things are mm -hmm. panning out. Uh, so far, so expected in that we're seeing uh, Labour making progress, the Conservatives going backwards. Obviously, by the end of Friday, the extent to which that plays out will be the, uh, the sort of defining factor in, I think, the overall headline of these elections. I think what's intriguing, and again, we've got to underline it, haven't we, and put it in bold and italics mm. and all the rest of it. It's very, very early. What is intriguing is that there's a beginning of a sense that perhaps Labour are getting relatively close to some of the opinion polls that have suggested that they have a, a, reasonable, uh, a reasonable lead. But how does that carry on through the night? Who knows? There is one heck of a lot still to come. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's just address that issue of the ULES with our uh, roads minister, Richard Holden. Just on this specific issue, it's interesting there, people in one part of the country thinking that changes that Conservatives have made to charge people to come in to pay for driving their cars um, have cost you votes. Well, they're not changes the Conservatives have made, they're changes that the Labour Mayor of London's made. I think it's particularly interesting in Brentwood that uh, despite the Lib Dems voting for ULES in London, they're actually campaigning against it in Brentwood. Just like at a national level, they campaign for more house building, but on a local level, they campaign but you're against being, it. But you're being punished, and our reporter on the ground has told us there very clearly that people are unhappy with the fact that this has happened on your national watch. I don't think uh, that, that, well, I think you can see there's been no uh, le massive Labour surge there in Brentwood. Uh, this is... Uh, but you lost control. Uh, that's true. We're down a couple of seats in Brentwood. But you look at other parts of Essex, in Harlow, another, that's, a, that's a Labour Tory marginal area. Uh, Conservatives look like they're doing quite well there. In Basildon, which Labour actually took to an overall control in 2019 under Jeremy Corbyn, uh, you're reporting at the moment that the Conservatives are holding on to control they're in Basildon. So I think it's one thing when you're against the Lib Dems who we all know uh, say one thing on a national level and another at a local level because they can 
they usually avoid that scrutiny. That's not quite the same for uh, the Labour Party, in fairness, who, who do get that scrutiny on a national level. But election. when it comes to something like housing targets, which we've also heard from several places in the country tonight, is also a big problem. Your party has got big problems on this. You've got a whole load of MPs who are quoted in the newspapers in the last few days being very critical of the national leadership for dropping those local housing targets acknowledging that lots of people, including in the Conservative think Party, think that you've got nowhere near building enough houses. So you're a split on that. Well, you can see what's uh, we, 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 down there in Brentwood, exactly what we've been doing. We've actually been uh, fulfilling what uh, people want with uh, more housing. But obviously these will be weaponised at a local level by uh, Lib Dems who face two ways on uh, every issue they uh, can. Well, let's put that accusation to Manira. I mean, he's accusing you of facing two ways. Well, I think uh, the, the Tories are struggling this evening. Look, uh, he, on, on, on you, Les, uh, I, I'd like to just correct what Richard said. There wasn't even a vote on this at the, the London Assembly. Sadiq Khan has done this uh, by uh, you know, his executive powers. And one of the things we've been very clear about, whilst we support cleaning up London's air, absolutely, the timing and the speed at which this has been done uh, is far too, too fast, terrible in the middle of a cost of living crisis. And we've, uh, we've actually amended the mayor's budget to put more money to help people change their cars and put better public transport in place. But unfortunately, uh, uh, the Mayor of London has blocked that. So uh, we haven't been facing two ways at all. And actually, as a Transport Minister, uh, you know, one of the things I'd like to say to Richard is that the government has put money into helping people change their cars in all sorts of parts of the country, like in Manchester and Bristol. But outside of London and the areas that border onto London, we've, the Liberal Democrats have called for that and they won't support Except that. Except when it comes to... How much to are you going to uh, uh, put into that? How much do you want, tax do you want to raise to pay for that? Well, look, there are plenty of, of ways that you can pay for that, whether that's uh, by you know, rolling back things like uh, the, the cut in bankers' surcharge and, uh, and, and increasing the windfall tax. Or the, if you are serious about Is there cleaning an actual up, policy proposal or is that just up, making a pretty if, if you're serious about cleaning up the air and uh, tackling climate change, then you would invest in those sorts of schemes. Uh, look, clearly, what we're seeing in Brentwood... have got the most uh, aggressive look, what we're, what we're in seeing the world. in Brentwood uh, uh, and across the country in conservative-facing uh, areas is that people are fed up with the Tories, whether it's the cost of living crisis, whether it's sewage, whether it's NHS waiting lists. That's what I've been hearing. I've been out in, in that blue wall campaigning in places like Isha and Walton, uh, and uh, elsewhere in Surrey and, and in Hertfordshire. And it's very, very clear that the con that people are fed up with the Conservatives. They're sending them a message and uh, they're coming over to us. And many of them are also just frankly staying at home because they're too ashamed to vote for the Conservative Party. People feel taken for granted. I met lifelong Conservative voters in Dominic Raab's patch, Anisha and Walton, who said, absolutely not, I can't support the Conservatives. Um, Bridget Phillipson, we're getting some news from Hartlepool Council. Now, that is still in no overall control. Um, what do you make of that? I mean, isn't that exactly the kind of place where Labour has to be making progress? That was Labour for so long, grabbed sensationally, sensationally by the Conservatives under Boris Johnson. Don't you really need to be making big progress in parts of the country like that? We have made big progress tonight in Hartlepool. We've taken a number of seats there. Because of the fact where we elect on the basis of thirds, it's more difficult to get to a position of taking control. But we've made some really important gains in Hartlepool and actually right across the country where I've been campaigning. You know, I'm confident that we're going to see gains this evening in those key battleground seats ahead of the next general election. I mean, that's what I'm most interested in looking at, not so much the numbers of councillors or, or the kind of percentages, but actually where are we making gains and how does that align with the seats that we need to take in order to form a government at the next does general election? Does that mean then that the geography is actually more important to you than the overall, of the overall total? Because absolutely. there are some very important benchmarks though that you have to hit, are there not? No, absolutely. It's the geography that really does matter to us. Of course, we want to see more councillors and you know we are in the process of electing more councillors this evening. But actually, it's the geography, it's those key battleground seats, whether that's Swindon or Hartlepool, Darlington, Telford, you know, they are the areas I'll be looking to see how Labour is doing. And on the basis of Hartlepool so far, it looks to be a really strong result. And actually, in, um, in Richard's backyard in Durham, we took a seat from the Conservatives there in a the by-election this evening too. So we're making progress in the north, and I look forward to seeing some really good results in key battleground seats in the, in the south and the southeast this, e this evening too. Well, you are almost neighbours, not near neighbours. You not are far. almost neighbours, but I'm not sure not that you're ever going to be around, uh, popping around for a cup of tea. Um, thank you all three of you for now. We'll be back with you in a little bit. But Rita, let's have a, a deeper delve into some of the numbers coming through. 
I've got a couple of councils here for you, Laura, that are really interesting to watch. They're both still counting, but it's always good to see what's going on behind the scenes. So Colchester in Essex, you can see it flashing there. Uh, this is an interesting council because it's been hung for the past quarter of a century. And uh, it's quite a rare council in many ways because all three of the main parties are competitive here. They're really sort of neck and neck. And as you can see, with 11 seats still to declare, the Conservatives on 14 and Labour and the Lib Dems are tying on 12. Let's have a look and see, though, what's happened to the share of the vote on the basis of what we've got in so far. Conservatives down by six percentage points, Labour up by nine and the Lib Dems up by eight and actually the Greens and independents suffering there. So we'll keep an eye on Colchester, but this is looking like uh, good news both for Labour and the Liberal Democrats. Um, I want to show you also Hull, which we've mentioned already, um, a very tight race here between the Lib Dems and Labour. Um, there are still 15 seats to declare, 29 seats for the winning post. And at the moment, the Lib Dems are on 24 and Labour on 18. Let's take a look at what's happened to the share of the vote. Um, Lib Dems up five percentage points and Labour up to Greens down five percent. So um, this result will be coming in soonish, I hope, but it gives you an indication of what's going on. And in both cases, it looks like quite good news for the Liberal Democrats. Laura. Thank you, Rita. And I know that Hull is somewhere that Labour was fighting very hard to get back after the Lib Dems did well to take it um, a few years ago, as Rita was just explaining to us. Let's go back to Medway. Now, we were talking to our reporter there, Anna Collinson, a while ago, explaining why that part of the world was interesting politically. Um, but we can talk to the MP there, Raymond Chishti, Conservative MP, who joins us from Gillingham. Um, now, Conservatives are already looking a bit downcast tonight. At the moment, that council is held by the Conservatives. It's been held by the council's Conservatives since 2003. Um, does your glum face, Raymond, suggest that that might be going to change tonight? Well, no, it's certainly not a glum face. What I'm trying to say is trying to listen to what you were saying. Um, and, and you're right, we've held the council since 2003. It's been a fantastic local Conservative run council where you have weekly rubbish and recycling collection, excellent green spaces in the area, and you've got libraries across the, uh, the Medway towns which have been you know, uh, providing excellent service to the local community. So what we have now is these elections are taking place after you know, over 20 years of a Conservative administration, 13 years of a Conservative government. So yes, of course we are going to get some challenges you know, here in Medway like the rest of the country. But what I would say is I'm the Member of Parliament for Gillingham and Raynham. And, I, and, and Medway is composed of three parliamentary constituencies. And I've been out across the constituency in Gillingham today, and I expect you know, to retain all the, you know, uh, the councillors in Gillingham or Raynham. There might be a tight call on one here and there, but I expect to retain you know, all the uh, c sitting Conservative councillors in G Gillingham and Raynham. We've been working exceptionally hard. Uh, and in the wider Medway towns, you have you know, a redrawn local boundaries, which will be a key factor in these local elections. And in your part of that area, you think you, the Conservatives will hold on to the seats. What about the other parts of the area held by your colleagues? Well, I think what I've just said on that is with regards to the wider motorway towns, Gillingham and Raynham, I expect, you know, from having been out on the doorsteps with our brilliant local candidates to maintain those council seats, there'll be, you know, ch challenges with one or one here and there, but I expect to maintain all the, the sitting councillors we have in Gillingham and Raynham. Brilliant team. The rest of the Medway towns, you know, you have redrawn local boundary changes, you know, by the Boundary Commission, which are independently done. And that, you know, favours the, the Labour Party here in the Medway towns. So that will be a factor in the other part of the Medway towns. And I think on that, it would be only right that you speak to the members of parliament for those areas, but for me to comment on Gillingham and Raynham, uh, uh, you know, in, in this interview. You have expressed concerns previously, however, about making sure that the Conservative Party is still trying its utmost to represent and court votes in all parts of England. And as an MP for the South East, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. do you have yeah, yeah. concern that the focus on levelling up, 
the focus on yeah. holding parts of yeah, yeah. the Jackson, country that chose Brexit last time um, and chose Conservatives the for the Biden first time vote, could so mean sometimes or, that the South East and constituencies like yours might lose out. I think you're, the way you've put that point is absolutely spot on. The government has put forward the levelling up agenda for the country across the board to level up all parts of the country. And that is absolutely right. But what I've said before, and I've said it across the board to the government and in articles, you cannot level up the north at the expense of the south. And for us here in Gillingham and Raynham and in the south, we need our fair share of allocation of resources. For example, levelling up funding. You know, we've not had that here in Gillingham and Raynham in the two rounds that we've had. So for me, I want to make sure the government, you know, when they look at the wider strategy, ensures that, you know, when we level up the rest of the country in the north, we also level up the southeast and ensure that we get here in Gillingham and Raynham and the wider Medway towns our fair share allocation of resources, whether it's regeneration funding, level three, always with regards to supporting, you know, a new hospital hospital buildings program here uh, in, in the Medway town. So yes, you are absolutely right. I have said that the government needs to ensure that its strategy of levelling up ensures that the, the southeast of England gets its fair share and I'll make sure that view gets taken back to the Prime Minister and any minister in government to make sure that's done fairly and properly. But if it is not, and you raising that does suggest you have concern that it has not been done adequately enough, how important is it, do you think, that they switch that focus? in order to be able to keep seats like think, yours when I it comes to the general election? Well, I think what I would say on that specific point, these are local elections that we're talking about. You know, we're out another 14 months from a general election. But absolutely, the government needs to look at these results with great care and listen to members of parliament who say, we do not want any favours from the government. We need fair allocation of resources, and that means regeneration funding here in Gillingham and Raynham with the high street, with the town centres, and with regards to the hospital buildings programmes, raised in government, and we will fight for that at every level, irrespective of who the Prime Minister, who the Cabinet is, because that needs to be done fairly, and we need to make sure, as members of Parliament, that money and those resources get done evenly across the board, and we get it here in Gillingham and Raynham. And these results, you know, in the wider Medway towns, you know, will, uh, will send a clear message to the government if it's predicted where we're going on the wider scale, then we need to relook at how we uh, address those challenges on allocation of resources. Raymond Tishley, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, let's put that straight to you, Government Minister. That's one of your MPs saying very, very clearly that the government needs to switch its focus more to parts of the country that feel a bit neglected because there's been so much focus on the north of England. Well, I don't agree with Ray uh, on that. I think the truth is that um, right across the country, there will always be pockets, and there are pockets of Medway, like the Chatham area, which have uh, do require extra focus and extra support. And there are parts of the country, uh, and the Prime Minister said that, which will, uh, which will require that uh, extra support in all sorts of uh, different ways and different areas. But he's saying they're not getting it. That's the point he's making. Well, I would just say, you know, you can, if you go down to the Medway towns, you've got a, a great train line link straight into central London. You've got a motorway right past the bottom of the Medway towns, which takes you straight into central London. Um, yes, there are obviously local challenges. I know, having campaigned down there that, uh, several years ago, actually, the hospital has been a, a big issue down there. And Ray, you know, we're seeing some of his colleagues, Ray was on the local council down before he was a, uh, he was a, a member of parliament. Well, uh, will obviously feel uh, some of those uh, losses keenly. Um, but I'd say that we need to look at the uh, broader picture and the fact that since the back end of last year, um, we've made a, a massive strides in uh, stabilising and turning around um, what's been a difficult economic situation, especially following uh, Russia's invasion of UK Ukraine, huge amount of support for families across the country. Um, but no, I, I think there's, there will always be uh, specific issues in specific areas um, which MPs will want to campaign on. You know, it's the same as I do in my own constituency. But he's making a general point, though. He's not talking about specific issues. He was making well, he was a raising, general he was point. Raising specific issues, Laura. But he's making a general point very clearly that he and other Conservatives feel that some of the areas in the south of the country that have traditionally had more attention from the Conservatives in government have lost out partly because of the switch in focus to parts of I the just, country. I just don't agree with that. You just don't agree with him? No. Bridget? I think everyone's pretty fed up everywhere. I mean, I think it would be news to the people that I represent that they're getting a great deal from the government's so-called levelling up agenda. Um, and clearly there's dissatisfaction in large parts of the south of England too. I mean, I do have to... Um, I mean, Richard's doing an admirable job here, but I, I, I do have to say 
that when you talk about the economic situation that we've had since the end of last year, it was, after all, your government's own mini budget that caused all of that instability and chaos and that has caused us so many problems. And, you know, right throughout this campaign, we've been talking about the cost of living, about the challenges that people are facing right now. The Conservatives have been nowhere on that. I mean, that has been the single biggest I mean, issue that people will raise on the doorstep. I mean, it's just totally untrue. You know, we've put £92 billion pounds into supporting households with energy bills over the last few years, you know, which I think was actually broadly supported by Labour and Parliament. I don't think they voted against it or for more, actually. Um, so I don't know what would you want yet, to do differently. Well, no. we, would, we would have done the windfall tax differently and have frozen council tax, for one example. Um, but when you speak to people... You've on not the, done when that when you're in local government, have you? We would be doing that right now if we were in government. What you hear time and again from people on the doors is that they're putting back food when they go shopping, that they can't afford to pay their bills, they're worried about heating their homes, and they feel that the government just aren't listening and don't have an idea about just how difficult it is for people right now. And this is families and pensioners right across the board, people who never imagined they'd be in a position that they'd be struggling to such a degree. And the way that the government have approached this, just no understanding about how hard things are for people like right now, and a complete rejection, I think, of some pretty straightforward measures that would really make life easier for people. And, you know, we've fought a really strong and positive campaign about the different choices that we would be making in government right now, and that would deliver real benefits for people um, at a really, really tough time. But I do have to come back to this point. The Conservatives crashed the economy. They caused all of this instability and chaos. People are paying more on their mortgages as a direct yeah. I, result I mean, I mean, that's of just, the decisions that, that the Conservative that's Party just, took that's just not both true, last though, year and over 13 years. I mean, you, you know that in, say, uh, I don't know, the United States or in Canada, they've actually seen greater interest rate rises than we have here in the UK. The European Union is just a couple of, uh, you know, very uh, slightly behind where we are. The entire world's seen that change. I mean, are I mean, you saying, good, I mean, I'd say are you saying I'd say, that in Canada or America they're doing a worse job because their interest rates have gone up I'd, more than here? I'd say good luck selling that to people on the doors. There is I a mean, problem. <laughs> well, there is a problem for you, Rich, though, isn't there? I mean, you can sit and say that the Conservatives have put huge amounts of money into things like energy bills. That is true. Huge tens of billions of pounds of taxpayers' mm -hmm. money going into it. And yet, if you can also sit and say that and voters just say things are still hard, things are still mm -hmm. difficult... That doesn't solve your political problem, no, does it? No, it, and they, they are hard and they are difficult. And I think what people are looking for is who's going to lead the country, who can they trust to lead the country uh, through what is a, dif a difficult time, which and I think, you know, usually the Labour Party accept that most of those headwinds have been uh, caused by uh, Russia's illegal invasion uh, of Ukraine. Uh, and when you well, look there was at the, a market and, and, meltdown in this country under and, and the Conservative was, Prime was, Minister and, who was out 44 and, and, days and, and, later. I mean, and was, and Ukraine was, and has obviously been a very significant factor, but that's not quickly, everything but that's happened. It was stabilised very quickly. When you look at the actual uh, interest rates, for example, uh, compare us, the Canada, US, Europe, it's in a very similar situation right across the board there. Uh, what I would say is people are, will, at the next election, general election, are going to be looking for who uh, is who is on their side and who's the right person to lead the country. That's going to be a choice between Rishi Sunak, who's set forward some priorities uh, around the economy, around stopping the boats, around uh, getting a uh, uh, hospital waiting list under control, and Keir Starmer, who mm -hmm. seems to change his mind uh, on every policy, uh, when he, whether he's facing the Labour membership or the country. And yet the Liberal Democrats, the third party in these English local elections, the third big party in these English local elections, might have a word or two to say about that as well, with both of them. Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I agree with Bridget. The cost of living is absolutely coming up on the doorstep and people have seen their mortgages go up as a result of the Conservatives crashing the economy under the disastrous leadership of Liz Truss. Um, but also health services. It's something that I've heard time and again uh, just today, actually, knocking on doors uh, in, in, in Walton. Uh, down in Surrey, people saying really struggling to get a GP appointment. We know that sort of ambulance waiting times across the country uh, are a big issue. People are concerned about uh, their local environment and sewage in our rivers and waterways and the fact that Conservatives, frankly, uh, are not taking action on the, the big water companies uh, because of that. And that complete dereliction of duty and f people feeling like they've been taken for granted by the Conservatives for so long. I think there's a real palpable anger on the doorstep that uh, we're really picking up when we're out talking to people. OK, Manira, thank you very much for now. Bridget and Richard, thank you very much for now indeed. Um, I want to let you know that if you are one of the people who likes to look on your phone while you're also watching the TV, we all know we do it, uh, there is a huge amount of information there, yeah, not just you, on the uh, BBC website. 
uh, the live page, streaming all the tips and trends and information coming in from right around the country. That's there for you throughout the night. Don't turn off the TV and just look at your phone. So keep watching as well as looking on the live stream. But there's a huge amount of info there. Chris providing his analysis as we go through the night on text form as well as here on TV. And just to bring you one tip, a Lib Dem source has just said to me that they have held Hull with three gains. The Liberal Democrats apparently gaining three to hold on to Hull, which Labour were trying to nab back from them. But we haven't got official confirmation of that yet. So we'll bring that to you all. I think out of the corner of my eye, I can see Manira nodding along. So it seems indeed that the Liberal Democrats have held Hull, held Labour off there. Let's talk, though, about one of the other parties involved, the Green Party. We mentioned them a little while ago. And so far, the Greens are up two seats overall, but it seems as if they are down a little bit in some of the wards where they did so well the last time. So it looks at this early stage like they might not be able to match the very good performance that they put in in 2019. But let's see what their co-leader, Carla Denyer, has to say about that. Carla, welcome to the programme. It's good to have you with us. From what you've heard so far, are you a little bit down, as our numbers suggest? No, I'm still feeling very optimistic about our chances this evening. It is, of course, very early in the night, and we know that many of our target seats, places like uh, Herefordshire and Mid Suffolk, are not going to be declaring until um, the afternoon tomorrow. So I'm expecting, based on the responses we've been getting on the doorstep, people are coming to us really from across the political spectrum and in all kinds of different areas of the country. Uh, people are angry with the way the Conservatives are running the country into the ground, but are also telling us that they don't feel inspired by Starmer's Labour. So many people are coming to the Greens voting for us for the first time because they want to be inspired. They want to vote for a party they agree with. And we're standing a record number of candidates this time around. And we think a lot of um, people are going to vote Green for the first time and uh, get more Green councillors than ever before. Your colleague Adrian Ramsey uh, said on Sunday to us here at the BBC that he thought you were looking at or hopeful of getting about 100 seats. Does that still feel roughly on course? Yes, I think so. Um, so we are defending a record number of seats this time around. Uh, we're defending 280 seats, which is more than ever before. But we're not just aiming to hold steady. We are expecting to make substantial gains. Um, we've already made gains in uh, South Tyneside, where we were already the official opposition, but we've cemented that now. Uh, and yeah, we, there's a lot more exciting councils from um, places like uh, Lancaster, um, Mid Suffolk that I mentioned earlier, which is a council where we have the potential to um, not just become the administration, but have a majority with over 50% of the council seats. And if we do that, then that will be the first council, not just in the UK, but in the Northern Hemisphere where that's uh, taken place. So. Uh We'll, we'll, we'll see, but I'm feeling optimistic. And I just want to ask you about another council. Now, you have been running Brighton and Hove Council, now not as a majority, as you hope to be in Mid-Suffolk, but Labour, I know, have been working hard to try to get control of Brighton and Hove Council down on the south coast back from the Greens. Um, what's your sense of whether you'll be disappointed there and lose control? It's far too early to tell for Brighton and Hove, but I'm really proud of the hard work that our Green councillors in a minority administration on the council there have been doing, getting investment to um, help prevent homelessness, to improve uh, public transport, walking and cycling in the city. Um, and, and yeah, we're, they've been doing fantastic work. And they are, uh, although they are our only sole administration at the moment, we're actually part of the administration in 17 councils in England. And we are the official opposition in a further 10. And we're expecting both of those numbers to go up significantly when we get the results in tomorrow. OK, Carla, thank you very much. Good to have you with us. And we'll keep a close eye on lots of those interesting races where the Greens are a factor around the country over the night. Now, a couple of minutes ago, um, we brought you what seemed like news that Hull had been held with three extra seats by the Liberal Democrats. Now, it is a big city, northeast of England, very important to the people who live there, big area of the country. Let's take a look at the seats as they're still counting. The Lib Dems there on 27, Labour on 18. Now, there are still two, 12 seats to declare, but you can see there that the Lib Dems, we can confirm that they've gained two. 
um, and that Labour have lost to. Let's take a look at the vote share so far. 52% for the Liberal Democrats, 39% for the Labour Party, the Conservatives way behind on six, and the change since 2019, so often this is the critical thing, 6% up by the Liberal Democrats, but they're still counting in Hull, okay? These are not complete figures, but 6% up and Labour only up 1%. So let's go straight there and talk to Sarah Sanderson, who's there for the BBC tonight. Sarah, it sounds like a really exciting moment for the Liberal Democrats. So they all got broad smiles on their faces? Oh, they certainly have, Laura. Good morning. It was at the start of this local election, it was a bitter battle simply between the Labour Party and the Lib Dems. And that's because last year, the Lib Dems took control of Hull City Council after a decade-long reign by Labour. And as you say, the Lib Dems tonight, they, the council the declarations are still coming through, but the Lib Dems have taken two seats off Labour. Um, jubilant celebrations from the Lib Dems. The Lib Dems are now on 31, Labour are on 24. There's still a vacancy which has been held by Labour, that's due to come in, and an independent uh, retirement seat. We've got another declaration coming in now. But it's safe to say the Lib Dems have held on to Hull. And given um, last year the vote in Hull, voter turnout was 23.5%, that was the lowest amongst unitary authorities in the country. This year's turnout is 22.01%, a lower turnout. But in Hull, Laura, those votes are heading to the Lib Dems and and as you say, they've held on to the council. Let's see where we go from here. But happy faces with the Lib Dems. And why do you think that's happened? Well, I think, and I think a lot of people will say this, in the last year that Labour were in power, they made a rather unpopular decision to extend the bus lanes and put cycle lanes within the bus lanes and other parts of the city. And I have to say, it caused a lot of congestion. Traffic slowed down, people were unhappy. People decided to turn their votes to the Lib Dems last year because they said to the voters they were the listening party. They told the voters they would talk to them before making any changes. And it what was quite a controversial move by Labour, what they did, they were trying to improve the city. They were trying to make a difference. But it didn't go down too well for the people of Hull. And I think that was a persuasive factor for the votes when the Lib Dems took power last year. What the Lib Dems will do with those bus lanes and those cycle lanes in Hull for the next couple of years, we're not quite sure. But I can say this, they'll be um, you know, celebrating tonight because they retained control of Hull City Council. And well, now we'll see whether they keep those votes in the coming years. Sarah, thank you very much indeed. And we don't often on a local election programme get glimpses of many of the declarations. They don't go in for the big grand declarations where MPs have to stand nervously wondering about their future and we see those huge moments of drama or those memorable ones that you stay up for. But it was nice to have a little flavour of a cheer with some very happy Liberal Democrats there <laughs> in Hull where they have held on despite Labour's effort to get back with them. Chris, when we think about the Lib Dems, mm. just think about them for a moment. You know, they're, they're in a tricky position, aren't they? Because they lost that status of being the third biggest party. They went down to really a tiny rump in Parliament did they see tonight as a really strategic opportunity for them? Yes, and, and seeing it as a point, they hope that the that their coalition years recede sufficiently far in the rearview mm. uh, mirror for plenty of their former voters to perhaps return. Plenty of Lib Liberal Democrats will talk proudly about their time in, in coalition government, mm. but the, the numbers back in 2015, near apocalypse, sort of mm. speak for themselves. And, and it's had quite a long time ago. They're well and now, it, yeah. Exactly. And had massive consequences. Obviously, in shriveling their representation at, at Westminster, it's edged up a bit since then, but not vastly. That has meant they get much less media attention. And so they've been trying to build their way back. What's fascinating about the situation in Hull there, where they've mm. done well, is it's one of those areas, and there aren't all that many, where there's a tussle between the Lib Dems and Labour. So much of the focus with the uh, Liberal Democrat battlegrounds is often with the Conservatives, often in a, a ring of uh, seats and council areas mm. around London. Very, very few Westminster seats are a Labour Lib Dem battleground, Sheffield Hallam being being one the of classic. them. Classic. And, and, and there, we, there we see in Hull that, that battle between uh, the Lib Dems and Labour, where the Lib Dems have built themselves up as a prominent opposition voice and obviously gone beyond that in terms of the in terms of the local authority. You can see, though, that they have been this time around really trying to, I suppose, maybe try some new ways of cutting through. You know, we used to have 
Ed Davey, I think he started off with a small hammer for a blue door and he ended up in this campaign. I wonder if we can show the pictures oh, actually tractor. driving a giant tractor towards bales of hay, mm. uh, the sort of metaphorical Tory blue wall, to use that jargon, uh, that he wanted to smash through. Um, and yet the big thing for them go. last time round, see, I couldn't resist it. <laughs> and we haven't even had dogs at polling stations yet, but that is coming at some point, I promise you, in the depths of the night. Um, <laughs> for Ed Davey, you know, the, the Lib Dems previously were so much built their identity around what happened during Brexit. Mm. You know, even at the last general election, they went in being the Remain party. Um, is that something now that they still like to talk about? Or no. actually... Yeah. Not really. No, they don't. I mean, so often, if we go back even, you know, best part of 20, 25 years, so often the Liberal Democrats have been associated, haven't they, at, at key elections mm -hmm. with individual, simple to understand, one line mm -hmm. policies, whether it be about Brexit or in the past about penny on income tax mm -hmm. for provision for education, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, tuition fees. Well, the opposition to the Iraq war, even in, if indeed, you go back. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, th that's less the case now, which causes, I think, some nervousness from, from some. On the Brexit point, what's fascinating is how politics does seem to have moved on, at least mm. as far as the, the plenty of the big parties at Westminster. The SNP would still make an argument that they would mm. want to talk about uh, talk about Brexit. But as far as Labour, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats are concerned, a real desire to move on, driven by, they would argue, a sense that lots of voters want to move on, however strongly held their view on Brexit might have been, mm. that they want to focus on other things, not least because as our politicians will be the first to say tonight, issues like the cost of living are just so much more prominent in people's minds and perhaps the sort of lethargy uh, mm. from people who are um, worn out by the noise of those Brexit arguments over the last couple of years. Just got a couple of other mm -hmm. tidbits to bring you, uh, Laura, uh, in, the last, uh, in the last few minutes. Conservatives, a bit more upbeat in Dudley and Sandwell in the, in the West Midlands, key uh, battleground, the, mm. the West Midlands, of course, come a, come a general election. They're more upbeat there after their pessimism uh, a little uh, uh, in, in other spots. In Hartlepool, we were talking about Hartlepool a few minutes, uh, uh, minutes ago. Um, Hartlepool remains under uh, no overall control. Uh, Labour were one seat short uh, of a, uh, a majority there. And just to give you a sense of the tightness of margins in some of these races, mm. in one ward, Labour lost by two votes after several recounts those votes denying them the majority that they thought they would get. So that council remains under no mm. overall control, uh, with Labour gaining six, the Conservatives down two, them being one short. Mm -hmm. In Redditch, another key battleground mm -hmm. in the general election context, a Conservative hold, again, no change, mm -hmm. but Labour gaining five seats. So we're back to that point about extent. You know, yes. to what extent is Labour moving forward? To mm -hmm. what extent are the uh, Conservatives going backwards? One final one whilst I'm mm -hmm. talking, and then I promise I will shut up. <laughs> uh, Labour have gained seven seats in Tamworth uh, in, now, in Midlands. The Conservatives losing it. Well, there we go. I was just about to tell people about that because Tamworth, council in the Midlands, also interesting for another reason. The MP there, Chris Pincher, was somebody who was close to Boris Johnson. You might remember he was involved in the pretty uh, traumatic for the Conservatives final weeks of Boris Johnson's time in office. He had to resign after allegations were made about his behaviour and he is going as an MP and you can see in his local area the Conservatives have lost control of the council. The Tories have 14 seats, Labour 10, Independents with six and I want to show you the change. Tories down six, Labour up seven. Now as ever wouldn't it be amazing if we were able to get into the polling booth and ask everybody individually what was in their minds when they make their decision. But after all the controversy around Chris Pincher, Pincher in the national headlines and his decision to quit, um, you can't help but wonder if there has actually been an impact on how people have chosen to vote. And you can see there that resulting in Conservative support falling away in Tamworth. Now, Chris was talking a couple of minutes ago then about Brexit having been, you know, that strong line that carved out how people made their decisions politically in this country for such a long time. Whatever your view was, it was certainly became a very much part of people's political identity with huge sway over how they voted, culminating 
probably in the election result in 2019, that huge majority for Boris Johnson. But what kind of impact is it having tonight on how people are making their decisions? Is it perhaps fading a little bit, as Chris was suggesting, and probably at quite a lot of people in the Westminster parties wish it would. Rita, can you take us through that? Well, we've got enough information, Laura, even though the night is young, we have got enough information in terms of how people are voting to be able to analyse this. So we've got councils by Brexit vote and we've divided them up into councils where there was a high Remain vote in 2016 versus those with a high Leave vote in 2016. Um, and this is based on the change since 2019, because as we keep saying, most of these seats were last fought in 2019, when Brexit was still a very salient issue. Theresa May was trying to push her Brexit legislation through Parliament. Uh, it was all very turbulent. Now, we've taken this information from what we call key wards. These are hundreds of wards across the country where we collect information over time about how people are voting, what is happening to the share of support for each of the main political parties. And you can see that so far, uh, Labour is up by seven percentage points, Lib Dems up by two, Conservatives have dropped a little bit and the Independents have gone right down. Now, in high Remain vote areas, you can see that the Labour Party has picked up by four percentage points. But compare that to the high Leave vote areas where Labour's... Um, advantage is double that. They are plus 8% uh, percent in high leave areas. Look at the independent vote there, down by 13%. Now, there will, be, will have been a lot of UKIP uh, voters within that. And it does suggest, doesn't it, that some of those, uh, a, a significant proportion of those UKIP voters have drifted back to Labour. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that Labour's picked up more seats, more councillors, or even more councils in those areas. But it does mean that there is a, a, a renewed enthusiasm, if you like, for Labour in the highly voting councils on the basis of what we know so far. Laura. Peter, thank you very much. Really interesting to see how that is all unfolding. Right, let's talk to Sir John Curtis to see if he can give us an overview. If at this point, we can make any sort of more concrete assumptions or conclusions than we did perhaps an hour ago. So John, from what we are seeing now at nearly 2 a.m., time is whizzing by, um, the Conservatives are losing, I think, around one in three of their seats. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that they could be on course to meet that thousand seat loss, which is something they like to talk about as being likely, yeah. but in reality was more like a pretty much a worst case scenario? I think the way I would put it, Laura, is that as of two o'clock this morning, the Conservatives cannot be sure that they won't end up losing a thousand seats. I don't think I want to say more than that. It is worth perhaps, however, explaining, worth explaining why maybe in the end their expectation management has not necessarily worked out in the way that they were hoping. If we actually look at the swing since 2019 from Conservative to Labour, it's settling down pretty consistently now down to around the 4% mark, sometimes a little bit less. So if you take the 7% Labour up and add to it the 0.2% drop in the Conservatives and divide by two, we're roughly at a 4% swing from Conservative to Labour. Now that, in truth, is a little bit lower than we might have anticipated, uh, given the state of the opinion polls. It's certainly rather less than the swing that was being assumed when Colin Runnings and Michael Thrasher, the well-known low collection experts, came up with that original estimate that the Tories might lose a thousand seats. So why might it still happen? Well, the answer lies in the third column. You will see that the Liberal Democrats are up by a couple of points. That's pretty consistent now. And that while maybe in the end we will discover that maybe the Conservatives don't lose quite so much to Labour, as some people are anticipating, they are at risk of ending up losing more to the Democrats. Indeed, you will notice if you go and look at the scoreboard of gains and losses in terms of seats that at the moment uh, the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party are pretty much sharing the gains between them. So it may well be in the end it's not so much simply Sakir Starmer who might be causing embarrassment to the Labour Party so far as the thousand gains is concerned. But it might be also Sir Ed Davey. Oh, yes, and that tractor that you were showing us a little <laughs> while ago, Laura. But I think my, my feeling about that tractor, of course, is I think Sir Ed Davey was desperate to prove 
that he had an even bigger tractor than Boris Johnson, because you remember during the 2019 <laughs> general election, the way in which Mr. Johnson illustrated he, that to get, Bre to get to Brexit done was indeed to drive a, um, a tractor, not through a hay bale, but I think through some plastic bricks. Maybe Sir Ed David believes that his at least is slightly more uh, environmental friendly than the one that Boris Johnson had three years ago. Sir John, thank you very much indeed. And I have to say, I witnessed Boris Johnson's tractor and it was enormous uh, driving through that wall of polystyrene bricks, as Sir John has recalled correctly. But I didn't in real life see our Davies tractor. I've only seen that in the pictures. So we can't give a qualitative, <laughs> a definitive answer on that question that Sir John was raising. Um, really interesting. And if we were, therefore, to sketch out very, very carefully some headlines from what Sir John was saying. He was sort of suggesting that what we're seeing so far is quite a slump for the Conservatives, a step forward from Labour, but not a stride. And the Liberal Democrats also taking some decent steps forward. But it's early. It's 2 a.m. We've got a fair amount of information coming in, but by no means is this yet the complete picture. But based on where we're at, Let's get the insight of a couple of people who know their way around the different parties' headquarters. Joe Tanner, who used to work for Boris Johnson, thanks for joining us. And Sean Kemp, who was one of the Liberal Democrats' um, political advisers during that coalition period. I mean, Sean, from what you've seen so far, do you think that this is some kind of concrete return for the Lib Dems? Yes, definitely looking that way. I think the Lib Dems came into this thinking... The 2019 set of results in these same wards was a really great result for them that sort of showed the first steps of making a comeback from sort of the coalition darkest days of what happened after that. I think if they make gains again from that set of results and keep showing momentum, it's, it's going to be great for them because it, what they're really looking at here is how are they set up for the next election? Are they set to uh, challenge the Conservatives, particularly in those seats around London and in the, and in the South East? And, and nights like this are one of the few nights when the Liberal Democrats, frankly, can get noticed when there are a relatively small number of MPs and so on. I mean, that's the reason why Ed, you know, jumps on a massively slow moving tractor is because, then, you know, <laughs> then you guys will show it on the screen and the rest of it. So yeah, to get the chance to actually say, look, we're here and we're winning and we're a threat to the Tories, uh, they would be delighted with, I think. And Joe, how miserable do you think the Tories will be on what they're watching right now in Tory HQ? Um, well, it's that classic thing, isn't it, of it's a bit too early to say, but it certainly doesn't look very good. But it, this thing with the Lib Dems is always that the Lib Dems are often, um, they're sort of underestimated mm. um, and often underestimated between elections. And you kind of forget what they're busy doing on the ground um, in terms of making inroads, in terms of their general campaigning. Um, and I think... There is that sense of this has been a sort of two party talk consistently on a national level for many, what, what feels like many, many months. You know, it's all about what Keir's going to do. It's all about what Rishi's going to do. Is Keir going to overtake, et cetera? And quietly, I think the Lib Dems are plugging away. So there probably is a sense of how much really can the Tories predict right now? They're probably all, they've been sitting, I think, munching on their pizzas at Tory HQ that Rishi Sunak apparently bought them all out of his own pocket they were keen to stress um, <laughs> but I'm not sure it's going to give them great comfort at the moment. Joe, well, I, the, the briefing from uh, Conservative sources about the pizza said there were only 10 pizzas which um, I did wonder if that was really going to keep them going throughout the whole evening but yeah, Sean, There's not and, a lot of people left at Tory HQ which is a worry <laughs> so. <laughs> Maybe they've all gone, maybe they took a look at the pizzas and then headed off. Anyway, Joe and Sean, thank you very much for joining us. Sean there with some more important comments on the tractor. Um, we're about to go to the news, but before we do that, let's take a look at our tower tally of what we're seeing so far tonight on this local election evening at around about two o'clock. Losing 49, the Liberal Democrats gaining 15 with 78 seats and another five for the Greens. We've been talking to all of those political parties and we've been out around the country hearing from people on the ground. Plenty more of that to come. But now, the news with Luxby Gopal.
Hello, here's your summary of the BBC News. Counting is underway in the local elections in England in one of the last major tests of public opinion before next year's general election. Voters have been deciding who will run services at 230 local councils, with around 8,000 seats up for grabs. Mayoral elections have also been taking place in Bedford, Leicester, Mansfield and Middlesbrough. Our political correspondent Jonathan Blake has more. Celebration in Stoke-on-Trent. Just one councillor of thousands finding out their fate. Counting has begun in more than 200 towns, cities and rural areas across England where voters have had their say on who should run local services. The Tories are braced for a tough night, hoping only to limit their losses. And among a handful of very early results, they lost control of Brentwood in Essex with the Liberal Democrats picking up seats, hoping to make gains elsewhere too, at the Conservatives' expense. Fantastic result for the Liberal Democrats in one of the safest Tory seats in the country. Uh, we've gained three seats, um, we're now up to 17 seats, and uh, the council moves into an overall control, and uh, it's a time of change in Brentwood, and we're really delighted. It's fantastic news. Labour have so far made modest progress, but the party needs a strong showing to prove its lead in opinion polls can bring winning results. In a first for elections in England, photo ID was required at polling stations, which left some unable to vote, but it's too soon to say what impact the change has had. Only around a quarter of the councils holding elections are counting votes overnight, so early results won't give anything like the full picture. But in the hours ahead, these local elections will be closely watched as a crucial test of the national political picture. Jonathan Blake, BBC News. And all the local results will be available for you online. To see who won in your local area, you can use our postcode checker, which is available on the BBC News website and on our app. And we will be back in an hour with the latest news updates. But for now, it's back to our special election night coverage with Laura. And just a reminder, though, before then, to see who won in your local area, you can use our postcode checker, which is available on the BBC News website and on our app. A very warm welcome back to election 2023. It is seven minutes past two, if my eyesight serves me correctly. And we are starting to see some results coming in from around the country, giving us an early taste of what these results are going to mean for the political parties. Votes are still being counted. There we can see people hard at work in Ipswich and Suffolk and some interesting races there we might talk about a bit later. Bolton, an area that's been very, very closely fought over. We've been hearing from our reporter on the ground. And let's show you the scene also in Leicestershire. Looks like you could hardly hear a pin drop. People standing, wa watching, wondering and waiting. And let's have a look also at Hull, where we've been talking about in the last few minutes. The Lib Dems have retained control, taking seats where Labour was hoping to take that council and shove them out of office. But the Liberal Democrats, very happy indeed, we were hearing from our reporter there, to have done well and held on to the council. Uh, we can show you what's happening in Stoke. Look, applause there. Happy Labour faces. That looks like that's the announcement of one particular ward because these are local elections, not general elections, so you don't get the big dramatic declarations. But that looks like a councillor to me who's just won his ward again, getting hugs from his friends and family, pat on the back. And we'll go back to Stoke a bit later in the night and see what's going on, because that is one of those parts of the country, Staffordshire, high Brexit vote, very closely fought, where Labour really want to be showing evidence of progress. I want you to remind you of a couple of important things as we're watching together, things coming through the night. These seats, the last time they came up, were fought in 2019, in May 2019. So Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn, Vince Cable were in charge. Completely different political world. That's our baseline for these seats. The other thing to say is there aren't elections happening in every part of the UK. No elections in Scotland, no local elections in some parts of England, none in London, for example, none in Wales. 
There are there some elections in Northern Ireland, but not for a couple of weeks' time. Public service announcements out of the way, so we all know what we're dealing with. Um, Chris, really interesting, just mm. before two o'clock we heard from Sir John, we sort of can say at about 2 a.m. so far, it's looking like grim night for the Tories. Bits of progress for Labour, but a step forward, not a giant stride. But the Lib Dems making a decisive step, maybe not a huge stride, but that's kind of where we're looking at. Yes, and so something of a pincer movement as far as the Conservatives are concerned in terms of Labour gains at their expense in some places and Lib Dem gains elsewhere. Just to pick up on your reflections there and those pictures from Stoke, I hear from a, uh, a Labour MP that they uh, think that they could flip Stoke. That is looking probable. Mm. They say such a key battleground, Stoke, isn't it, as we've been reflecting over the last uh, couple of hours. A couple of other things that have popped onto my phone in the last few minutes, uh, Laura. Um, the Conservative leader of Thurrock, uh, this is in Essex, has uh, lost their seat uh, to Labour. Uh, big Lib Dem gains in Windsor and Maidenhead in Berkshire, as we've mm -hmm. been reflecting. It, control there looks like it might be on a knife edge. And we were talking, what, 10, 15 minutes ago about Tamworth mm. um, in the Midlands. Seven gains for the Labour Party there, pushing it from Conservative control to no overall control. Uh, Labour pointing out it has been run by the Conservatives since 2004. So they, uh, they point there to something that they, they suggest amounts to being significant, even though it's not somewhere where they have taken control. It's, it's flipping into, it's into significant no overall signs. And I, and I think we've heard already, I think, in the studio tonight, haven't we, that Labour will be very careful to be pointing out that geographical progress, not just the overall tallies of where they take control. And um, we might actually see tonight in the way these elections are happening, not that many councils change hands, yes. maybe more tomorrow when there's lots more results. But if Labour was to take Stoke, and I think they'd take, need eight seats, eight new seats to mm -hmm. do that, that would be quite a symbol, wouldn't it? It would, and symbols matter. So we should reflect, shouldn't we, particularly in this, uh, this overnight section of the results coming in. In so many of the councils, it's only a third of council seats that were up for election. So mathematically, the likelihood of a change in control is much more limited than it is when an entire council is up. As we've been reflecting there, you can still read a huge amount into a set of results, even in a council where nothing in headline terms has changed. Mm -hmm. But the party leaders, uh, yes, of course, they're looking at what we get to tomorrow when there's that projected national share mm -hmm. of the vote. But they're also looking for symbolic places that point to change not least places that they can leap on a train to yeah. tomorrow or during the day on friday in order to point to a triumph well i was going to say yeah. how many times do you think that you've been to a political visit in stoke and if you add it to how many times i've been to a political visit oh, yes. to stoke we'd probably be in triple figures uh, but and people in the but, high street say oh, not, not you again <laughs> yeah <laughs> but why why in particular that part of the country you know we think of staffordshire you've explained that it would be a really important symbol but that part of the country why is that the kind of place that Labour is so keen to show progress? It's so important because places like Stoke, they absolutely have to be Labour securing the support of and being seen to secure the support of if Keir Starmer is going to climb this massive electoral mountain that he faces at the next general election. They were absolutely thumped, weren't they, back in 2019. Mm. Biggest general election defeat for Labour since 19. 35. And Stoke so, ended up with three Tory MPs. Well, indeed, exactly. Mm. Alongside swathes of other seats in the, in the Midlands and the north of England, many of which had never been held by the Conservatives or had not been held by the Conservatives for a very, very long time. So mm. Labour have to be winning back places like that or winning wards back in places like that to give the party a sense that they might be able to climb that mountain at the next general election. Because on the one hand, they've had these massive opinion poll leads recently. Mm. On the other, whilst that has given them some optimism, the mountain that they still face is absolutely colossal. The kind of swing that they need to creep back into Westminster with a majority of one is mm. massive, let alone enough to be able to uh, comfortably govern with a majority of their own. So that's why places like Stoke and elsewhere will be poured over in the micro detail, ward by ward, almost vote by vote, mm. to see what the parties can, can deign from them and work out how they calibrate their campaigning and their geographical focus over the next year, 18 months. Uh, well, we like micro detail. Absolutely. You won't use the word micro detail. I know someone who's got good at providing micro detail. Rita, <laughs> tell us. Let me take you through some micro detail in a couple of the councils where they are still counting. Uh, I'm going to take you to Lincoln. There it is flashing over there in the east. Uh, as you can see, there are still 
five seats to declare Labour on 15, Conservatives on nine. Now, this is a Labour council. It's been Labour since 2011, but the Conservatives took the parliamentary seat here at the last general election. So it's one of those areas where Labour really wants to see an advance in its support. But look at this. It's lost two seats and the beneficiaries are the Liberal Democrats. They've picked them up. And this is the change in the share of the vote uh, on four years ago. As you can see, Labour up a little bit, but the Lib Dems, again, are the main beneficiaries of the drop in support for the Conservatives and for the Greens. So uh, we'll be watching that council as uh, it tallies up more. I'm going to take you now to Dudley uh, in the West Midlands. Uh, you can see it just highlighted there. Still counting here in Dudley as well, still 16 seats to declare. Now, this is a flip-floppy sort of council. It's been Conservative since 2021 and it was hung before then. Conservatives now on 35 and Labour on 20. But as always, it's the change in the share of the vote that's interesting. Just a, a sort of one seat swap there. Uh, but look at this, Labour up by 15% in Dudley. Uh, Conservatives up by 5% as well and the independents down by 24%. So it feels like a real collapse in the independent vote here in Dudley. And at the moment, it's Labour who are the main beneficiaries. So uh, we'll watch that too. Much more to come, Laura. Rita, thank you very much indeed for taking us under the bonnet in those two different races. Um, let's get out on the ground. Let's talk again to Nisha Chopra in North West Leicestershire. Now, we were talking a while ago about, you know, conservative nerves in that part of the country, the controversy around the local MP, Andrew Bridgen, who's not a conservative MP anymore. But it sounds like it might not just be the conservative majority at risk. It sounds there is a, a whisper that Labour might even win overall. What are you hearing? Yeah, it's it's quite extraordinary, so now actually. The I mean, election there's edition, more for counts going on, so I hope you can still hear me. But yeah, I mean, I Labour have just won three seats now here from the Tories in areas that you wouldn't expect them to actually win seats from the Tories. In Ashby, it's an affluent middle class uh, area. You would have thought they'd still support the Tories. I mean, and some of the margins are quite good in these wards. You know, in one ward, Labour won with 337 votes compared to the Conservative candidate on 221. And in local elections, that's quite a decent Wyatt, margin. Barry, Interestingly, though, when you looked seats. out on the social media, the on, on the leaflets, the local, uh, the Labour parliamentary candidate, zero. Amanda Hack, was, was endorsing all the Labour candidates zero. on social media Voting when she was out canvassing. And that seems to have done zero. the trick because those are the people Being that have gained from the Tories. Whereas that wasn't the case for the Tory candidates. They couldn't be endorsed by Andrew Bridgen because he's been expelled from the party. So perhaps the Andrew Bridgen effect is having an effect and we may see that potentially Labour, you know, have minority control here. OK, Nisha, well, keep us posted with what's going on. We can hear applause in the background as another ward is announced. Um, but keep us posted as that really would be a fascinating result if Labour managed to take it. And also there are in the background all those really interesting issues around the local MP having been booted out of the Conservative Party and Nisha explaining why that had an, an, an impact in terms of the local conversation. Um, let's go a bit south and a bit east to Andrew Sinclair. I hope I got that geography right. Um, Andrew's in Ipswich in Suffolk for us. Now there's lots of interesting things happening in Suffolk, all kinds of different races. But can we start first of all on what could be a moment of history, that mid-Suffolk race where the Green wants to be the first majority council for them. What does that race look like, do you reckon? Yeah, this, yeah, this is the result we'll get tomorrow afternoon when they count the result in mid-Suffolk. But yes, it's next door to us here in Ipswich. And it is a seat which the Greens have been taking incredibly seriously. They were already the main opposition on the local council. At the moment, when the Liberal Democrats vote with them as well, the Conservatives have to rely on the chairman's casting vote to get their business done on Mid-Suffolk Council. So the Greens believe they can take that council tomorrow and they believe they might be able to take it and it be to become the first fully run Green Council with a full overall majority in the country. So that's one we'll be watching very closely uh, tomorrow afternoon. 
And in terms, Andrew, of the other races in your area, I mean, we can see we've got very few uh, numbers so far from the councils, but the Tories are down 12, Labour up three, the Lib Dems up five. What will you be particularly keeping a weather eye on in the next couple of hours there? Well, here in Ipswich, this is the one little bit of red in what is otherwise a very blue county of Suffolk. Uh, the news from uh, Ipswich is that once again Labour are going to hold on to this council. They seem to have been um, holding on to all their seats tonight and they've just made another game. So they will be very pleased with what's happening here, not least because this is a marginal Conservative seat currently held by two Conservative MPs and Labour will say that the fact that they've picked up another seat here tonight shows that they're moving in the right direction. What's interesting though is it's a very mixed picture in other parts of East Anglia at the moment. Um, that Labour lost a seat in Harlow and the Conservatives have held on to Harlow Council tonight. Labour also lost a seat in Basildon, which has in the past been um, a Labour-run council. Um, as Chris was saying a short while ago, we believe the Conservative leader of Thurrock Council could be in trouble. We're also hearing that the Conservatives could be in big trouble in Braintree Council tonight. Now, Braintree is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, because it is um, the seat of uh, James Cleverly, the Foreign Secretary, and Priti Patel, the former Home Secretary. Also, very interestingly, it's the place where the Weathersfield military airbase is, the place which is about to take a lot of um, asylum seekers. And I'm told that Weathersfield has been playing very big on the doorsteps in Braintree. Andrew, thanks so much. Keep us posted with what's going on at that count because a lot of different and really fascinating sort of patchwork of races in that part of the country. I just want to show you what's happened in Ipswich um, where Labour has held the council. That's where we were speaking to Andrew from. And actually, they've gained one seat. Tories down one. Let's have a look at the vote share. 45% for the Labour Party, 35% for the Conservatives. But here's an interesting thing. Let's look at the change in the vote since 2019. Increase of 2% for the Labour Party, increase of 4% for the Conservative Party, but independents and smaller parties falling away. So that suggests something slightly different going on there in Ipswich. But people will, as Andrew was saying, be watching it closely because it's one of those places where you have a split city in terms of the MPs that they choose to send to Westminster. Another place like that is Plymouth, where there is a prominent Conservative MP, the Veterans Minister, Johnny Mercer, and then also Labour representation at uh, Westminster, Luke Pollard, I believe if I'm getting my facts right. Martin Oates is there for us tonight. Now, when we talked to you about an, an hour ago, Martin, you said the Tories were worried about wipeout. Is that what it looks like? Yes, it seems that the predictions made by uh, figures in both parties uh, are being realise so we are seeing Labour gains here. I did mention I think that there's been a lot of local disagreement within the Conservative group, some councillors leaving the group. Interestingly enough a couple of the uh, former Conservatives now independents have held their seats but we are seeing those Labour ad uh, advances. Uh, also mentioned looking towards a general election as inevitably uh, okay. we will do. Um, we are seeing Labour gains in the uh, seat of Johnny Mercer, the Plymouth Moorview MP and Veterans Minister. So Plymouth already has one Labour MP, Luke Pollard, the Shadow Defence Minister, the other City MP Johnny Mercer, he uh, is probably watching these uh, results uh, tick in with um, some degree of anxiety. Well, I, and you'd see why if you could see the share that we're showing our viewers at the moment. So the change in share in Plymouth so far, the Conservatives down 16%, a very significant drop in their support there. But Martin, in your assessment, you know, we've talked already, there was a really vigorously discussed local issue about cutting down trees, the kind of thing, we saw the same thing happen in Sheffield, that drive people around the twist and make them really, really angry with their local council. Has it been possible there to assess tonight, talking to your contacts on the ground, the blend between those local controversies and the national picture? It's very difficult to say. I mean, I have to say, I haven't really heard anybody talking about the trees uh, here in this hall, but uh, you know, the trees really were just the end of a long saga. It's been a very, very difficult period for the Conservative group 
here in the city. There have been disagreements over all kinds of things. Um, they lost their group leader of the issue of the trees. He resigned after making that executive order which led to the trees being removed just before the election campaign. But if we wind back a year, um, they went into the uh, election campaign last year because Plymouth elects in thirds, having just lost a leader then. In that case, he was toppled in a vote of no confidence. So it's been an extremely fraught time for the Conservative group, uh, which uh, must have had uh, a role, I think, in, in tonight's events. OK, Martin, thanks very much indeed. Well, if those Labour gains all come through, they would be very pleased to be able to take Plymouth because it's very definitively on their target list. Um, now, Bridget and Manira, you're going to leave us before too long, but Richard, you are staying with us, I'm afraid. I'm not going to let you leave. So we're going to talk to these two <laughs> for the next five minutes. Um, Bridget, Plymouth looks like a great mm -hmm. picture for you. Are you expecting to take it? It's looking good um, and we've made significant gains uh, and are making significant gains there. And I think why that matters is, of course, we want to secure control locally, mm. but actually it's what that takes us to where it comes to the general election. And as you heard, uh, we've got a really key target parliamentary constituency there for the general election. That's the kind of place that I was really hoping we'd make progress this evening. And judging by Plymouth, that's exactly what's happening. But what we were hearing earlier, though, from John Curtis was actually suggesting that the overall picture for Labour is, you know, decent, but not where it would need to be if you are to climb that Himalayan mountain to have a bigger swing than Tony Blair got into number, in, got into number 10 in 1997. We know we've still got a big challenge ahead of us and we're not complacent about that for one second. I think obviously we're going to see a lot of results running into tomorrow as mm -hmm. well. There's a lot to come, particularly in, again in those areas, those parts of the country where we need to make progress for the general election. So we've still got to keep an eye out for those, but I think if you look at the progress we're making right across the country, whether that's in Plymouth or whether it's in Hartlepool, we came very, very close in Hartlepool to take mm. control there, which I don't think any of us really expected. And to be two votes short of taking control because of one ward, a very safe Conservative ward, I think does show the progress that we've been making since 2019. There's a long way to go, mm -hmm. but I think we're seeing some really strong and encouraging signs this evening um, that Keir Starmer has turned around the Labour Party. We're looking outwards to the country. We're focusing on the issues that do really matter to voters, particularly on the cost of living, on the NHS and on crime. And I think we're starting to see that come through in the results that people recognise we understand the challenges they face and in contrast with the Conservatives, we recognise that we've got a plan to tackle it. Some people did feel that you ran quite a nasty campaign in some ways though. I think it's perfectly legitimate that we should point out exactly what this government is responsible for after 13 years and the reality after 13 years is that people right across the country are worse off, they feel less safe than they did, we've got fewer police on our streets and we face record weights where it comes to the NHS. I think it's right and proper that we make that clear and we make clear exactly who is responsible for that. That's 13 years now of Conservative failure. And Nira, you're going to leave us in a few minutes. What's your parting shot? Well, uh, it's looking like a fantastic night for the Lib Dems. As uh, Chris was saying, it looks like Windsor and Maidenhead. Theresa May's backyard mm. is on a knife edge because we've made big gains there. We've made gains against Labour in the north east of England, in, in Hull, in Sunderland, in Newcastle. Um, so... Uh, I believe so. Nice. Oh, well, and, and, and we've um, and we've um, we've become um, and we've become the uh, I, I believe the op op official opposition in Sunderland now. That's correct. So, so you didn't yeah. have any gains from okay. Scotland. Yeah. Uh, but the point is, we're making gains across the country, north and south, and this is really key for us going forward towards the general election uh, in some of our target seats, whether that's places like Stockport, Surrey, Hertfordshire, and some of those places we'll be counting tomorrow. But we're feeling very upbeat and positive. I think what, one of the things I want to ask both of you about, though, before you leave, is that we know this time there has been some evidence in different parts of the country of one of your parties or the other, you know, just sort of holding back a bit. Now, when that happens, we've heard about it sort of happening in Bracknell. We know that some of your MPs would like you to do it on a more formal ba basis. If your parties are informally co sort of cooperating, sometimes letting people go forward, I mean, has, has that been a strategy this time? Uh, absolutely not. I mean... Uh, at certainly not at a national level. There's no arrangement like that. We are a party that we target our resources in the areas where, where we know we can win. We've got a record number of candidates standing in these local elections, so there, there, there is no pact there. There's no formal pact, but do you acknowledge it has some in some parts of the country been happening on the ground well, a little bit in this parties, campaign? Uh, local parties make their own decisions about where they target their resources, but I'm delighted that, we, as I say, we've put up a record number of candidates this time. Bridget, some of your colleagues would like to see actually something formal. 
No, what you tend to see happening is where Labour is doing better nationally, that does actually tend to benefit the Liberal Democrats in, cons in constituencies where Labour isn't competitive. So I think in, in seats where, you know, where it spills over into the general election, where you've got Lib Dem Conservative marginals, a more competitive, a stronger Labour Party does tend to aid the Liberal Democrats in their fights against the Conservatives. And we're in a much stronger position than we were in 2019, that's for sure. Well, they're, do, they're doing I, you a favour, according well, to Bridget. Well, I, think, I think what Bridget's uh, alluding to is the fact that we have a savvy electorate that understands tactical voting in a terrible voting system, where often people are, are also voting against a party that they don't want to come in as much as they are voting for the party that wants to come in. And that's uh, and key to, for if, if we want to see the Tories out of government next year, then frankly, the Liberal Democrats w will need to be picking up seats right across the country, uh, as well as the Labour Party. OK, Manir Wilson and Bridget Phillipson for the Lib Dems and Labour. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Richard, as I said, you are kindly staying with us. I'm not holding you against your will, but the two of you, thank you very much indeed for being with us. As Manira was saying, we have a savvy electorate. We know we have a savvy electorate, certainly savvy electorate watching us at this time of the morning. And for you savvy people watching out there, Rita can give us some more delving into the detail. Rita. Yes, Laura, thank you. Uh, let's start with a uh, look at where we are now. And these numbers are changing all the time. And as you can see, the Conservatives have lost 64 councillors. Labour has gained 40 councillors and the Liberal Democrats have gained 17. Now, I want to show you a graph uh, which is the projected national share. Now, remember, this is where we extrapolate how the whole country would have voted if everyone were voting in these elections. Remember, London isn't voting, Birmingham isn't voting. Um, but if the whole country were voting, how would it look based on the results that we have so far? And we've got those results from the key wards, which is where we measure how the support for each of the main parties changes over time. And we've got over a third of those in. So this is what the results are suggesting at the moment. This could change, but at the moment, this is suggesting that the Labour Party has actually not put on uh, any support from 2022, from last year. It is actually just flatlining. The Conservatives have lost five percentage points on where they were uh, 12 months ago. The Lib Dems have picked up 1% and uh, others, which will include the Greens, are up by 4%. Now, that's um, an interesting graph, isn't it? Because Labour is clearly doing rather better than it was doing in 2019, which is the last time that these seats were fought. Uh, the Conservatives are not on this projection. Um, and Labour will be heartened by the fact that there is that 5% gap between it and the Conservatives. At the same time, they would also like to see more of a surge in their own support and not simply have to rely on that gap. Now, as I say, this is how it looks at the moment. It will change, it can change as more results come in. But as an early indicator, that is where we are. Yeah. Rita, thank you very much indeed. Well, very interesting projections at this stage, as they are at this stage at about 2.30 in the morning. And we are joined by a couple of new guests joining our panel. Baroness Kramer, Susan Kramer for the Liberal Democrats has joined us. Seamless switchover. And Bridget Phillipson has become Jonathan Ashworth, <laughs> the Liberal, um, the Labour uh, Shadow Work and Pensions Secretary. Welcome to you both. And we'll get stuck into a bit of conversation with you in a few minutes time. Remember, there's a conversation going on online as well as there is here in the studio if you are the kind of person who likes to do things on your phone while you're watching the telly this is where you can do it the bbc's live page where all the information from the council's counting tonight in england is streaming in lots of tips and intelligence for our t from our teams on the ground there you can find it there at the bbc news app or bbc.co.uk forward slash news now as we were just hearing from Rita, if things carry on on this current trend, then the Conservatives might end up with a share from John Curtis's giant calculator of about 25%. And Chris, that would be worse than when Boris Johnson was in office this time last year, already in a lot of trouble, already with a very unhappy party. 
and 25% as a projected national share, that figure if the whole country had been voting, um, that would be one of the worst local election results for a Conservative Party ever, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, it would, and it would cause real jitters for exactly that reason. Now, there's always examples you can use as a counter, aren't there? And of course, of course. you know, if we go back, if we go back four years, the Conservatives had a pretty rough night, and in the very set of seats, pretty much that we're seeing fought again uh, today. And th th there's two points worth making on that. One is that falls tonight are falls further from big falls that the Conservatives uh, were subjected to last time round. It's also worth pointing out in 2019, after that uh, a rough night at the local elections, an even more desperate night for the Conservatives at the European elections that followed, they then of course won a general election six months later. So mm. when we do these various bits of extrapolation, there are always different lines down which you can sure. point in terms of having things look. But as you say, that number mm. would really be quite... Uh, be quite something and would prompt real nerves and jitters I think after a period where they've managed to at Westminster settle things down internally mm. after all of the fireworks and turbulence that we all witnessed uh, last year. But do you think it was actually sort of not Krishi Sunak off course I mean it's been interesting in the last couple of weeks you've sort of wondered if he's been trying to pretend that these elections weren't even happening you know there was the odd picture of him looking at a pothole but today and i'm sure we'll see this weekend through mm. the coronation he'll be very eager to be seen with world leaders yeah. and doing all sorts of official things and we didn't see any pictures of him on the campaign trail today he was busy instead of downing street so do you think they'll just be sort of blinkers it or will it change something so it has been striking how little we've seen of Rishi Sunak out on the campaign. He has been out and about, but not that often. Quite striking on that last day of campaigning on uh, Wednesday, as we saw various political mm. leaders out and about. From memory, Keir Starmer was in Medway in Kent. Uh, Rishi Sunak uh, was in Amersham in Buckinghamshire, where there aren't any elections. And then here uh, he is today, and then he's been doing to this, have the, the, the cameras, you know, the, the grip the, and grins and all the rest of it. Now, we, we should say Rwanda, we, that, yeah. that any prime minister at a point like this weekend would make the diplomatic, make the most of the diplomatic opportunity to, to see leaders coming and going and do that sort of world stage thing that only a prime minister uh, can do. But yeah, it has been striking that he hasn't been particularly, uh, been particularly visible. It's kind of been driven by hate party HQ has been getting on with the sort of mm. business of being prime minister. I think what's interesting psychologically though, Laura, within the Conservative Party is such was the turbulence of last year. So volcanic were the rows, the party conference in particular, this sort of public civil war playing out to the to the country, that when I speak to Conservative MPs from the most senior to, to, to more junior, that they've worn themselves out with internal conflict. And I think there's a sense, really, that however bad things turn out to be, they have hitched their, hitched their wagon to Rishi Sunak between here and the, and the general election. But when MPs return to Westminster next week, particularly in those areas where in local authority terms, mm -hmm. their party has done poorly, mm -hmm. of course they're going to be thinking, my goodness, this isn't just opinion polls, this is vote key votes in key areas, and will that mean come the general election I'll be, I'll be done for? And that shifts their mentality, their outlook, uh, and how that then manifests itself is it will then be fascinating. You surely would never suggest that uh, an MP might think about their own welfare when they look at how results well, stack up across the country. Do, isn't it? <laughs> well, let's talk to one of those Conservative politicians around the country who has lost his seat and there are big consequences for them too in Worcester. Let's just take a look at the numbers first before we talk to the former leader there. Now Worcester Council was already not being controlled by anybody but let's look at the numbers. Labour now has 13 seats, the Greens have 10 seats, the Conservatives in third place with eight. What's the change? Look at this. Greens take four, Labour only take one, even though they were hoping to look competitive there. The Conservatives have lost seven seats. The vote share, fascinating, not much in it. Labour on 28, the Greens with the highest vote share, 29, and the Tories in third place with 26, the Liberal Democrats in fourth place. But the all-important change of the share, look, the Greens up 10% and the Conservatives down 11%. Now, let's speak then to Chris Mitchell, who was the leader of Worcester Council there. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Now, the Tories didn't win a single seat. You've lost your seat to the Greens. What do you think led to that result? 
Uh, a, a number of reasons, I guess. The political backdrop of Westminster undoubtedly is um, uh, a key factor, um, which is uh, we, we heard on the doorstep. Um, but also, I think it goes down to uh, the way that the, uh, the opposition ganged up is the wrong word. Um, there was a clear strategy of uh, if you want the Tories out, then you need to vote for, in my ward it was the Greens because the Labour and Liberal Democrats literally didn't campaign and it was similar in other wards. So yeah, uh, the, a key factor though was um, I think some uh, residents showed uh, unhappiness with our recent performance in Westminster. And which particular aspects of that, you know, is it frustration at all the turmoil, all the Conservative drama or were you picking up a sense of anger about the fact that things are hard for a lot of people right now you know was it the political soap opera or the practicalities of life right now um, I, in truth residents aren't normally that specific on the doorstep uh, or rarely anyway um, the general angst was that they, they don't think um, things have been going well in the last 12 months and they haven't seen a significant improvement in the last four or five months and therefore they in many ways just simply said to us we're gonna this is a protest vote but rishi sunak then has not been able to make a difference with that they're not impressed with him uh, no i didn't say that i said that some residents had said that they weren't impressed um with the performance of late i think personally i think uh the prime minister has steadied the ship um but he's only had a few months to really make it make an impact or a difference and the, the turmoil we're in takes more. It's, it's a big tanker to turn around and you can't do it that quickly. But uh, I think the, there are seeds of growth that we're going in the right direction. Unfortunately, the residents didn't see those seeds. Why didn't they see that? Um, we tried to speak to them on the doorstep. Um, in truth, uh, we tried to keep the uh, discussions about local politics because that's what we are, local politicians. And, you know, we don't influence what goes on in the National Health Service or, uh, well, foreign office or anything like that. But um, residents just kept going back to national issues. And what do you think it could mean then for the important Westminster seat there in that part of the country? And there's a local curiosity that the MP there is standing down with your what you've picked up from people in the town in this election. Do you think there will be consequences for the Conservatives in the general election there? Do you think you risk losing that seat? Um, the Worcester city, city seat has never been a safe seat. It's always been relatively marginal anyway, so it's always at risk. Um, whoever the next candidate will be knows they've got a really tough job on their hands. Thank you very much indeed, Chris Mitchell, the former Conservative leader of Worcester Council. And thank you for giving us your thoughts there. Now, Richard, as you were listening to Chris, um, you kind of you didn't quite have your head in your hands, but you were looking pretty glum. He said there was general angst. And crucially, he said residents he spoke to have not seen any improvement since Rishi Sunak has been in charge. I think he was, uh, I think when he went into that in a little bit more depth, I think he was reflecting on the fact that uh, all we've seen is a turbulent 12 months and that uh, we've only seen a few months of things being uh, starting to be turned around. And I think I generally uh, agree with him on that point, and I can understand where some of his residents come from. Uh, Hang on, I, he said they haven't seen any improvement. That's what he said. He I, said I, there I was general it, angst, but they haven't seen any improvement. I, I think you could tell from exactly what he was saying, um, uh, that what he was saying is over the last year or so, there's been, it's been tough times in Westminster, and that's basically reflected on the local level. And while things started to stabilise, it's not seeing the, not seeing the improvement that they'd like to have seen so far, and to the extent that they would like to. But if we uh, look at the, the but if we but if we look at the projection of what tonight's results, if they carry on on current trend, would mean it would put the Conservatives on twenty five percent. Now that's five percent worse than last year when Boris Johnson was still in charge. Things were already turbulent then, and he was in it had 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 a very turbulent time for all sorts of different reasons. But if after, you know, seven months of Rishi Sunak in charge, you end up with what's probably or could be on course to be the worst local election performance for the Tories in recent memory, how will people like Mr Mitchell have any confidence 
that you'll be able to turn it around before a general election? Well, let's have a look at some of the results that have come through, actually. You know, you look over into uh, Essex, which has been a, quite a mixed picture, and we've seen a lot of results there, so you can actually look at some compare and contrast now. Uh, Basildon, uh, Tories gaining, uh, whereas in 2019, uh, gaining seats o against Labour, whereas in 2019, uh, there was no overall control with Labour running the council. Uh, Harlow, an another absolutely crucial seat if Labour were to form a government. Tories gaining seats. But there. I'm asking you about the overall picture well, that I, I our think, viewers can <clears throat> see yeah, that, and that John Curtis has identified as developing. So the question is, if you end up with 25% of the share of the vote, if the whole country were voting, that would be one of the worst local election performances for the Conservatives in recent memory seven months after Rishi Sunak came in as the person to turn it round. And if you're on 25%, how can you look people in the eye and say, yeah, I know it's been tough, but we are turning it round. When you're on 25%. Well, you need to look at the areas. And you know, this is what Bridget was saying just before uh, when she was on the panel with me, saying look at the areas and look to the uh, areas where Labour are, are targeting and need to gain. And that, that's exactly what I'm trying to uh, uh, do now and point to some of those councils I've just been Well, you're trying to avoid my question about what 25% would mean if that was your share of the vote. Well, if you don't how, look, at, honestly, if you don't how, look at the individual areas, then, then, then it's sort of meaningless, isn't it? You know, if you don't look at, you know, Basildon, if you don't look at what's happening in Peterborough as well, where I've just seen that uh, one of my uh, Conservatives again, the council seat there off Labour. You know, that, those are marginal seats which need to be won by Labour in a general election scenario. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, but they need the, to the be Greens, held the by your party. And it, it, well, indeed, and, and and that's exactly what's happened in Harlow and in Basildon. Uh, and uh, you know, if the Greens vote share notionally goes up uh, several percent, then uh, you know, what, what what impact does that on the general election? Well, it's uh, we shall we shall have to see. But I don't think we're going to see uh, the sort of uh, national vote share or swings like we've just seen in uh, in Worcester in the uh, general election. But, but minister. If you end up with 25% as a share of the vote, if you have lost a thousand councillors, which you are on course to lose, how can you look, Chris Mitchell, who's just lost his seat in Worcester, how can you look him in the eye and say, oh, you know what, we got this, but she soon really is the man to turn it round, when the performance is worse than it was under Boris Johnson? <coughs> well, well that's, this is going to be council by council. Right? Some areas are doing better than others. Uh, but this some is areas the overall picture. But you're, you're cherry picking. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look at the seats which you need to win to win a general election. Um, if, you know, the fact that in Worcester you know, the numbers aren't as good as in other areas, um, you're absolutely right. That would be uh, ch uh, cherry picking. But the, the truth is that the seats that we need to win in a general election right across the country, you're just not seeing those Labour gains that they would need to do in order to form a government at the next general election this stage. Just picking up on that, Richard, just Labour sources claiming on the basis of the results that they've seen so far that they reckon they could have won the constituencies of Hartlepool, Stevenage, Dudley South, Ipswich, West Bromwich East, Great Grimsby and Aldershot. Aldershot's been held by the consensus for, for years and years. Um, obviously, we await you know, results properly trickling through. What, what could this mean if, if, if we see these results continuing in, in the way that they appear to be at the moment? What would this mean for... For the government's direction, for the Conservatives' well, direction, seeing, do, you, do you change tack at all, or, or do you just carry on regardless? I think you're seeing different results in different parts of the country. I think that obviously people have had a tough time with, um, and you know, I've said that at the start of the programme, with uh, living costs, energy bills. Uh, you know, governments had to put a huge package in there, but people are still feeling it. You know, I feel it when I do uh, my weekly shop as much as uh, you know, and uh, other people will feel it e even more actually. You know, particularly if they're on uh, tight budgets. Um, so that you know, people are feeling uh, it right across the country. But what I would say is that you're going to have to look in different areas. And if Labour are going to win the next election, mm -hmm. they're going to have to take some of those uh, towns in Essex. They're going to have to take seats like Peterborough as well. Uh, and you know, and if you look a bit great at uh, North East Lincolnshire, Conservatives held that council um, you know, if, um, vital for us to hold a Great Grimsby in a general election scenario as well. So there's, uh, you know, there, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Sure, I just wonder, does anything change, though? Because mm. if voters have sent a message to the Conservatives tonight, it appears that they have, let's mm. see the results at the end, of, the end of Friday, how does the government at Westminster respond to that? Does mm. it change tack or does it just carry on regardless? No, I think, I think you make an important point there, Chris. I think what we've seen as Prime Minister a couple of months ago set out his five key priorities. I think what people want to see 
is them delivering on them. That's getting inflation hard by the end of the year. It started to move in the right direction, but it's a long way to go. Get growth going. You know, it's not as it's not the recession that uh, people predicted, but it's not where we want to be. Um, getting hospital waiting lists down. We saw that huge rise during the pandemic. There's a lot of work to do there. And we've started to make some progress with um, helping uh, with doctors' pensions and things like that. And stopping the boats. Again, that legislation is going through Parliament at the moment. We're going to have to deliver on those things for people to trust the Conservatives uh, for the next general election and to start believing us. Um, and uh, Rishi's set out those priorities. I think we're moving in the right direction on that. And that's when he'll get a, a say. Uh, and between him, and people will also start to look at uh, the difference between him and Keir in a general election, mm -hmm. rather than on some of those more local factors that you'll get in local elections okay. too. Richard Holden, thank you so much for being with us. You know, it's a busy night. We have to now no, let you, you go. Laura. You've put in a long shift. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Jonathan and Baroness Kramer, we will talk to you very shortly. Now, as Richard was saying there, and his... Um, defending Rishi Sunak's uh, record and ambition, but underlining there are lots of local factors here. Of course there are. It should also be remembered. It is still quite early in the night. Uh, well, not early in the night, actually, but it is early in the overall stream of results because there's plenty of results that will be coming through tomorrow as well. So a lot could change. That projected national share at this point is very much a projected national share. What John Curtis's numbers are suggesting at the moment is roughly 25%. That would be one of the worst Conservative local election performances. But the numbers are still being sketched out. They are not firmly in black and white. So just a reminder for everybody there. Another reminder that these elections are not happening everywhere. They're not happening in Scotland. They're not happening in Northern Ireland for another couple of weeks. They're not happening in Wales. And there are no elections for in London, for example. So a couple of the very important caveats we have to bear in mind while still delving under the bonnet to try to work out what these numbers can tell us because they can give us and politicians and you most importantly the members of the public a good flavor of where politics is right now a year or maybe a little more of than a year away from the next general election Rita give us some of that delving into the detail <laughs> I feel like a car mechanic here Laura <laughs> um, you were talking to the minister about Worcester a little bit earlier we have the result it was hung before and it remains hung but a lot has changed behind the scenes uh, because the Greens are now in second place. Labour is the largest party, but the Greens have overtaken the Conservatives in second place. And if we have a look at what's happened to the seats, the Conservatives lost every single seat that they had up for election uh, this evening. Uh, and Labour gained one, Greens gained four, and the Lib Dems gained two. And we can see the change in the share of the vote, always so fascinating. Conservatives plummeting, losing 11%. Greens, the main beneficiaries, but so are the Lib Dems and Labour. So uh, that's, that's the situation in Worcester. I also want to show you Plymouth, where they are still counting. We don't yet have an overall result, but still really interesting to see uh, Plymouth down there in Devon, of course. So this is a council that has been hung since 2021. It was Labour uh, before that. And with nine seats still to declare, Labour's on 24, the Conservatives on 17. And uh, the winning post is 29 seats. Let's have a look and see, because this is a top target for Labour. Uh, they were taking an aggressive fight to the Conservatives. And look here, they've picked up three seats. The Conservatives have lost five and Independents have gained two. Let's see if we can look at the change in the share. Conservatives again down 12 percentage points and it's Labour and the Greens who have benefited. So although we don't yet know the result here, it is looking bright for Labour. We will, of course, bring it to you as soon as we have it. Laura. Rita, thank you very much indeed. And it's just a reminder there that it's those often it's those changes that don't necessarily result in a change of council, but those changes still tell us a lot. All these individual jigsaw pieces emerging to build the picture. Let's look at the pieces totted up so far. Look at our big tally of the results so far. We have Labour there gaining 44 seats at 289. The Conservatives losing 67. The Liberal Democrats gaining 18. Oh, and they've just hit the century. There we are. The Lib Dems have got 100 seats so far tonight. Interestingly, underneath the Greens gaining 10 
and the Residents Association, a wonderful factor in local elections. Resident associations around the country stand in elections, and in some parts of the country they do rather well, but gaining one seat so far tonight. Right, let's go to one of the really exciting races we've been talking about already in Staffordshire. Stoke-on-Trent. Let's go back to Lizzie Glinka. Now, we were talking, Lizzie, Chris had some intelligence suggesting Labour feeling really chipper about what might happen there. What's your latest? Well, I would say that the Labour supporters in the room have definitely got a spring in their step now. Uh, six games for Labour so far. And interestingly, four of those have come from the Conservatives, but two of them have come from the independents. And I think that is significant because we were saying that actually it might be difficult for Labour to uh, take this council, to actually get control of the council because of the success of the independents. But they have taken two seats from the independents as well, which the Labour people here think is a really good sign. And they are certainly uh, much more confident. If we had nervous faces at the beginning of the evening, we, we now are definitely seeing confidence amongst the Labour supporters and, uh, I mean, increasing numbers of Conservatives actually leaving uh, the hall. The leader of the uh, Labour, the leader of the Conservative group, formerly the leader of the council, we think has actually already left the count. So that perhaps gives you a bit of a sense about how the Conservatives are feeling Ladies this evening. I think we're just about to have another declaration the behind me. You can see, Finley. so I'll, I'll keep on going, Thursday, but you can keep an eye on that behind me. Um, so right now, looking good for the, for the Labour Party here, and actually in other parts of the Midlands, other parts of the Staffordshire, it's also looking good for the Labour Lizzie, just while that declaration happens, because we can't really hear you, let's just have a look at the councils around that region in the West Midlands, so we can have see some pictures maybe of that declaration. It's not a traditional general election declaration with cheers and count bin face and all the screaming lord such characters it's a bit uh, drier than that on a council elections but while that's taking place with very good signs for labor from stoke just around the west midlands labor have gained 16 councillors the tories have lost 17 so that's interesting almost a straight swap so far in the numbers of course the more individual races are more complicated than that but look there another ward taken for the Labour Party there in Stoke I think I can see Ruth Smith and Gareth Snell the two former Labour mm. MPs uh, in if my eye seat says yes it is yes Ruth Smith they're giving the victorious council can, new councillor there a hug and Gareth Snell they were two Labour MPs in Stoke both of whom lost their seats last time round all these individual stories that make up our politics and you see these faces years later. Um, Lizzie should be able to hear us now again and Lizzie more importantly we can hear you. So Labour looked really happy, we saw big smiles on the faces but happy that they might actually take the council because if the local Tory leader's gone he wouldn't have done that unless he thought he'd lost. Or would yeah, you? I mean, it is still early days, but that is definitely the mood music on the ground. And you mentioned Ruth Smith, the former Labour MP uh, for North, for North Stoke-on-Trent North. She lost her seat, of course, in 2019. Ruth has uh, been bouncing around this sports hall this evening. She's absolutely thrilled to bits. And I think, I don't know if you remember those pictures of uh, Ruth back in uh, 2019, but I think this might be a slightly cathartic moment for her and many Labour members here in Stoke-on-Trent. We started to mention some of the other parts of, of this region, other parts of Staffordshire. Uh, Tamworth, really interesting, that's gone from Conservative control, held uh, by the Conservatives since 2004. That's gone to no overall control. And that's that's an interesting one because, you know, of course, that is the, the parliamentary seat of Chris Pincher, another former Conservative MP. He lost the, part, he lost the whip, lost his job as Deputy Chief Whip last year uh, following a scandal at a London uh, members club and of course that precipitated the fall of the Prime Minister Boris Johnson so that potentially a bit uh, ha has had an impact in Tamworth because that actually caused a split within the local Conservative Party in Tamworth about six local Conservative councillors split away from the party so interesting seeing that having an impact and again in Worcester and other parts of the region we are seeing Labour making gains if not taking councils then then making gains and that's something that certainly the people here are feeling is is, is very positive.
Okay, Lizzie, thank you so much. Do keep us posted because that's a really, really interesting and exciting race happening there in Stoke. And we've been hearing from Chris about why that kind of part of the country matters so much, not just, of course, importantly, to the people who live in that part of the world. But let's just for a quick moment ponder what we've seen so far might mean for the way that politics sort of evolves. We can talk to Seb Payne, very well connected in Conservative circles, now the uh, director of Onward, a centre-right think tank, who I think had Rishi Sunak at their mm. bash last night in Westminster, and Chris Lloyd, who's the chief feature writer for the Northern Echo. And the Northern Echo is these days a paper that the Conservative Party cares about a lot because they really see parts of the north Eng of England as territory they want to keep hold of, much of which they took control of for the first time in 2019. Um, I suppose the question to both of you really is, are you surprised by what you're seeing so far and what might it change? Chris? Um, I am not surprised what I am seeing so far. Uh, up in the northeast, um, we seem to have uh, various things going through the electoral digestive tract at the moment. Um, we've got <laughs> Brexit coming through. Uh, Brexit. So in 2019, um, in my neck of the woods, in the Tees Valley, Labour did catastrophically. It lost control of four out of the five councils, including Hartlepool, that you've been talking about. Uh, and Brexit was a big part of that. Jeremy Corbyn was a big part of that. This area seems to have sniffed him out quite early doors. And so now we're seeing that working through the uh, digestive tract. Um, we're also seeing, I think, the kind of allure of Boris Johnson uh, disappearing from our politics up here in the Northeast, because after that 2019 uh, council results, um, he really pushed um, the seats uh, in the parliamentary term so that Richard Holden, who he had on, he could win his seat for the first time in 100 years for the Tories. But now that miss Mystical, magical allure of Mr. Johnson has disappeared and does Rishi cut it in the same way. And um, now we're also getting a, a, a referendum up here, I think, on levelling up as well. And so there are going to be some really interesting results, particularly tomorrow from my area. Mm. Darlington is going to be as key as any of the Stoke councils that you're looking at, um, because that's had a real boost of levelling up money. It's almost the de facto capital of Britain now, with the Treasury up here and Rishi Sunak working uh, uh, from Darlow, uh, uh, but Labour really should be taking that uh, council back because they lost it in 2019 for the first time in 22 years. And a fine place Darlow is too, which I think is where Rishi Sunak peered over the edge into that giant pothole, into, trying very pothole. much to look interested in what was happening in the tarmac. But he had the local MP, Peter Gibson, along with him because it's a very important part of the yes. country for the Tories, not least because he's over in the Richmond constituency, North Yorkshire, very different demographic, but not certainly not a million miles away. Um, but Seb Payne, I think the question will be, uh, will Rishi Sunak shift anything as a result of these outcomes, if indeed the, you know, the shares are going to be hovering around the 25% uh, stage? Well, as you've just been hearing, Laura, there's an awful lot of expectations management that have been going on, not just tonight and this morning, but for weeks and months about these elections. And I just think the most interesting thing is how things are being sliced and diced between Labour and the Liberal Democrats here, that at this early stage in the results, it's not clear there's like big momentum, particularly behind Labour at the moment. And that's something that I think many Conservatives will try and seize on. But I think that element we've just heard there about the importance of levelling up, I think Thing. One thing that we think are onward is that levelling up is absolutely key to the next general election, but also key in this kind of post-Brexit realignment we've seen because after 2016 referendum, you've seen the kind of traditional voting tribes moving different directions in the country. And for example, the Conservatives holding on to Dudley, I think that's an example of this kind of realignment still happening. And obviously, you can't get away from the national picture and that turbulence on the national scene is still going to overwhelm some of those different trends that have been moving around there. But I think so far, it does sort of strike that that realignment is still holding. And I think the strategy of just trying to keep on delivering trying to get things done, but trying to also look for that grander message. That's going to have to be the key focus at the moment, because as Chris was just saying, the last time you had to look at some of these elections and you were looking where things were with Boris Johnson last year, there was that big optimistic national drive. We're in a different era now. The economy's in a different era. There still needs to be a bit more of that vision behind this to say to people, look, yes, maybe the Sunak government is doing well on trying to fix potholes and trying to get things 
performance better on a national stage, but you've still got to give people a nice big jolt of enthusiasm. And I think that's where a lot of the pressure will come after these results. Thank you very much indeed, Seb and Chris, a Gateshead boy and uh, a Northern Echo writer. Great to hear from you both on the programme. Be interesting to hear in Conservative circles whether that push to give people something more that Seb Payne was suggesting there does become part of the conversation in the coming days. In a couple of minutes, we will hear from Susan Kramer for the Lib Dems and Jonathan Ashworth, both waiting patiently here at the mega desk in the election. Uh, our tally, just before we take you to the news so far, Labour gaining seats there on 45. They've bust the 300 mark now on 314. The Conservatives losing 69. The Liberal Democrats on 100, gaining 18. Lots more to come here on election 2023. But let's take you to check in with the news with Bloodsby. Laura, thank you. Here's your BBC News summary. Counting is underway in the local elections in England in one of the last major tests of public opinion before next year's general election. Voters have been deciding who will run services at 230 local councils, with around 8,000 seats up for grabs. Mayoral elections have also been taking place in Bedford, Leicester, Mansfield and Middlesbrough. Our political correspondent Jonathan Blake has more. Celebration in Stoke-on-Trent. Just one councillor of thousands finding out their fate. Counting has begun in more than 200 towns, cities and rural areas across England where voters have had their say on who should run local services. The Tories are braced for a tough night, hoping only to limit their losses. And among a handful of very early results, they lost control of Brentwood in Essex with the Liberal Democrats picking up seats, hoping to make gains elsewhere too, at the Conservatives' expense. Fantastic result for the Liberal Democrats in one of the safest Tory seats in the country. Uh, we've gained three seats, um, we're now up to 17 seats, and uh, the council moves into an overall control, and uh, it's a time of change in Brentwood, and we're really delighted, it's fantastic news. Labour are looking for a strong showing to prove their lead in the opinion polls can bring winning results. Tamworth in the West Midlands, among the places Labour has so far made gains, also taking council seats from the Tories. In a first for elections in England, photo ID was required at polling stations, which left some unable to vote, but it's too soon to say what impact the change has had. Only around a quarter of the councils holding elections are counting votes overnight, so early results won't give anything like the full picture. But in the hours ahead, these local elections will be closely watched as a crucial test of the national political picture. Jonathan Blake, BBC News. And of course, all the local results will be available online. To see who won in your local area, you can use our postcode checker, which is available on the BBC News website and on our app. Well, we'll be back in an hour with the latest news updates. But for now, it's back to our special election night coverage with Laura. And just a reminder, to see who won in your local area, you can use our postcode checker, which is available on the BBC News website and on the app. A uh, warm welcome back to the Election 2023 studio where we are watching as results come in from 8,000 individual council seat races around the country, 230 councils up for grabs in England. Let's take a look at the numbers so far. The Conservatives have been losing support, losing 69 seats so far. Labour up by 45. The Liberal Democrats also up by 18. And that gives you a bit of a hint of the overall picture, which based on where these seats are changing hands, at this stage, it does look like a pretty grim night for the Conservatives, potentially losing 1,000 seats or more. We can see the scene there in Plymouth, where Labour has been doing well. Stoke and Trent, we can show you images from there. We've just been hearing from our reporter there. Labour are very hopeful of making gains. The Conservative leaders apparently left the building, which normally suggests in political terms that something's gone badly wrong. And then we can show you also the scene in Leicestershire where counting is underway. And Bolton too, which has been very keenly fought 
by the political parties. You can see some smiling Labour faces there. But to underline at the moment the sort of sketch of where things are going is something, a difficult, difficult night for the Conservatives with heavy losses. A step forward, but we're not sure about whether or not a very significant stride forward for the Labour Party. So on the current trends, it looks like a, a significant moment for the Labour Party, but maybe not that really decisive thing that they wanted to see. But the Liberal Democrats doing well. It's Ten past three in the morning. So there's enough for us to be talking about those general trends. But reminder, not enough to be reaching final conclusions on this. But let's talk to our guests. Jonathan Ashworth has been waiting patiently for the Labour Party, Baroness Kramer for the Liberal Democrats, and we're also now joined by um, Nikki Aitken, the Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party. Nikki, firstly to you, if you end up losing a thousand seats, as it seems that you are very likely to do, why? Well, 13 years into power, um, I was a, a local councillor for 16 years at Westminster, and I can tell you in 2006 and 2010, um, I had no issues with getting elected under a Labour government. And in 2014, it was the first time that I was told people weren't voting for me because they didn't like the government. So I think, you know, you see that often in local elections. People uh, can swap because they don't like what's going on nationally. So and people I think, aren't voting for Conservative councillors because they don't like the government. Well, I think that's a, that's a trend that can happen, whether it's in the, when Labour in power or in the Conservative Party in power. I think what's important is that... Uh, what happens overnight and into tomorrow morning, we do expect uh, that the independent analysis is that we will lose a thousand seats. We are, you know, we're not, I mean, we're not, we're not uh, thinking that it's going to be a great night for us, of course. But, you know, sadly, there will be some amazing councillors who have worked very hard over the last four years who will lose their seats. And, I, you know, I, I pay tribute to them. At the beginning of the programme, though, and in the last few days, when lots of different experts, including John Curtis, and lots of Conservative politicians have said privately that actually a thousand losses, well, that's really at the worst end of expectation. Are you now, as a deputy chair of the party, saying that's what you do expect from what you've seen tonight? Well, what we've said from, from the start is from the analysis that independent independents like uh, John Curtis has said, we are expecting around about a thousand. Well, he, he didn't say that was a different expert, but I suppose my question is now, from what you've seen tonight, from actual results, from what the trends that are developing suggest, are you now officially as a party expecting, saying, are you saying to us, you're going to lose a thousand seats? Well, I'm, I'm not going to predict actually, Laura, because you can't, because we don't know what's going to happen overnight and more and more seats will be declared tomorrow. Um, but we're under no illusion that it's going to be a tough night and understandably after 13 years, uh, it, it, no, no, no government after 13 years, we saw it under uh, the Labour last administration losing, Labour, Labour, uh, Labour councillors losing in, in their hundreds, if not thousands. So it's, it's part of the, sadly, part of the political roller coaster. Well, we've all been on the political roller coaster plenty in the last few years, haven't we? Um, Jonathan Ashworth, mm. I mean, the Conservatives seem to be losing a lot, on course to lose a lot. But the story so far is of Tory slump. It's not necessarily of Labour's making huge strides, the kind of strides that you need to make if you're to get to number 10? Well, it's obviously uh, early days in the election count, even though it's late at night. Um, but it does look promising so far for Labour. But I do agree with Nikki. I think people out there are expressing a verdict on 13 years of Tory government. And it's 13 years of Tory economic failure, with a, giving us a collapse in living standards, high taxes, and people can't get a GP appointment. But the key thing for Labour is, where are we winning? And I've just heard that we've won a seat in Bolton North East. That's a key marginal constituency at the next election. Very, uh, very good results so far in Stoke, which, as you know, we have to win at the next general election. Gains in Hartlepool. We would have won the Hartlepool constituency if this was general election night. And remarkable uh, gains across the Midlands in the seats which are the traditional marginals. Tamworth. Redditch, Redditch, Ashby de la Zouche in uh, uh, North West Leicestershire. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think we would have won one of the Dudley seats tonight. Uh, Hales Owen and Rowley Regis would have fallen to Labour in a general election tonight. These are the seats that will decide the next general election, not just the, the red wall and all that. We are making gains in the urban seats, including the urban south like Aldershot. 
That's never been a Labour constituency. We would have won that seat tonight. You mentioned, though, there are two parts of the country where there have been strong local factors. You mentioned Tamworth and Tamworth and North West Leicestershire, where they've both had MPs where there's been controversy around them. There have been local factors on the ground. And you know, we all know there are important local factors always at play here. But, you know, our data suggests that since last year, there hasn't been any progress in your overall vote share. And you know that that matters as well as the individual seats that you've just talked about. Well, let's see where we get to in terms of overall vote share. But so but we far, are have winning... you seen the kind of overall suggestion well, of vote that you would like to see that would make you feel, ah, comfortable, we're on our way? But we are winning in the seats that decide general elections, like Dudley, Hales Owen, West Brom, Grimsby, Ipswich, Stevenage. These would return Labour MPs, Labour gains off the Conservatives if this was a general election night. And they are the seats that will decide the country in the next general but election. General, but it's not a general election, Laura. And I think... No, it's be, not. But it's about parties making it'll progress, be, isn't it? it? It will be interesting to see, after all the uh, votes are counted, actually what happened with the share of vote. I think, um, you know, Westminster, my council, we lost last year, not because uh, Labour were taking our votes, because our vote stayed at home to send a clear message. So you're going to get a good share of the, the vote? Is it going to be up? Look, who knows what's going to happen, okay. uh, Jonathan. But what I'm saying is, I'd, from what I've been hearing on the doorsteps, and I've been knocking on a lot of doors, I've been making lots of calls, and the vote is not switching to you or the Lib Dems. Our vote is either they're coming out to vote for us or they're staying at home. Susan. Well, it must be switching because we're winning in places <laughs> all point, over the place. No, because they're staying Just at home. Just one in Southport, one in a seat in Southport, so there must be switches. Well, maybe they're voting um, tactically. Who knows? Well, we don't yet have accurate figures on turnout because we're, you know, 3.16 in the morning. But there were early suggestions that it might be slightly down, but we can't give an accurate picture of that at this stage. Um, Baroness Kramer... Nikki Aiken just suggested that voters are not coming to the Lib Dems, it's just that Tories are staying at home. Well, I mean, remember, we had three parliamentary by-elections, the largest swings from the Conservatives to Liberal Democrat that are on record, basically, in, in at least two of, of, of those seats, huge swings. But, uh, and um, I think, uh, uh, I understand why Nikki makes that claim, but I don't think it's a valid one. I think we are genuinely seeing switches. It's harder to tell because of the lower turnout that you get in local elections. Um, I mean, we'll know more when the blue wall seats start to come in. That, so that won't be until later today or um, perhaps even not until tomorrow with some of them. I'm hearing some very good news, for example, from Windsor. Whereas I understand the Conservative leader that uh, looks on track to lose uh, a, a seat. Um, what about decorum? So now Ed Davey and his tractor, we've already talked about the tractor. We don't need to talk about the tractor again, Chris, do we? But um, he launched his campaign in decorum. Now, that is a Hertfordshire seat, commuter belt. Exactly. Lots of young families there, people who can't afford necessarily to live in London, but moving there. Um, have you got any information about that? I don't have any tonight? update on decorum, uh, uh, but I mean, it's an area where we've worked, where we certainly have had some very good feedback when we've been out there on the doorstep. Uh, it, it would be pretty uh, striking that uh, if we were to take decorum. Uh, and I think, you know, have some serious consequences because of the change in the boundaries on the parliamentary seats. There. Ed Davies certainly looked like he's enjoying this campaign. I mean, he's, you know, done the tractor, he's done the pulling pints. He's certainly tried very hard, I think, visibly to be very present and to try to grab attention in a way that has been hard for the Lib Dems in the last few years. Well, I mean, remember that Ed loves campaigning and he's a great communicator. I mean, he's somebody who's always in conversation, always on the doorsteps, and he really does connect with people. But I think I have to say, I think the party's in that kind of heart as well. I mean, when I look at why we're beginning to do so much better now, I look at a lot of the local parties, the level of activists and the level of activism within the local parties has gone up very very significantly. It's a lot of new blood. It's people coming in with some real enthusiasm. And that in the end is infectious and it makes a difference. And it's people now in this local election campaigning in their own community. I think that there are a lot of local issues actually that are in play. It's just that they're melding with national issues into a general sense of conservative incompetence on pretty much every front whether it's local or whether it's national. And that's beginning to have a real impact, I think, on the way that people are making their voting decisions. Just to chip in, Laura, with a little bit of intelligence and number crunching from John Curtis and his team, mm -hmm. just picking up on the conversation that we've just been happen uh, having. Uh, this is where 
uh, Sir John is looking at these key wards that the BBC keeps an eye on and therefore can compare results coming in tonight with previous elections in those exact same wards at previous rounds of elections. Some comparisons here with 2012, rather wholesome comparison going back over a, a decade, suggesting in this small clutch of key wards and councils that have been looked at that Labour's share of the overall vote is down by six points compared to 2012. So just a straw in the wind that suggests that on share of the vote at least, Labour may be well short of where Ed Miliband was 11 years ago. And we, of course we know what happened to Ed Miliband come the general election, which was what, three years, three years later. Jonathan, what do you say to that? Well, it's obviously early days in the, in the, election, in the election counting, but I would return to the point is that we need to focus on where we'll decide the next general election. And in the areas that will decide the next general election, the results so far are promising. In places like Plymouth, in Ipswich, in Stevenage, in Grimsby, in West Bromwich, in Dudley, in Hales Owen, in Aldershot, could be a new target for Labour at the next general election, we're making significant progress. So we're not just winning in the so-called Red Wall, we're winning in the traditional marginals of the Midlands and the urban south. The suggestion, though, is that for John Jonathan Ashworth, that our viewers know this, it's a hugely disgusting thing um, in the country when it comes to Keir Starmer and where Labour is at now. Given the scale of the Conservative majority in 2019, you don't just have to win in the seats that you can list on 10 of your fingers. You have to well, win. List on <laughs> in, <laughs> oh no, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have said that. We'll be here all night. Fingers. We know you've been in I'm politics I'm for a I've long been time. Up a long time but you know <laughs> we, what I mean. we, we could all places. list constituencies. But the point is, you have to do something sort of Herculean. Not just saying, oh, well, here and here we've made some significant, we know, made some significant gains. And I suppose the question that I hear often from your colleagues privately and also from some on the left of your party publicly often is that Keir Starmer, for all that he has got the party on a steady keel, he's made lots of changes. But people say when they've been on the doorstep, lots of your colleagues say to me, I'm sure they say to Chris too, there's no surge in enthusiasm for him. He's not the kind of leader who could really get people motivated and get people out there in the way that would allow you to, you know, scale the Himalayas to get to that swing I that mean, would get I, you into number 10. I, I, I disagree with you. I mean, there is no question that the well, Labour Party... That's not me saying that. Your colleagues say uh, that privately. Uh, uh, Plenty well, I of them I disagree do. with my colleagues. There's no question the Labour Party has a mountain to climb at the next general election. We did get a complete shellacking <laughs> in the last general election. I'm, I'm not going to deny... That. And can you but, see the summit then on the basis of what we've seen uh, so far tonight? Uh, uh, yes, because we are making progress in significant areas. We are not just picking up the so-called red wall, which we all, everyone obsesses about in Westminster, you know, where we're making progress tonight in Hartlepool and Stoke. We've made seven gains in Tamworth. I remember the Tamworth by-election before 1997 when we took it off the Tories. That's how much of a political geek I am. I've been around so long. You know, <laughs> Reddish, that was Jackie Smith's seat, a 2010 gain. Uh, Ashby in North West Leicestershire, a 2010 gain. These are key marginals across the swathe of the Midlands that we are picking up seats in tonight. So, look, it's early days. You know, there's a long way to go until about 6 p.m. tomorrow when we'll get most of the, well, nearly all the results will be in. But so far, this is looking promising, and I do think it is a wholesale rejection of 13 years of economic failure under the Conservatives. Okay, you three, thank you for now. Stick with us um, because we're going to look in some more detail at some of those kinds of seats, exactly the ones that Jonathan Ashworth has just been talking about. Rita. Laura, yes indeed. Let's take a look at a couple of the councils where the Conservatives have held on, but we've detected differences in the way in which uh, the Labour Party is picking up support. So here you can see the Conservatives on 39% in Basildon and Labour on 29%. And the Conservatives, in fact, picked up a seat here tonight. Uh, Labour has improved on its performance uh, from last year and the year before, but it's still quite some way behind the Conservatives, 10 percentage points. So still some way to go in an area where they would really need to be competitive in order to be saying that they are going to be back in power nationally. But I want to compare Basildon to Redditch uh, in the West Midlands, also a Conservative hold, as I said. But look at the difference in the graph here. Uh, Labour 
has a higher share of the vote than the Conservatives. Labour on 44% here and the Conservatives on 39%. Now, you might be asking yourselves, well, how is it that that's still a Conservative council? And this is because the, uh, the seats are only up in thirds. So it's only a third of the council seats that are being um, voted on, that have been voted on. So it is quite difficult, actually, for the council to change hands. But if you compare Labour's performance tonight in Redditch with what they did in 2019... You can see the red splodge just down there. Well, I can tell you there are 16 percentage points between their performance four years ago and now. So that is the direction of travel that the Labour Party would want to see. Laura. Rita, thank you very much indeed. Well, a couple of things to bring you just in the last couple of minutes. Uh, someone in the Lib Dems has told me they're confident that they have taken control of Windsor and Maidenhead where Theresa May's constituency is, as well, of course, Windsor Castle. Very timely to be talking about things that happen in Windsor at the moment with the coronation upcoming. But the Lib Dems are confident that they have taken control of Windsor and Maidenhead. We don't have official figures or confirmation on that yet, but that would be something they would be very gleeful about. It's been Conservative since 2007, and the Lib Dems did hold it in 2003, but that would be an achievement for them that they would be delighted, I'm sure, to talk about. Let's show you, though, a result that we can confirm. Plymouth, that city in the southwest. And we talked a lot about Plymouth. Um, we've heard from our reporter, Martin Oates, on the ground. And we can say now that Labour has gained Plymouth Council. There are still two seats to declare. They're still counting there. But Labour has 29 so far. The Conservatives have 18 independents and smaller parties oh they've just disappeared i think that was on five but we've gone straight on to the seat change so look at this labor gaining four but the conservatives losing seven now that is another one of those changes those shapes of things that we've seen tory losses being the bigger move than labor gains but that is significant nonetheless and labor will be very pleased to gain plymouth let's look at the vote share Labour on 44%, the Tories way behind on 25%, Independence on 16%, the Greens on 9 and let's look at the all-important change since 2019, the last time these seats were fought in May 2019, Labour up 7 but the Conservatives down 11 Now that result will make Labour very happy. Um, Martin Oates, Chris on the ground earlier, told us it was going to be a wipeout. Mm. Uh, and Labour have gained it and they will be very pleased. Why in a seat like that? For two reasons. One, the margin, as you were looking at, as we were exploring there on the, on the graph, just the scale, going back to my kind of uh, pet word of the night of extent, because mm. it points to an extensive uh, gain as far as Labour is concerned. And then secondly, because of the overlaying of maps that is happening all night at the moment and all day uh, on Friday, where the parties are comparing their performance in local government with key electoral back battlegrounds as far as Westminster constituencies are concerned. And that is absolutely the case there. And so that is why you will hear Labour being pretty excited about it. And that city has right now a Conservative MP, a prominent Conservative MP, the Veterans Minister, Johnny Mercer, and Labour MPs. And that, whether it's Plymouth or there's a similar sort of pattern in Portsmouth, Ipswich also is the same, where you have a kind of split city. Yeah. Um, that's why these council elections will be looked at and make MPs feel nervous on the Conservative benches. Yeah, split cities are highly contested cities, aren't they? Mm. They're places, well, whether it's cities, towns or, or more rural areas, they're the, the most keenly fought over that uh, the parties are so desperate to be seen to be making an impression on, not least because clearly that's their places where they want to make gains come the general election, but they are also places because of that where huge amounts of focus has been, uh, has, be, has been delivered by so many of them to try and ensure they can make those gains. So in other words, it's a test of whether their, their, uh, their whole infrastructure is working. Yeah. Are, they, are they getting good bang for their buck for their investment in campaigning uh, on the ground? So it matters, matters massively. And from the results we see tonight, will be all sorts of decisions taken about where additional effort is put or where, where yeah. effort is switched to on the basis of the sentiments that are picked up. So we can show you some pictures there in Plymouth, um, activists there. You can see smiley, smiley Labour faces out the front. Uh, not much sign of many Conservatives there. 
let's look at Stoke on Trent. Uh, you can see again it's that st that same labour happy crowd we saw hugging mm. each other a bit earlier on. They're still having a good night. Let's look at Bolton. I think that is the local one of the local MPs. Yes, yes it is. It is. That's yeah. Yep. Um, Conservatives chatting. Eh, hard to read what's really going on, but we know that is somewhere where Labour particularly the back very, of the head. Particularly the back of the head. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, we can have a go, Chris. Come on, we can have a go. Any minute now, I'll be showing dogs at polling stations um, rather than looking at the top of people's heads. Um, but then we can take a look at what's happening in Leicestershire. Account there, carrying on. Looks rather looks like they might almost have finished, but there is still some counting going on in the bottom right of the frame. Let's go back to Plymouth. We were just hearing about that critical race there where Labour has gained control of the council in one of those split cities. I'm hoping that we can talk to the minister there, the Conservative MP, Johnny Mercer. We can see him. I'm hoping he can hear us. Uh, minister, thanks very much indeed for joining us. What went wrong? Look, it's been uh, a really terrible night for us here in Plymouth. I think uh, there's a number of factors at play. I think locally it's been very difficult. Uh, the Conservative group here uh, has been through a very difficult time. Uh, we've seen that reflected on the doors in the campaign and we've seen that reflected in the uh, results tonight. But, you know, we take it on the chin and, uh, you know, we, we keep going forward. I think there's uh, really positive stuff happening on a national level and we need to redouble our efforts and make sure that uh, we continue to work hard for people here in Plymouth. Well, thank you for contending there with a huge cheer, which I can't see, but I'm assuming is going up from Labour activists in the room as the gain of the council is actually confirmed. Um, you said there it's been yeah. a really terrible yeah. night in Plymouth. Has it also at this stage been a terrible night from what you've seen for the Conservatives nationally? Oh, look, I don't know about that. I think uh, we were expecting pretty heavy losses. Um, you know, no government at this term in 13 years in has ever had more local councillors uh, to lose. Um, I think it was always going to be difficult. The Prime Minister, you know, said himself yesterday it was going to be difficult. We all know that. Um, so in some ways, you know, uh, some, of that's, uh, some of that's to be expected. But yeah, here in, in Plymouth, it, it has been bad. And, you know, first and foremost, above everything, all constituency MPs be represent the areas we're from, we're proud to represent and in my area tonight it's been a bad night and we need to take it on the chin and uh, come back stronger for next year. But when you as a local MP in a city that's very closely fought see Conservative support dropping by 11% that must make you nervous. Oh look I'm always nervous down here I think uh, that's why I went for a seat down here because this is where I'm from. I'm proud of it. I, I like the fight. I'm up for the fight. It's going to be a fight next year. Um, and I'm happy with that. You know, I think uh, it's, not, it's not a question of self-preservation. It's about getting out there, listening to people and delivering for them. And uh, I think I still believe the Conservatives clearly are the best party to do that nationally and locally. Uh, but we haven't won that argument tonight. That is democracy and we take it on the chin and uh, we'll go again tomorrow. Johnny, our colleague Martin Oates, who's probably loitering somewhere in the same room as you uh, right now, the BBC's political editor in the South West, has, has tweeted saying that a Conservative candidate in Plymouth told him they've been drawing trees on the ballot papers, which makes a change from phallic symbols. Um, spot of humour at 3.33 in the morning. But give us a sense of how, in, in a local sense, how big this whole row over trees in Plymouth has been and how wounding that has been to your party. Yeah, I mean, it's a disaster, isn't it? Um, you know, the whole, the, the, the whole escapade, if you like, you know, <laughs> Labour have kind of benefited from this, right? But they signed off that plan, but the way the Conservative Council did it, particularly at night, you know, I, I obviously would have done it differently. I think uh, four Conservative leaders uh, in two years in the local council group hasn't helped. I think that's a big lesson from tonight is that people don't vote for divided parties. Um, and, you know, we, we have uh, obviously had a, a very challenging 2022 at a national level as well. Uh, we need to learn from that, pull together, pull hard. Uh, we got a good message to get out there, but we need to get out there, uh, win places like Plymouth and win the country in next year's general election. It sounds that you do want Rishi Sunak, therefore, to step things up. Oh, look, I think, uh, I, you know, I've, I've been in and out of government, right? I've been uh, in and out under different prime ministers, OK? Rishi Sunak is a different class. 
Uh, he is a capable, smart, professional, empathetic, um, strong leader and uh, the sort of strong leader this country needs at this time. Uh, and it's down to people like me and others to go out and advocate for him and make sure other people see that and understand that and, and feel that through his policies and our policies as a Conservative team and improve you know, their lives at the moment at a very difficult time and I'm up for the challenge. My colleagues are up for the challenge. You know, if it was easy, uh, everyone would do it, but uh, it's going to be a fight. Um, I'm up for the fight, we're up for the fight. Uh, you know, we'll take tonight on the chin and uh, we'll get on with it. Uh, it's a new day tomorrow uh, and we'll get on with it for next year. But what do you think it's going to take for people in Plymouth to feel the benefit of what you back as Rishi Sunak's plan? Because clearly in Plymouth tonight, people are not feeling it. Clearly, they're feeling the opposite. They're feeling they don't want any more Conservatives in their city. Well, firstly, I think, I think there's, there's really strong local issues down here that we've highlighted already. But secondarily, I think, I think you know, inflation predicted to be at 2.9% by the end of the year is a big deal, right? That is people's mortgages. Uh, that's all sorts of things going on, you know, car loan payments and all sorts of, that really affect people down here in Plymouth. So, uh, you know, people are going to feel the benefit of uh, getting a grip of inflation. People are going to feel a better, uh, uh, the benefit of better public services. You know, we've seen huge improvements in public services down here in the last uh, four to five months after a very difficult post-COVID recovery. So, um, look, I think uh, these things are, uh, are gradual. Uh, we need to keep going. We need to pull together. We need to keep going. That's what we need to do. We don't, you know, need some drastic change, of course. Um, you know, I, I've found a very warm reception for Rishi. Uh, on the doorstep to be honest with you and I've always um, you know called it straight whoever's the Prime Minister at the time I found a very warm reception for him and uh, you know people want him to do the well they want us to do well Keir Starmer they, they don't want to vote for Keir Starmer you know they don't see what he stands for they don't have any idea what he does um, or who he is um, but you know I can understand why they're cross with us we've had a difficult 2022 uh, nationally uh, we need to give people something to vote for. I said that when I was first elected in 2015. We need to go out there, have the argument, have the fight and give people something to vote for. And I'm confident we can do that in the year ahead. OK, Johnny Marser, Veterans Minister and Plymouth MP. Thanks very much indeed for joining us on the programme live from Plymouth. Um, a result, a big result for Labour there, Jonathan Ashworth in Plymouth. Oh, yeah. Very, very pleased with that result. Uh, uh tonight in Plymouth. It's not only that we, we hold one of the parliamentary seats, but it is a marginal seat we hold. And of course, we're targeting the other parliamentary seat in, in Plymouth, uh, uh, Johnny Mercer's seat there. So um, uh, I've not seen how the gains uh, distribute across the whole of, of, of the two constituencies. But taking that council is a very significant result for us tonight. And we're very pleased with that. We well, can see there again, very happy Labour faces in Stoke. There are the former two Stoke MPs who both lost in 2019. One of them in the House of the Lords, Gareth Snell, there with a clipboard handily at a uh, count. Everybody's always got clipboards, but Labour looking very happy about what's happening in Stoke. So maybe we'll check back in with Leslie Glinka in a few minutes to see if there's confirmation of what's happened on the ground there. Um, in terms of with Plymouth, Jonathan Ashworth, I mean, there was a very strong local problem that caused huge problems for the Conservatives. And Johnny Marston then said people didn't do this because they were feeling happy about Keir Starmer. They were just hacked off with the Tories. Well, they've just voted for Keir Starmer's Labour Party. So Nikki. he's obviously wrong on that. Because yeah. if that was the case, Labour wouldn't have made these gains there. Nikki? It didn't help that uh, the council failed 100 trees uh, in March. And, um, you know, look, Plymouth... Corbyn won Plymouth in 2018 when he was, wasn't winning very much. So Plymouth is one of those swing councils. Um, but definitely the trees would have played a massive part in today's election. But it was interesting what Johnny Burse was saying, though. I mean, he made very clear his own personal support for Rishi Zuna. But he said, you know, people aren't feeling it. He said, we want, we're going to have to work hard for people to feel the benefit of what he believes you're doing is the right thing. What is it, do you think, that is not translating into support for you tonight what is it that is translating into such a decline well we've been in power for 13 years and it's always going to be a difficult time for local elections when when a government's been in power that long so but, is that but, is that too but, long then is that no, just not, well, not, not at all but you know what we've been through over the last couple of years with the covid pandemic with the war in ukraine which has had a major effect on energy prices and also you know law of the psychodrama that was been going on in the conservative party has not helped and you know our voters have told me that um but i do think we now have got under vicious sunak and interestingly on the, on the doorsteps people are saying to me 
you know, we're not voting for you this, this time. And I say, well, about the Prime Minister, how do you feel about him? They really rate him. And, you know, it is about his five priorities. It is about halving inflation. It is about growing the economy, reducing the debt, cutting the waiting list and, and stopping the votes. But Those are his five very clear priorities. But, but can you say credibly that voters are won over by Rishi Sunak if, as things stand now, you're on course to one of your worst ever performances? Can you say that credibly? Absolutely, because it is very, very different in the national picture. And we are now on track with Rishi, with, with, as I said, his five top priorities so that the public can benchmark what we are saying by what we deliver. And when will, they, when, when will you then think, well, ah, we can see now that the public is on board because the national opinion polls put you miles behind. Real votes tonight are putting you miles behind. But we are still making gains Look, we, we, uh, in Harlow. Um, the Labour Party are not making the gains they should be making if they're going to take, take, take the uh, general election next year. Look at what happened. They're nowhere near at the moment. And it's an early, early in the, in, in not the process. not that early anymore. It's 20 to well, 4, but it, lots of results it, it, still it to come. It feels very, very late, believe me. <laughs> but, you know, we, they're, not, they're not at the moment making the gains they did in 95 under, under Blair. So let's see. Let's see what I'm happens. I'm calling this as the middle of the night. <laughs> no, neither late nor early. Um, Nikki, are you, are you effectively saying, just reading between the lines of your answers to Laura over the last couple of minutes, that this is Boris Johnson and Liz Truss's fault? I think it's uh, the fact that we didn't have um, a great year last year. I think Johnny uh, said that. 20, 20, yes. 2022 was not a great year um, for the Conservative Party, but we've put that behind us. We've got to look for the future. The, the public deserve um, to, to, to allow the uh, to, to have a government that gets on with the job. And that is what Rishi has done. The, the progress he's made in such a short time with the, uh, the Belfast agreement, with a much better productive, constructive relationship now with the EU and with the French and the agreements he's had with uh, Macron over uh, the uh, small boats. Um, what we're doing on trade. Expect, though, that after, if, if it turns out to be a really rough 24 hours for you, um, would voters just expect you to carry on, carry on regardless? Are they, are they not sending a message that mm. wants some sort of change? I think under Rishi Sunak, and I think if you look at the polls, um, Rishi's out polling Keir Starmer. People do not really believe or understand well, what the Keir is standing for. The measure there is almost Keir Starmer is very often ahead. Occasionally, sometimes Rishi Sunak is a little bit but ahead. Where but it's not from, the case that Rishi Sunak is always ahead of Keir Starmer. But where we come to make from. that clear to viewers, that's not what the numbers say. Well, I think we have made an awful lot of progress under Rishi Sunak over the last six months, and he is. Uh, he's delivering what he has promised so far. As I said, with the Belfast Agreement, with the uh, the trade. Um, agreements we're doing now outside the EU and, and the much more constructive relationship we've now got with our EU partners. OK, Susan, I'm listening to these two going at it hammer and tongs because the Labour versus Tory debate does tend to dominate. But the Lib Dems, do you think if the results trend tonight continues tomorrow, do you think that actually it could translate into a much more, a much, sig much more significant performance at the next general election? I think it could. I mean, you know, the pattern that we saw with those by-elections. But I, I mean, I have to say, you know, looking at my own briefing, if we take Windsor and Maidenhead, mm. that is beyond expectations that we had from the beginning of the evening. You have to understand the Conservatives had twice the number of councillors that we did on Windsor. And they've uh, told me so so it's huge. confident that they've taken That's it. what I understand. That's a, so... Uh, and we'll see when those other seats come in. Look, I mean, we've just had a governor of the Bank of England tell people they need to get used to being poorer. Now, that's what the government has managed to deliver. That's the experience that people actually have on a day to day basis. I, I mean, you know, as Liberal Democrats, we're not going to sit there passively and let that be the future that the country is facing. So we really feel it's important that we get our messages across that, you know, we can actually make movement on the economy, uh, shore it up by getting much closer to Europe in some ways, that uh, uh, we, can, um, we can make those kinds of international differences that give us new opportunity. We can tackle the problems in the health service. I mean, we won North Shropshire because we finally got an MP or candidate, then now MP for North Shropshire, who spoke about the problem with ambulance waiting times. Mm. Nothing was being done to deal with that problem until Helen Morgan got out there and began campaigning and repeating it over and over again in Parliament. I mean, we will campaign on those key issues that are absolutely critical to people's everyday lives. So 
I was just say one of your colleagues just texted me saying just about the overall Lib Dem performance so mm. far. We will exceed the expectations of all the post pollsters. This is a great night for us. I wonder what you put that down to, Lib Dem progress so far. How much it is about policy and issues and where we find ourselves economically and how much it's about organisation? Because I hear from a lot of your colleagues that there's been a, a real shift in the focus of organisation, real geographical concentration on areas where you're competitive, not spreading yourself too thinly. Are we, are we seeing the, 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 the product of that shift in, uh, in uh, strategy or is this, more, is this more about policy? Frankly, I think it's, it's both. Uh, so you have to organise yourself well, and particularly when you're a small party and you don't have the financial resources, close to the financial resources of the other parties. And also you can't get airtime. I mean, somebody had said earlier, the reason why Ed Davey, you know, does dramatic things like get on a tractor is because otherwise the media won't cover him. That, uh, you know, we had huge gains. That's in the last lot of local elections. We won 200 seats more than anybody else. And I bet anybody who was watching the media on that day didn't get that point at all and never even heard it. So we have to make our own climate, if you like. We have to make our own weather. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I think the party is becoming much more effectively organised. But it's also very much this sort of feeding from the grassroots. I talked about the activists who really have the pulse of the communities they live in on both the local issues and the national issues. And I can see that coming through in the sort of detailed kind of fights that we're having that, uh, in Parliament, the issues on which we're standing strong that, uh, um, you know, whether it's everything from, 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 from trying to get some control back over the financial system, uh, so whether it's trying to make sure that we have, that, uh, you know, we don't turn into an authoritarian state with some of the public well, order What bills. could this mean for you Most at a general election, happen. do you think? Could you double the number of seats you've got? I, I, I don't have the, I'm not a sophologist, so, I, you know, I don't have my, my, my finger on the pulse. I suspect also the focus, one of the things we've done is focus on the next step. And the next step has been these local elections, backing up our activists in the places where they are, where we know that we, we're, we're in, able like to get our message out to, to local question. people and then look to see what the response is. Okay. All right. okay, all three of you, thank you very much for now. And Susan, we're glad to have you here in the studio. What looks like it could be a very healthy night indeed for the Liberal Democrats. They've certainly got a lot to cheer about at the moment. So let's look at some of the battleground seats where some decisive results could come in in the next few hours. Rita, what can we expect? Well, Laura, let me just show you uh, where the parties stand at the moment in terms of councillors. Uh, Conservatives down 71 seats, Labour up 49 and the Liberal Democrats up 20. Uh, and in answer to Laura's question, this is how our councils to watch overnight how the screen looks now. So uh, as uh, those of you who've been following us through the hours will know, Brentwood is a Conservative loss. Uh, they had a majority of three before the night started and they've lost that to no overall control. They've also lost Tamworth in Staffordshire. And as Laura re reminded you earlier, uh, during the programme, this is where Chris Pincher uh, is an MP, he was a Conservative, is now an Independent, and he played a role in a sequence of events that eventually triggered Boris Johnson's resignation. We can't know how much of a role that played, but it may well have done. Uh, by contrast, over here um, uh, in the hung uh, section, Plymouth, which was uh, under no overall control. That is now a Labour gain. So you see that flashing red. And in the red column here, all those um, councils which started the night uh, as Labour, there's a whole lot of red there which uh, indicate Labour holds. Uh, and for the councils that are in white and grey, they are still counting. Uh, under the Liberal Democrat column. Hull is a Labour hold and they've consolidated their position there. So they're terribly pleased about that, of course. And just one word about these councils here at the bottom under the hung section. Uh, remember, I told you at the beginning of the evening that uh, Rochford 
uh, in uh, Rochford in Essex, West Lindsay in Boston, both of them in Lincolnshire. Although they're all in the hung sector, section they were actually conservative councils um, four years ago and they became hung through defection so we were going to watch and see if the conservatives were able to take them back or well, Rochford they have failed there because Rochford has stayed hung so that's how it's looking at ooh, 10 to 4 in the morning um, I'll update you again soon. Thank you very much indeed, Rita. Well, let's go straight to one of the councils that we've talked about a bit. We've been hearing from our reporter on the ground in North West Leicestershire. And that's somewhere where the Tories are doing worse than they expected, we think. We don't have final numbers there. But let's speak to Varaj Rikiki, who's the former chairman of the Conservative Party in that part of the world. We were hearing earlier from our reporter on the ground that the Conservatives were braced to lose seats they hadn't expected to. Can you just tell us what you think is going on? Well, I think um, what's happening now is national politics uh, appear to be in the minds of most voters. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we're obviously very, very disappointed. We did expect a change, a slight change, but certainly not the uh, whirlwind gains uh, that Labour have made uh, tonight. We certainly didn't expect that. But the biggest problem I see is that there's a tremendous amount of knowledge that is now being swept away by the, um, by the Labour group. The Conservatives have been the uh, leading group in North West Leicestershire for the past 20 odd years and all of the councillors have tremendous knowledge um, and now they've got to start afresh. And I'm afraid that the officers may well be a little bit concerned that uh, most of the uh, new ward members know absolutely nothing of how to run the council. So it is rather unfortunate that people have voted politically, uh, um, nationally, rather than um, a, a district level. We've kept the council tax. Um, we haven't increased the council tax in 16, 14 years. Um, but I'm afraid now the Labour group will be increasing the tax, uh, council tax, so uh, people will be paying more, I'm afraid. And yes, I'm uh, disappointed. I love the area. I've loved working for the uh, general public. And it's a sad day for quite a lot of uh, Conservative councillors. Um, Mr Rikiki, we don't actually have confirmation of the final results there, but are you confirming to us then that the Conservatives have lost control of the council? Has, has Labour actually got a majority or has it gone to nobody being in overall control but Labour the biggest group? Well, the, um, the counting is still going on, um, so we're not really sure um, whether the Labour will have a controlling group, but we, the Conservatives, certainly have not. Um, and I, I suppose another governing factor is the fact that um, our MP has been a little bit too sort of outspoken and not considered what he's been saying uh, as to what the effect will have on uh, the local electorate. So uh, we, we've not been, been given any favours. We've been dealt a pretty bad hand the past um, three, four years from Boris, Liz Trust and now Rishi Sunak and hopefully Rishi Sunak will put us on the right track again. But we are really hard working, the Conservatives are, and we love our district and of course we're going to be back again before long. And you refer there to the controversy over Andrew, Andrew Bridgen um, who was booted out of the Conservative Party as an MP so isn't even serving as a Conservative MP anymore in your part of the world. You say for three or four years though you've had a pretty bad hand from the National Party. How confident are you or not oh, absolutely. about Rishi Sunak's ability to turn it round? Because from what's happened tonight, I think some of your colleagues might have a big question mark about that. No, I, I think to be fair, this is a protest vote. Um, I know that a lot of, a lot of uh, my electorate um, are very happy with the way we in the district have run the council. We Conservatives have run the council. Uh, but it is a, it's, it's a protest on a national level, as you've obviously noticed. Labour are sweeping across the board all over the country. So uh, we're, we're taking a certain amount of satisfaction knowing that we have done a good job. We have really looked after our electorate. We're building more and more affordable homes. We've built council houses. We're, we're really trying to look after everyone 
in our district, but unfortunately, uh, on a national level, we've been let down. That Rishi Sunak can turn that around. I would think so. I, I believe so. I think he's, he's, he's committed to trying to get things back on course for us. We've had, we've had, as I said, three or four bad years. Covid really knocked the country about. Whether we handled it in the right way or the wrong way, I really don't know. I'm not as politically minded as, as an MP is. Uh, but we did the best we could under the circumstances that we had no control over. And unfortunately, I think that um, a lot of people now have lost that work ethic and not getting back to working really hard and getting the country back on track again. We're sliding downhill and I don't think that uh, any government can put it right. It's up to the people of the country to set about it, put their barrow down and get on with it and get back to work and let's raise the country to the level it was 10 years ago. OK, Varadra Kiki, the former chair of the North West Leicestershire Conservatives, uh, thank you very much for giving us your time. I know it's a difficult night for you, so we appreciate you speaking to us here on BBC News. Now, we're not that far away from the news at four o'clock, believe it or not, it is nearly 4 a.m. But we are going to check in for some interesting views with two people who know the two main parties well. Laura Dunn, who was a special advisor to various Conservative ministers, and Andrew Fisher, who was the former director of policy for Jeremy Corbyn. Laura, just let's start to, with you. Listening to that local councillor, that local activist in North West Leicestershire, feeling clearly so let down by the National Party. Yeah, um, I think when you look at the past year, it's definitely been a very tumultuous time for the Conservative Party um, and that perhaps is playing out now um, when we look at these results. I think, you know, it's still not a clear cut picture, even at four minutes to four in the morning. Um, what I've heard from colleagues who've been out campaigning across the country, that there's still, you know, a, a soft, undecided vote. And some voters have ha actually felt a bit meh about things. Um, I think we've seen some of the messaging a little bit uh, muddied as well with national issues in terms of the NHS, uh, cost of living, um, et cetera, being woven into that dialogue. Um but, you know, I think uh, the Prime Minister has done a really good job in trying to stabilise the ship uh, since he uh, took office. But it's clear there's much more work to be done. I think, you know, um, as soon as the uh, ballot boxes and the polling stations shut at 10 o'clock last night, the campaign for the general election next year, um, definitely it's it's underway. Um, and just as we're chatting, I just want to show you results come in. The Middlesbrough mayor is another Labour gain, gained from the independent Andy Preston, who's been in charge there for the last few years. So that's a gain for Labour in the northeast of England, the kind of part of the world where they wanted to show evidence of progress. Just to let you know, the Middlesbrough mayor is not a big, all-powerful mayor like the Manchester or the London mayor. But of course, these races still do matter. And that is a gain for the Labour Party. Um, let's turn that, put that then to Andrew Fisher, who was a critical person in Jeremy Corbyn's team. I mean, it's a, a dilemma perhaps for you on the left who's wanted to see Keir Starmer be more radical, putting forward or sticking to some of the policies that he offered in his leadership campaign, you might say. And yet Labour is making distinct progress, Andrew. Yeah, it's a good night for Labour. There's no two ways about that. And that's a, that's a good thing. You know, we're all, uh, or at least I am a Labour Party member and have been for 26 years. So, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased that Labour's doing well. Um, I guess the the question is, and it remains, and it's true of the national polling as well, is how much of this is the collapse of the Conservatives and how much of it is, is a kind of enthusiasm for Labour. And I think what we see across the country and what I've heard back from canvassers right across the country is you know, there's definitely a suppression of the Tory vote. A lot of Tory voters haven't turned out today. Uh, we know that. That's, you know, the turnout figures are quite low. There's not uh, you know, any sense of a great enthusiasm for Labour. Um, in some council areas, of course, there is, in, but overall, not so much. So, you know, it's a good result. It's it's put us on a good path. I think a lot of um, what Jonathan Ashworth was saying to you earlier about if you look at the seats that uh, or the where the councils map onto parliamentary seats, Labour's making pretty good gains in important places. So it's a good night for Labour. There's no you know, no problem about that. But the question is, when it comes to a general election, you're not talking about turnouts of 15, 20, 25 percent. 
you're talking about trying to get 65, 70% out. Um, and then you've got to enthuse people. You've got to give people a reason to vote. So I think there needs to be a lot more definition from Keir Starmer's Labour Party. I, you know, I'll, I'll stick to my guns on that. But um, And also you've just got to meet the scale of the challenge. Look at the crisis in the NHS. Look at the crisis in the pollution in our seas and rivers. Look at the state of the economy and people's wages. Labour's got to have answers to those big questions in a general election. But these are very good results. What about, Andrew Fisher, that recent ditching of the plan to scrap tuition fees for students in England. Is that the kind of thing that you would like to see Keir Starmer recommit to? Yeah, of course. I mean, it, look, education should be free. That's a principle that most um, Labour Party members have, um, you know, whether they're on the right or the left of the party, to be honest. Uh, and it's wrong that the, you know, tuition fees came in in the first place and then that they were troubled under the coalition government of the Lib Dems and Tories. So, yes, they definitely should stick to that. Um, you know, Labour brought in free tuition in Scotland in 2000, when in coalition with the Liberal Democrats. So this is something we've done before. We should do it in government uh, UK-wide as well. OK, Andrew Fisher and Laura Dunn, thank you very much indeed for joining us and for waiting patiently until we were able to get to you. Uh, thank you both very much. It will be interesting in the coming days, depending on the final resu results, of course, how much that debate about enthusiasm for the Starmer project comes to life inside the Labour Party. But it's certainly been plenty of life in the conversation with Jonathan Ashworth and Baroness Kramer who've been with us for the last little while. You two are both going to now depart. Nikki, don't go anywhere. You'll have some new comrades at the desk in a second or two. Before we go to the news, I'm going to give you the tally on our giant tower. I like doing this. Um, Labour have increased their council tally by 52 seats with 361 now. The Tories losing 73. The Liberal Democrats very chipper having gained 20 seats and the Greens gaining 10. There's some interesting things in different parts of the country for the Greens that we're keeping an eye on as well. Overall, the sketched out headline, bad night for the Tories, really pretty heavy losses for them. Steps forward for Labour, but maybe not the significant strides that they need to get to number 10, but a good night so far from the Liberal Dems. But these are the early headlines, tons more results to come, more of them after the news with Luxby Go Pal. Hello, here's your BBC News summary. Results are coming in from the local elections across large parts of England, with the Conservatives losing control of Brentwood and Tamworth councils. In Tamworth, Labour gained seven seats, while in Brentwood, the Tories lost in three wards to the Liberal Democrats. The Lib Dems needed to win five seats there to take control of the council. Our political correspondent, Jonathan Blake, has more. Celebration in Stoke-on-Trent. Seat by seat, councillors are finding out their fate. Here, it's Labour that are making gains. Counting has begun in more than 200 towns, cities and rural areas across England where voters have had their say on who should run local services. The Tories are braced for a tough night, hoping only to limit their losses. And among the early results, they lost control of Brentwood in Essex, where the Liberal Democrats made gains. Fantastic result for the Liberal Democrats in one of the safest Tory seats in the country. Uh, we've gained three seats. Um, we're now up to 17 seats and uh, the council moves into an overall control. And uh, it's a time of change in Brentwood and we're really delighted. It's fantastic news. Worcester is one of many places where control of the council hasn't changed hands, but Conservatives saw their support slip away. Individual wards will be impacted by individual issues, um, but I, I, I have to say I guess the general theme is the backdrop of uh, Westminster um, has not played out well on the doorstep um, and we've been held to account. Labour are looking for a strong showing to prove their lead in opinion polls can bring winning results. Tamworth in the West Midlands, among the places the party has so far taken significant numbers of seats from the Conservatives. In a first for elections in England, photo ID was required at polling stations, which left some unable to vote, but it's too soon to say what impact the change has had. Only around a quarter of the councils holding elections are counting votes overnight, so early results won't give anything like the full picture. But in the hours ahead, these local elections will be closely watched as a crucial test of the national political picture. Jonathan Blake, BBC News.
Well, within the past hour, Labour has celebrated taking control of Plymouth Council after the Conservatives lost eight seats. As Labour cheered, the Veterans Minister, Johnny Mercer, who's an MP in the city, expressed his disappointment. Socialist Look, it's been uh, a 21. really terrible night. Hunt. Think, uh, there's a number of factors at play. I think locally it's been very difficult. Uh, the Conservative group here... Uh, has been through a very difficult time. Uh, we've seen that reflected on the doors in the campaign and we've seen that reflected in the uh, results tonight. But, you know, we take it on the chin and, uh, you know, we, we keep going forward. I think there's uh, really positive stuff happening at a national level and we need to redouble our efforts and make sure that uh, we continue to work hard for people here in Plymouth. Conservative MP Johnny Mercer there. And of course, all the local results will be available online. To find out who won in your local area, you can use our postcode checker available on the BBC News website and on our app. We'll be back in an hour with the latest news updates, but for now it's back to our special election night coverage with Laura. And just a reminder, to see who won in your local area, you can use our postcode checker, which is available on the BBC News website and on our app. And a very warm welcome back to the Election 2023 studio here at BBC News. First of all, I'd like to welcome two new guests to the studio. Nikki Aiken's still here with us, Conservative Deputy Chair, but we've been joined by Lord Fox, Liberal Democrat. Chris, nice Good to have morning. you with us. And Peter Kyle, Labour's shadow spokesperson on Northern Ireland. We're pleased to have you all here at just after 4 a.m. With me, of course, is our political editor, Chris Fox. Chris Fox? Chris Fox is over there. <laughs> Chris Mason is over here. It was just when you put your head down to the laptop. Anyone would think it's 4.06. Um, we know what the headlines are being sketched out as from what we have seen so far. But health warning, health warning, health warning. Of course, there are plenty more results to come tonight. Many more results to come tomorrow. But so far... What we have been seeing, what our numbers are suggesting, is a very bad night for the Conservatives, a decent night for Labour with progress, but maybe not huge progress, but a happy night for the Liberal Democrats too. So let's talk to Rita about what some of those projections might look like and how they go into history comparatively. Well, here we have it, Laura. So this is... Our, it says our estimate, but it's our projection based on the results so far of the number of councillors that each of the main parties might expect to have at the end of this election. Now, I must say that this is a projection, so it is based on the pattern of the results so far. But given what we know, it is looking as if Labour might be in the region of gaining around 400 councillors, the Conservatives, could be looking at losses of over a thousand and the Liberal Democrats could be looking at picking up uh, around 260 more seats. Um, so if you look at the actual graph, you see we've got our dotted lines projecting into 2023 because we're not saying this is exactly what's going to happen. This is what we think will ha happen based on the results that we have. But you see that the red dot is overtaking the blue dot and that would mean if this did come to pass, it would mean that Labour would become the largest party in local government for the first time since, if you go all the way back to 2002, that is the last time that Labour was the largest party in local government. Um, if the results do give this sort of scenario, it means that the Conservatives are at risk of uh, losing the sort of worst case scenario figures that they have been giving in the run up to this election, which is a loss of around a thousand seats. Um, and for the Liberal Democrats, well, we know that they have been having a good election so far uh, and potentially putting on around 260 uh, 260 councillors, uh, with a slight improvement on their performance on last year and also on 2019, the last time that these seats were fought. And they did well in 2019, so that is all encouraging for them. But I suppose you do also have to look back at our graph to see how well they were doing before they went into power with the Conservatives uh, in 2010, where they were 
scoring really rather higher. So a good night for the Lib Dems, but as with everything in politics and in life, it's all relative. Laura. Thank you very much, Rita. Well, it is all relative and it is also only the case if the current trends of the night continue. So losses for the Conservatives could speed up, they could slow down. Gains for the Labour Party could speed up, they could slow down. You get my point. That is a projection if the trends continue as we've seen so far this evening. So bear that in mind, but it absolutely does bear examination and bear some more conversation. So let's go to Sir John who's been furiously trying to work all of this out. These are fascinating numbers, aren't they, Sir John? And they put the Conservatives beyond what were their worst expectations, potentially, if it well, goes on like this. Yeah, maybe. Let's, let, let's not over-egg the pudding. I think the, I think the point... I would never should, do that. The, the, the point we should simply make is that, you know, as of four o'clock uh, this morning, with 75% of the results still to be counted... We cannot say that the Conservatives are clearly not at risk of suffering a thousand seats. They're, at the moment, we cannot rule out the possibility that that is what might happen. Um, and, that, you know, certainly the rate of loss overnight at around one in three does indeed take you to around or possibly even slightly over the 1,000 mark. So let's be careful here. We're not saying that's what is going to happen. We're simply, I think, really above all, saying to those of our inveterate viewers who are not only now with us at four o'clock in the morning, but also expect to be with us at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon, when we might know the answer to this, that indeed they may discover when they are still watching, if they haven't fallen asleep, that the Conservatives might have lost a thousand seats. John, I think if people are still watching us at 4 a.m., they are definitely going to be watching at 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon because that is proper well, they might have aficionado. A job to go to do with, Laura, well, well, then they can look at it on their phone, I'm sure. They'll be watching it under the desk. Um, let's get you then to respond to the numbers we can show our viewers about what's happened in key wards. Mm -hmm. So the change since 2019, remember May 2019, not the general election, 19, Labour up 7%, the Conservatives down 1%, Lib Dems up 1%. Yep. Change since last year, 2022, the Conservatives down 5%, Labour only up point one percent at mm -hmm. this point in the proceedings mm -hmm. so the kind of increases in share that labor might expect to wake up to in the morning if things carry on like this are potentially not then the persuasive kinds of things you were talking about at the beginning of the night that double digit kind of lead in national projected share that they would require mm -hmm. to be sure of victory uh, on the way to number that, 10. That, that, that doesn't quite follow laura because uh, you know, that minus conservative, that minus five figure for the Conservatives in terms of the lead, uh, you know, can, means that the lead of Labour over the Conservatives is probably going to be somewhat wider than the five point lead that Labour enjoyed in the projected uh, national share last year. It's just a reminder that in the context of local elections, at least, where it looks as though on tonight's evidence that the Liberal Democrats have edged up a bit better, and uh, maybe as a result, are going to put in their best performance since 2010. Uh, the, the Greens, although probably doing no more than holding their own overall since 2019, but actually doing, actually increasing in wards where they were previously strongest, uh, that they're also taking uh, their, their share of the spoils. That, you know, we, at least in English local, English local government is different from Westminster. Westminster, at least in terms of MPs from England and Wales, is still dominated by Conservative and Labour. Not true of Scotland, of course. But English local government is not dominated by Conservative and Labour, and certainly is much less dominated by Conservative and Labour than it was in the days when Tony Blair was able to get something like 46% of the projected national share. The spoils are divided rather more evenly, and as a result, therefore, it's rather more difficult for Labour to make the, to make the kind of score in local government elections uh, that we're getting in national opinion polls. But it's equally also more difficult for the Conservatives to do as well as they're doing in national polls. And let's just remember how on the numbers so far, the Conservatives are doing somewhat less well than even the disaster of May 2019 under Theresa May's leadership. OK, so John, thank you very much indeed for keeping us right. Um, and we mustn't compare apples and pears. I've been properly told off. 
absolutely Obviously, right. Yeah, he's he's just... the man with the numbers. But Chris, overall, I mean, from what we know, the trends are suggesting at this stage, there's still going to be pressure on Keir Starmer, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, because there will be, well, it, because of momentum, because of that sense that because they were so m a million miles ahead in the opinion polls after the kind of Tory implosion of the tail end of, of last year, yes, they have narrowed a little bit, that any gap that exists at the end of the end of today when all of the results are in between where Labour, Labour's opinion poll leads have been and where they may end up, if there is a gap there, that is a gap into which a sort of frisson of nerve mm. can can settle for Labour because, and we've said it before, but we should underline it, the mountain that they face at the next general election is absolutely colossal. So they can't just be ahead or winning by a bit. They need to be winning by an awful lot. So, yeah, and in the meantime, they are conscious, when I speak to people, Labour people privately, they are conscious that the Conservatives have managed to well, steady things at least in terms of how government appears at Westminster. Mm -hmm. It isn't the kind of rolling chaos that it was uh, for much of last year. Keir Starmer had made a big thing last year of portraying himself as the sort of grown-up of British mm -hmm. politics and pointing and drawing a comparison with Liz Truss and with Boris Johnson. Arrives, Rishi Sunak arrives on the stage and, and has a similar kind of political act. Mm. So to that extent, it becomes a bit harder for, uh, for Keir Starmer as well. Just one little local nugget just mm -hmm. to bring you whilst we've been talking as far as Labour's performance is concerned, it, looking particularly good, we've talked about this already, but looking particularly good in Stoke for them. The gains that they are making there looks like, my maths is right, that they're heading in the direction of, uh, uh, of taking control. Well, that would make sense because our Lizzie Glinka, our colleague on the ground there, told us that the local Conservative leader had already left the building, which normally when it comes to election counts suggests that you've lost and you've gone away. But, you know, who knows? Maybe he was going, going out to, maybe who knows what he was doing? Maybe he's come back. Who knows? Let's see. But we will hear from Lizzie as soon as we've got any definitive no news from Stoke because that would be quite a symbolic uh, win for Labour uh, or if, uh, um, if they do indeed manage to do that in Stoke because it's one of those really crucial parts of the country where Brexit was such a divide. Um, do you think, Peter Kyle, if Labour is making progress in the, what the jargon says are red wall but former Labour areas, heavily Brexit, said no to Jeremy Corbyn, do you think you're seeing signs that actually that Brexit divide is fading a bit? I think we're actually just crossing lots of divides, actually. I think what we've put a lot of effort into is just getting the basics right. We've put an offer to the country, which is right where the country wants us to be, centrally. So that means we've, this, this whole campaign centrally has been about uh, the cost of living crisis and how we can tackle that. It's been about cutting crime. It's been about cutting the waiting list on the NHS. Then we had a very big regional operation, uh, and then we had a very big local operation. So we've been layering this campaign, getting it right at the centre using Keir and then right down into communities. And it seems to be working. So you can see us defeating Tories in Plymouth. You can see us doing really well in Stoke. We've just uh, taken the mayoralty in Middlesbrough. Now that was one four years ago with a 60% uh, majority uh, of the percentage of the vote by an independent. And we've just taken that back. So you can see that we're doing well right across the board. We're doing well geographically, north, south, and in the Midlands. And we're also doing well in uh, Leave and Remain. And we're getting these different basics of, of winning an election right. These are the things we're looking at. We want the overall numbers. Of course we do. Because when we get hundreds of new councillors, as we are likely to do this morning and tomorrow afternoon, it means we have the ability to serve. That's what we're really in this for, for serving communities. But then we're also looking, to, of course, as a party, for how we take steps forward towards a general election. So we're getting all of these different bits right. But you say you're getting sort of the basics right. I suppose basics right. That isn't going to get you to number 10. I mean, are you confident that's enough? Well, listen to what I've just said. We're getting all of the different constituent parts right. And too often in the past, we've got lots of those elements wrong. Uh, geographically, we're getting it right. So we're taking seats off the Tories in the south. And don't forget, we're doing the southwest at the moment. Tomorrow, we'll do a lot of seats across the southeast. We'll be fighting the Greens in Brighton. We'll be fighting the Tories in Crawley. We're even having a good old pop in, in Dover. And if we make gains in Dover, these are places the Labour Party hasn't done well since the 90s and early noughties. So we're taking the fight right to the Tories, right across the country. We're doing it with a core central message, uh, message based on the priorities of the country as a whole. And then we're working very, very well locally as well, tuning and plugging in to those local priorities. We have not had such message discipline we have not had such energised activists for a very long time, and it's working. 
This message discipline something to be proud of? It basically of means it that is. politicians say what they're told to say, doesn't it? The, the country expects a party of government and aspiring to government to be a dis disciplined party. We, we heard a minute ago from Chris saying that the Tories of uh, Rishi Sunak has steadied the ship. The problem is he steadied the ship and it's on the bottom of the ocean floor. I mean, they blew a hole in the economy. They've, they've, they've trashed their reputation. They've trashed Britain's reputation around the world. The ship has sunk. So it's been levelled off right at the bottom. They are about to lose, perhaps, a thousand seats, a thousand councillors on the back of an electoral cycle when it was last fought four years ago, when they had the worst ever showing in modern history. And they're still losing a thousand. Okay. This is a ship which is on the bottom of the seabed right now. That's where it's stabilised. Nikki, rock bottom, according to Peter Kyle. Look, the Labour Party are not doing as well as they should be doing. In <laughs> but they haven't taken Hull, they didn't take Worcester. Um, obviously, they've taken other councils, but they're not doing as well as they should be. Um, particularly if you're considering what Tony Blair did in 1995, they are a long, long way from that. that was and I think, in and I think, so don't please don't interrupt. You always interrupt me. You're so <laughs> bad at interrupting me, Peter. It always does it. Is it because I'm a woman? Um, oh. And uh, but I think, as I said to you earlier, 13 years of being in power, people are going to uh, want to tell us, send us a message, particularly after what's happened in the last year. But I don't accept um, about the economy. We have gone through a, a pandemic where we spent hundreds of billions of pounds keeping people in, in jobs. We have then gone through into a uh, energy crisis, inflation, but it's not just the United Kingdom, it's across the, the world. If you see what's but going on- There was on, also on, something like, rather different that happened here. What didn't happen in other countries was a market meltdown when a new prime minister came in. You can't just say it was the same no. as happened in other countries. But as you've been talking, we can now confirm that North West Leicestershire is a Conservative loss. You've lost that council yeah. there. We were talking to the very upset yeah. local Conservative there who was sharing his frustration yeah. that national turmoil had done for him and his councillors on the doorstep. Look, the Conservatives down at 12 council seats there, Labour increasing their share by eight, the Conservatives down by eight. Yeah. Now, when you look at a result like that, what goes through your mind? Uh, well, we heard from the, 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 the group leader and it was heartbreaking. And, you know, we will lose, so, you know, many, many brilliant Conservative councillors. Well, you know, all, all parties will, will lose good, hardworking councillors. Uh, today and, and into, uh, well, I was going to say tomorrow, but it is tomorrow. Um, but, Laura, from what I was being told on the doorstep, people have been fed up with what was been going on within our party so in Parliament. So your councillors, potentially more than a thousand of them, are paying the price because of the antics of your colleagues at Westminster. And I know you spent a long time in local government as yeah. well, Nikki. So do you feel... Well, look, uh, we, well, look we lost Westminster Council last year mm -hmm. and I can tell you it's because our voters stayed away. They certainly didn't vote for the Labour Party but, and they didn't vote but, for Lib but Dems. But why are you saying... It sounds like you are saying that your councillors around the country are paying the price for the turmoil, bad behaviour of some of your colleagues in Westminster? Well, look, as I said, mm. all night, and as, as other colleagues have said, all night, we know it was going to be a tough night for us. After 13 years in power, of course, and as I said to you earlier, when I was first elected in 2006 and 2010, under Labour governments, I had no issues. It was once I had uh, a Conservative government that people were saying, I'm not going to vote for you this time because I don't like your government. So there's always a national effect on local elections. There's also, you know, local elections you saw in Plymouth. There's a particular reason why we lost mm -hmm. Plymouth, mm -hmm. to do with the felling of 100 trees. Mm -hmm. There's reasons why um, we lost um, seats in Brent Brentwood to the Lib Dems because of a particular two developments. So there are always, it's, a, it's always a mixture of local issues and then the national picture. Um, Lord Fox, those local issues for the Liberal Democrats, they often play very well. And we have seen in this campaign that the Lib Dems in local areas have often fought very hard against some things, like fought very hard against lots of housing developments. Whereas nationally, you're very fond of saying that actually the Conservatives have been dreadful because they haven't built enough houses. So are you profiting by double, double standards? Well, I think people look at the Conservatives and they don't trust them where it comes to developers. They know that developers are backing the party centrally and, and that trust then is reflected locally and Liberal Democrats quite rightly reflect that trust. You only have to look at what Michael Gove's trying to do with a levelling up bill, which is to take control of things centrally. And if you ask Conservative councillors, 
54% of Conservative councillors are against what Michael Co Gove is doing. So it's not just us. It's the Conservative councillors themselves who don't like what's going on about development and the relationship between developers, local communities and the level of power that people seem to lack when it comes to making those decisions. Isn't the bigger truth though here, and this is a question for all of you really, that the, the country requires so many more houses than, than, than we currently have. And that's going to involve politicians at a national and local level making difficult arguments because otherwise people are going to struggle to find the housing that they need. Well, it's also going to involve having proper conversations with communities, with, with real decisions being, be, be, being made on account of what they say. There is consultation that goes Saying on no and if they don't ignored. Like it. And, and people see that and it undervalues every decision because they know or they believe they know that, that other forces are at play when these decisions are being made. The way to deal with it is with people, not, not over their heads. All three of you, thank you very much indeed for now. Nikki, we are saying goodbye to you. Thank you very much I'm for coming, coming in. You're going to bed, are you going to bed now? Yes. Tremendous. Well, sleep well. I'm sure you'll be back hard at it tomorrow because there might be some tricky conversations at Conservative HQ tomorrow once you've had a bit of a sleep, but we appreciate you giving us your time here. The other two, don't go anywhere. We still need you to be with us. Hard work for you ahead. And also remember, if you are that way inclined and you like to look at things on your phone while you're watching TV, there is so much information on the BBC website, all sorts of tips and trends insights and bits and pieces of information from my colleagues right around the country, analysis from Chris, everything you could possibly want to know about these local elections as they develop through the night. And that's at bbc.co.uk or of course on the app on your phone. So head there anytime. Let's now though head to Medway. Anna Collinson is there for us now. Anna, it's hours since we talked at the beginning of the night about what might happen there and why it's an important part of the country. Those Medway towns in Kent, not that far from London, but the kind of place currently represented by Conservatives, but where Labour definitely want to chip away. What's been happening? Yeah, so there's been a bit of movement since we last spoke, Laura. Um, actually, we've seen the biggest test so far this evening. Uh, Twiddle, uh, a, seat, a seat of two, two seats in one area, has been taken by the Labour Party. And when that was announced, there were big cheers uh, from the corner of Red supporters over there. Uh, and that, that's been a real sort of uh, standout moment so far. But that's seat five. We've got a total of 59 to get through, so 54 more to go. I mean, as you mentioned, this is a traditionally Tory area, but Labour have very much set their sights on trying to capture it. Keir Starmer has been into Gillingham twice in the past month. The mood here I would describe from the Conservative Party is um, pretty pretty nervous. I asked one con candidate how he, how he thought they were doing and he pulled a face and whispered, badly, pretty badly. Um, Councillor Alan J Jarrett, who is the Conservative leader of the uh, Medway Council, he has told the BBC that he believes that Labour will secure a majority tonight. Um, uh, he's basically saying that voters have been um, let down by the Conservatives nationally and many of them are staying at home. He also says that recent boundary changes that have happened in Medway have had a negative impact on the Conservatives, that they've broken up key Conservative wards. Labour would argue that actually there was a, a real imbalance beforehand and that, that those um, boundary changes needed to happen to address that balance. Ultimately, Labour what I'm sensing is they're feeling hopeful, uh, but anxious, but nervous. There is also fear on their side of apathy, that there is a real sense of people not feeling represented by either party and not turning out. And we've seen that in some of the um, seats when they've been called out today. Some of the turnouts have been around 20%. Now we expect low turnout during a local election, but normally around 30 to 40%. So 20% is particularly low. So as I say, we've got um, 54 more seats to go. So it's still all to play for really. Although, and I know you said there that the leader, I think you said the leader of the Tory group said that they think they're going to lose it and that Labour will knock them off. Yes, yes, sorry, yes, that's exactly what I said. Alan Jarrett told the BBC just, just, just after the announcement regarding, sorry, just before the announcement involving Twiddle, that he believes that Labour will take the majority this evening. Now, I've spoken to some of the Labour activists and they're being a bit more cautious. They don't want to overstep the mark before they're ready, but Twiddle, that, that sort of clinching of that first Twiddle seat or the first two Twiddle seats is a real good sign in their books.
Anna, thank you very much indeed. And I think that is ward name of the night. Uh, Twiddle has uh, one there. Uh, but Anna, thank you very much indeed. And keep us posted if we've got official confirmation of what the leader of the Labour group is predicting. Um, politics live as it happens. The leader of the group saying we're going to win it. And the activist going, oh, don't quite say that yet. But, you know, we'll keep you posted and let you know when we have confirmation of that result there in Medway. Let's go to another important count we've been talking about tonight. Let's zoom up to the northwest. Let's go back to Kevin Fitzpatrick in Bolton. Now, you explained to us, Kevin, earlier why, you know, this is the kind of place where party leaders fall over themselves to turn up because there are lots of important northwest seats around there and the council itself, of course, an important one. So what's been happening since we talked last? Well, it's been a really good night for Labour here and a pretty terrible night for the Conservatives. Better than Labour expected, I think it's fair to say, and worse than the Conservatives. We've still got some um, results coming in, but latest is that it's eight Labour gains tonight. Six of those have come directly co from the Conservatives. Uh, also, before I was telling you that the smaller hyper-local parties are, are a big influence around here, Labour's taken a, a couple uh, from one of those, but one of those smaller independents has taken another seat from the Conservatives. So the Conservatives are well down, Labour are well up. Coming into this election, we'd had a couple of years since 2019 of the Conservatives running a minority administration, a coalition of those smaller parties. Uh, it looks like Labour uh, will certainly now be the largest party, still waiting to see whether they can end up uh, gaining a majority. If they do end up the largest party, it's no guarantee they would then be able to form a minority administration because so many of those hyper-local parties were, were actually set up, came into creation um, in opposition to the existing Labour Council as it was then. So it could be that the Conservatives, even with a, a smaller number of councillors, are able to hang on and continue to lead this council. But either way, it's a, it's a pretty, grim, pretty grim night for them and Labour at a cock-a-hoop down there with still more results to come in. Thank you very much indeed, Kevin, for bringing us that and keep us posted when there's confirmation of any more results as they come through. Exactly the kind of place, Bolton, there in the northwest of England, where Labour wanted to show progress. They are showing progress and they really did show progress and have done so far in Stoke, from where we can be joined by the former MP, Ruth Smith. Now, Baroness Anderson, um, you look absolutely overjoyed, completely different to when I think we perhaps last talked on an election <laughs> programme. Uh, <laughs> you can almost contain your glee. Tell us what's on your mind. You look delighted. We've just taken control of the council. This is a Labour gain. This is a Labour council in Stoke-on-Trent for the first time in eight years. This is Labour back as a political force in my city. I am truly delighted. Why do you think it happened? Look, I think what, we were, what we've seen today is that the Conservative Party have been losing votes in every ward. We've seen um, the city independents and the local independent parties completely collapse. And people have come home to the Labour Party. I think that you know, the Conservatives are going to have to reflect on what they do in places like Stoke. I think that the electorate are sending them a clear message. But for us, there's still a huge amount of work to do to make sure that we can win at the general election and that we take our former seats back. So this is an incredible stepping stone and from tomorrow my city is red. Do you think, Baroness Sanderson, this means that Brexit as a sort of political force that shoved people to vote one way or the other is receding? Because that was absolutely a really strong factor previously when Labour was so damaged in Stoke because you had a strong leave vote and then Labour MPs who found that you were sort of stuck in the middle in a way. Do you think that's fading? That I think there are some parts of that fate is fading, but I think four years ago we had Jeremy Corbyn, now we've got Keir Starmer. I think Brexit and the world's moved on. We've seen COVID, we've seen the cost of living crisis, and people are genuinely fearful in my city of how they're meant to pay their bills. And they've seen nothing but car parks being built with the levelling up money. There's been no real investment from the Conservative Party in Stoke-on-Trent. It's been smokes and mirrors. They've been betrayed. They were promised the world and actually what the Conservative Party delivered them was literal car parks that no one can afford to use and there's nowhere to go if you do park in them. So what we've got to see going forward and what the Labour Party will be offering is hope for my city, is actual aspiration for the people that live here and investment in them. And tonight is the first stepping stone to take back our city.
I'm sure you've been on the doors a lot in this campaign, though, um, Baroness. Do you think that people yeah. have been <laughs> protesting against the Conservatives or going enthusiastically to you? Look, we've still got some way to go to convince people and you know, we, you know, I'm not underestimating the scale of the challenge. We had an awful night. Last time I was in this room four years ago, I think you, know, you and I had a very different type of conversation. But um, the Conservative Party have betrayed them. That's what we're getting on the doors. And for the first time, they're prepared to have conversations with us about what the Labour Party can offer. And they've given us their trust in this election. We'll need to build on it to make sure that we can at the next stage for the general election. Baroness Anderson, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure you'll go on to many celebrations. We can now officially confirm, as she said, but by our numbers, we can confirm that Labour has gained Stoke-on-Trent. There are still 14 seats left to declare, but they've gained the council. 23 seats to them, six to the Conservatives. Let's look at the change. Labour gaining 10 seats with still 14 to go. Uh, the Tories down one. But what's interesting here, the independents, which also rep includes other smaller parties, independents down nine. So you're seeing there the Labour uh, gaining 10, Conservatives losing one, but independents and other parties dropping by nine seats. Um, Peter Carroll, let's just get some quick reaction to you from that result. But I must also introduce Hugh Merriman, the Hello, Transport Lord. Minister. You're very welcome to the studio. Thank Thanks you. for coming in. Um, quick reaction to the Stoke result, Peter. Oh, I'm just completely over the moon. Uh, Ruth and I came into Parliament at the same election in 2015, and we're very good friends. And uh, I was uh, very, very sad, as all of us in the Labour Party were, when people in Stoke turned their backs on us in 2019. It was a really difficult thing for us to, to cope with. We worked really, really hard to listen to people in Stoke and in Teesside and in other parts of the country where... We lost the trust of voters. We've worked really hard to listen to what the concerns were and to address them. And what you're seeing tonight is the fruition of a lot of energy we've put in right across the country, listening, responding, acting, and actually putting our money where our mouth is. Chris, you were talking at the beginning of the night about the symbolism of mm. somewhere like Stoke. And there it is, you know, back in Labour hands. Yeah, I mean, I think quite strikingly, one of the most sort of striking images of the night so far was a picture that we showed around about an hour ago before that result in Stoke was 100% confirmed, but we were talking to it where we saw Baroness Anderson, who you were just talking to there, and Gareth Smith, both former Labour MPs in the, in the city, embracing some of the successful mm. uh, Labour councillors. And, and you get that sense in pictorial terms of what we've been talking about all night, about how parties seek to rebuild in local government in the hope that that gives them a launch pad for making uh, gains uh, come a general election. And when you look at the result there in Stoke, and then you look at what looks like the beginnings of results coming from Medway, from your earlier conversation mm. with Anna Collinson mm. there, these both crucial areas in terms of swing uh, constituencies at a parliamentary level. Those Medway towns, so many of them uh, won by Labour during Labour's time in national government, lost by Labour as they came out of national government in 2010. The Conservatives and many of those have built up considerable majorities. But if Labour are heading towards a victory in Medway, again, a point in a patch where they need to be making gains, where it looks like they are making gains. But equally, I was struck by Baroness Anderson's answer to your question about mm. the extent to which this is uh, a huge enthusiasm mm. for Labour or, or not quite that. And there was a caveat there, I thought, from her. And I think that would be a question that will be put again and again, I suspect, over the next, what, 12, 14 hours, however many it is, uh, sure uh, in it terms will. of uh, m measuring how much or in, in the round this is about real disillusion with the Conservatives versus huge enthusiasm or not for Labour. And we should underline, of course, that although we do have quite a lot of information here now, certainly enough to be assessing it and discussing it with our guests around the country and our politicians here in the studio, there are still 189 councils to go out of a total of 230. So there's still plenty more information to come before any kind of final assessments, if there is such a thing in politics, can be made about this set of council elections. But let's ponder some of that for a few minutes with James Johnson, who is a pollster. He worked for Theresa May. He saw the the opportunity of her numbers to begin with and I think the horror of her numbers towards the end. James, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, from your scribblings and your calculator and your sense of what we're seeing so far, what does it add up to? 
Well, I think there's no doubt that this is a good night for Labour. Um, on the one hand, they are not sort of you know completely storming it with the Conservatives. If you remember those projections that we've had over the last few weeks and months of Labour getting 100, 200, 300 seat majorities if there were a general election, I think it's pretty clear that's not happening. But it is a good result for Labour and they clearly are headed towards uh, quite a quite a good night. Um, it's not that 90s style victory, but it is a question of whether it's going to be good or very good for them. And the key number to watch there will be, well, all eyes on John Curtis, because that national equivalent, <laughs> that projected national share, you know, if Labour are at 10 points or more on ahead on that, then I think that'll be a very good night for them indeed. And just to remind viewers, if they didn't hear Sir John's explanation a bit earlier on, the projected national share is when all the numbers from today go into a some kind of complicated algorithm and supercomputer, no doubt, and give us a picture of what the national share would be had everybody in the UK been voting today. It's not a projection of what will actually happen in the general election, but it is a very, very important snapshot that the parties do look at very, very carefully. Um, what about the Conservatives, James? What do you think is going on here? Rishi Sudak has had seven months in office. He may have slowed the decline, according to lots of MPs, when you talk to them about what's going on. And that would be the sort of view of many people in Westminster. But when you look at the numbers that we're seeing emerging, is that really the case? Well, I think certainly if these elections had happened six months ago before Rishi Sunak took power, they, they would be a lot, lot worse than they are tonight. Um, he's almost halved that polling li uh, lead that Labour was given by a combination of Boris Johnson's parties and Liz Truss's uh, mini budget. So, look, I think there is a sense that he has steadied the ship. These are obviously not going to be great results for the Conservatives. I think that's pretty clear. I think the big question, though, is not so much to read in positives to the Conservative position tonight, but actually to to, uh, to ask, can they turn it around? Mm. Um, there's a time before in 1990 when Labour were 11 points ahead on that uh, projected national share number you just explained. And obviously, two years later, the Conservatives managed to win an election. So that's the question now. And if we, we did a poll last year, and I indeed, I went on your show about this time of, of the night last year, um, and said uh, that I didn't think it, Boris Johnson could necessarily turn it around. Uh, when we did a poll last year about why people voted in those local elections, why they didn't vote for the Conservatives, one of the words that popped up in our word cloud was Boris. Um, we don't see that level of personal vote to this tonight, whether it's a probium towards Rishi Sunak or positivity towards Keir Starmer. These are almost the elections where, almost despite the existence of Rishi Sunak and despite the existence of Keir Starmer, come a general election, when it's those two people in the front of people's minds about who will be the next prime minister, things may well look very different indeed. James, thank you so much indeed. It's great to have you. I've just noticed you were live with us from New York. I think that might be a first for, for a English so, so like council. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a first for a, a local election programme. We're very grateful to you for giving us your time. And it is always so interesting to think about the historical comparisons, which are both useful, but also can lead you down the wrong path if you are not also remembering that what happens in elections is, of course, a snapshot of what is happening exactly at that moment. And I just want to give you something interesting that's happening right at the moment in North Norfolk, lovely part of the world, Cromer, Sheringham, that bit of the coast. Um, let's look at what's happening to the Conservatives here. Now, they're still counting. The Liberal Democrats have 16 seats so far. The Tories have nine. But look at this. We haven't seen this much tonight. The Conservatives have gained seven seats and the Liberal Democrats have lost six. Now, there are still 12 to declare, so in the end, that might flip. Um, but that's something interesting going on in North Norfolk, where the Conservatives might have reasons to have a smile. But let's see what happens. It's a Lib Dem Council at the moment. Let's look, though, at Hartsmere. Now, that's leafy, affluent, Elstree, uh, Hertfordshire, not far from London, lots of commuters. Um, they are still counting there, but some more grim news for the Conservatives. You can see 14 seats for them so far, 11 for Labour. But look, Conservatives losing 10 seats. And that's the part of the world. Commuter belt around London, that sort of donut, as it's sometimes called, 
where the Conservatives may well, looking at that kind of result, be pretty nervous about what else might be coming down the track. But they are still counting there. We don't have a final result. And as I was saying before, there are still a lot of councils. The majority of councils are still to come. So at this point, 4.45. Rita, give us a primer on what we should expect tomorrow. I'll do that, Laura. I'm going to start you off with the councils that we have been watching overnight. Just to update you, really, we heard about Stoke-on-Trent, a Labour gain just in the last few minutes. Plymouth uh, happened earlier in the evening. The Lib Dems have held on to Cotswold and uh, Labour has held on to Bassett Law. But we know, of course, that the Conservatives have lost control of Brentwood, North West Leicestershire and Tamworth. Now, although this screen has changed a lot from right at the beginning of the evening, what you will notice is that not that many councils have changed hands. And that is partly because most of these councils were voting in thirds. It was only a third of the seats that were up. And that makes it harder for control to change. But that is different for the councils to watch on Friday. We are Friday, the councils that are counting during the day on Friday. Because let me take you through some of them under the Conservative controlled councils. North Warwickshire, for example, um, it's a really interesting area because the Conservatives have an 18,000 majority in the House of Commons in North Warwickshire, but they are under threat from Labour at council level. And that is true of the following four councils, Airwash in Derbyshire, Dover, Swindon, where Keir Starmer launched his local election campaign, Labour's local election campaign, Amber Valley also in Derbyshire. All of these are under threat from Labour. And the following three, Stratford-on-Avon, East Cambridgeshire and West Berkshire, well, the Conservatives are there under threat uh, from the Liberal Democrats. So it could be that we, can, we will see a lot more churn uh, in the coming hours uh, during the day on Friday. Uh, in the Labour column, Crawley at the top is a super marginal. Labour's only got a majority of two seats. And at the general election in 2019, Crawley went Conservative. So that is uh, a, a council where Labour is really going to want to hang on and also consolidate its support. But the Conservatives will be bringing the fight to them. Uh, lots of other interesting councils in the Labour column, uh, including Leeds, uh, where there are two general election target seats for the Labour Party. So Labour will, of course, want to hang on to the council, consolidate its support with a view to perhaps uh, targeting and gaining those seats uh, at a general election. Under the Lib Dem column, they, the party will be looking to build its support in all of these areas in the South. And particularly, um, you can see there, there are councils that are surrounding the capital. So Woking in Surrey, Mole Valley in Surrey, Three Rivers in Hertfordshire and also Watford. And in the hung column here, well, really, all these councils from Derby right the way through to Mansfield, um, the Labour Party is wanting to really take the fight there and is looking uh, to take control of all of these councils. And we know that, the, that Labour is having a good night. Is it possible that we'll see quite a few of these councils changing hands? And uh, before we end, a word about Mid Suffolk and Brighton and Hove, because the Greens, who are having a good night of it, uh, latest analysis shows that they are on a par with their performance in 2019, where they performed very strongly. Mid Suffolk is their strongest hope of the first council that they might be able to gain outright. So we'll be watching Mid Suffolk and also Brighton and Hove, where the Greens are um, leading a minority administration. So plenty of excitement for those of you who aren't sated with the overnight. Lots to watch. Thank you, Rita. It's never enough. Never enough. <laughs> Let's get then into those green contests. Rita was talking about two important ones, Brighton and Hove, where the Greens are trying to keep their minority control of the local authority there on the south coast, and then Mid Suffolk. Uh, on the other part of the southeast, uh, north a bit and east a bit, where they are hopeful of becoming the majority 
holders of the council, which would be a first for them, as we were her hearing earlier from Carla Denyer. Her co-leader, Adrian Ramsey, I'm pleased to say, is with us down the line. He can join us now. Now, as Rita was saying, so far you appear to be pretty much matching your record performance from 2019 in the keywords that we're collecting data for. But I just want to ask you about something we've been picking up things about, collaboration with the other parties. Now, it might not be formal, but it definitely has been happening in some places. In Mid-Suffolk, Labour's not running, uh, not running a full slate of candidates. So if you make the kind of progress that you want, how much of it will be down to those informal arrangements with other parties? Well, good morning, Laura. And as you say, we are on track for further gains on top of that record breakthrough we saw four years ago in 2019, where we were having green gains right across the country in rural and urban areas alike and from Labour and from the Conservatives. And we are already seeing, as you say, that pattern not only repeated, but growing on it as we expect to see continue to happen throughout the day. Uh, at a local level, Greens are uh, gaining support from all the other parties. And yes, there's places like Mid-Suffolk where you hardly see any Labour or Lib Dem presence on the ground. But that's really a reflection of the strength of those parties in that area. And in Mid-Suffolk, as in other places like North Herefordshire, there are many wards where if it wasn't for the Greens, the Conservatives would be going unchallenged. And Greens are winning seats from Conservatives in ever greater numbers, as I think we'll see in many parts of the country this time. And of course, where we've got big concentrations of those gains, like in Herefordshire, like in Suffolk, that sets us up very well for challenging for those parliamentary seats when it comes to the general election. But do you deny, though, that sometimes you are taking seats because the other parties have stood back because there is this notion of a sort of progressive coalition, which some people in your, in your, in your party and the other smaller parties do want? Well, when Greens get elected onto councils, we do believe in a collaborative approach to politics. And there's many councils around the country that are in no overall control and where Greens work um, collaboratively with other parties to make a real difference for their communities. And I think that's what people want from their politicians is for parties to come together on issues where they agree, but also be willing to challenge and stand up for their communities where they disagree. So Greens do believe in a collaborative, um, modern form of politics, but we also have something very different to offer to the electorate. Greens work incredibly hard in their local communities, bring a fresh voice from the tired Westminster parties. And people are voting for fairer, greener communities in ever greater numbers because they see the policies that we're offering locally, whether that's on housing, on planning, on transport, are going to make a real difference to their everyday lives in their local communities. But we heard earlier from a Conservative councillor who said he'd lost his seat because Labour and the Lib Dems stood back so that the Greens had a proper go of beating them. So you're reliant on other parties clearing the way for you. That you could ask that question of any party under the voting system we have where it's first past the post. Inevitably, parties will concentrate their resources in some areas more than others because you have to get the most votes in any one ward in order to win. All parties do that under the voting system that we have. And what we're seeing is increasing numbers of wards and councils around the country where the Greens are winning first place, often by some really big majorities as people are choosing positively to vote for Greens. And you have to remember that, as you say, this isn't a, a one-off by any means. We've had Green councillors around the country for for many years, many decades in some areas. And over the last four years, the number of places with green councils has grown. And what you see repeatedly around the country where we make that breakthrough is people really like what they see with having a green voice on the council and for their community, and then vote for green councillors in ever greater numbers. So this time, for example, where we've seen in places like Worcester, where we topped the poll across the whole council area, we made four gains, three gains in South Tyneside, People have liked what they've seen with Green councillors and are voting for it in ever greater numbers. Adrian Ramsey, co-leader of the Greens, thank you very much indeed for giving us your time. Well, unbelievably, it's nearly five to five. Time has been whizzing by because there's been so much interesting to talk about. Um, let's talk to our panel as we run up to the news. Um, firstly to you, uh, Lord Fox, it was really interesting hearing Adrian Ramsey there talk about these I think he doesn't want to admit that there's pacts happening on the ground. Now, whether they're formal or not, we did. We heard it from Worcester. Uh, we heard it from the ground that the Lib Dems and Labour stood back in order that the Greens could beat him in Worcester. The Greens 
We, we know, you know, from hearing from the ground from our colleagues around the country that there have been areas where people have stood back. Now, is that something that the Lib Dems should do on a national level? Before I answer that, can I just put Rita on a warning to get her yellow highlighter out? Because we've held uh, Hinckley and Bosworth and we've held uh, Bath and North East Somerset, uh, which I remind you covers the re-smog territory. So uh, more, more, more yellow required shortly. Um, I was fighting in Windsor this morning. Uh, my ward, which I've been delivering in, in Liberal Democrat manner, there were, Liberal, there were Liberal Democrat candidates, there were Green candidates. We will win that ward and it will cease to be a Conservative ward. And we're seeing swings of 26% and more across, across, across Windsor. That is how the election process works in most seats across the country. Everybody feels their candidates and the, and the voters decide who to vote for. And I'm kind of old fashioned and that's the sort of thing that I, 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 I prefer. Is there a case, though, for some form of progressive alliance? I mean, there is a, always a lot of chatter about this. And there are some people in Westminster who would like it to happen, think it makes sense. They may well be. Um, but I think when you're fighting on the ground, when you're um, out there, I think voters need to be given the information. The information needs to be correct, exact and not exaggerated. And they need to make the decisions themselves. I think they're quite capable of working out what they want. And they're quite capable. Voters are smart. And voters can choose who, who they want to beat the people that they want to beat. You're and right. I think that's the way you go about it. There isn't a full <coughs> slate of candidates from all the parties, can there? That's the well, point. Well, I think, I think that's what I just said. Um, Hugh Merriman, Transport Minister, welcome. Thank you. Um, it's not a good night at all for your party. We've seen Stoke in the last few minutes Beaming smiles from Labour there. You can't afford to lose that kind of seat, can you? Difficult night, uh, and it may get more difficult uh, as the hours progress. I mean, I do note, looking at the data, that I think we lost one seat in Stoke and the other nine uh, were formerly independents, uh, may have gone back to Labour. So it's important to actually look at the data as well. But um, obviously that's uh, a disappointment. We want to hold our, our councils, and I'm obviously really sorry having been a Conservative District Councillor in the past myself for all of my colleagues uh, who will not succeed this evening. I'm just coming back to the point that was made uh, on PACs. I think Peter will, will know as well that there was a pact between the Lib Dems and the Greens in Lewis and Brighton, as mm. I recall, the last election where I think uh, there wasn't, right. wasn't a standing. I'm pretty sure that was right. So we have seen it before. And what I tend to find is that in my patch, you tend to find that there's a sort of anti-house building um, campaign that goes on, it tends to either be the sort of beneficiary of Greens or Liberal Democrats. So it does tend to be a sort of midterm protest to some of the policies that uh, we're trying to seek to deliver and maybe that sort of there isn't enough warmth for the Labour Party. So. You raise housing there though and actually we've heard from counts around the country that um, voters have raised housing and voters have raised their frustrations with housing and there are people in your party who might fall under that anti-house building category that you've just mentioned. And for many people voting, that may well have been one of the issues they've looked at and thought, you know what, in 13 years, I've heard conservative politicians say again and again, we need to build more houses and I cannot afford to buy a house. And your party, your prime minister, dropped the targets recently that was meant to make that happen. Yeah, it's interesting because I've welcomed Rishi Sunak to my constituency uh, during the leadership uh, process and we and talked you were about part housing. Of his campaign. Yeah, we talked about housing actually with the leader of our council, and uh, you know we were sort of putting forward proposals uh, where there would be, uh, you know, for for council areas where you've already granted planning applications, but they those have not turned into housing, uh, then that would actually be a bar towards more uh, planning applications being made. And I think we were interested in some sort of radical reform. Some of it is making its way through in terms of legislation. But I think the most important part is to not force targets onto local areas, but to actually have a sort of bottom-up approach. That's very much Michael Gove's uh, plan. And I look at it through my own brief with railways. We're, we're working with the department to say, right, where are the railways going? That's where the house building should go and vice versa. So I think that's a sort of smart government that the electors expect from us because it's then joined up. And we have got more to deliver on that front. I readily admit that. And what do you have to change then? If this is the scale of defeat that we think it might be based on the current numbers, what needs to change? Well, this obviously is the first opportunity the electorate have had to actually give their view on what's been going on over a period of time. And we have obviously made our change. 
Uh, we have a change in leader and prime minister. And it looks and like certainly they don't like I was, it very much. Well, I think it, we expected the public to actually take out their frustrations on what happened last year. Um, we have already pivoted and turned. Um, and when I was talking to my constituents on the doorsteps yesterday, um, they were talking about older news, about former prime ministers, but saying your current leader seems to have what it takes. He seems to be turning things around for us. But this is the opportunity for the electorate to give their verdict on where we've been previously. So and we understand Boris that. Johnson and Liz Truss's <clears throat> fault then. That's what's coming through. Well, certainly on the doorsteps, uh, the feedback I got was that we are in a better place. The polls show that as well. People are reacting uh, in a more positive way towards Rishi Sunak. I think importantly, they respect the way that he manages the country and the economy as a result through that. And I think, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we're in the process now of trying to persuade the electorate uh, that we will turn matters around, we will deliver. But it's fair to say that until we've delivered on the sort of five key pledges the Prime Minister's made, we know the electorate are not going to listen as intently to us until that time. So, so we've got to prove to them. Listening. We have to prove to them that we can deliver what they want us to deliver. And only then will they then listen to us uh, and give us the opportunity to go even further. And we know that and we're, we're humble about it. And that's why I'm sorry about the losses, because they are in the backdrop of what's occurred before. OK, well, we will have plenty more from you shortly, but we're going to go to the news in a second. But before we go to hear the headlines from Let's Me, I want to show you our tallies, where they are, our big numbers. And the numbers are racking up now as we head towards our last hour together on this programme. You can see Labour have gained 78 councils, councillors, 78 councils, that would be quite something. The Conservatives have lost 107, the Liberal Democrats have gained 30 and the Greens we were just hearing from have gained a dozen so far. A lot to come as the headlines of this first cycle of counting of the elections of 2023 comes to a conclusion. The first cycle, plenty more to come tomorrow of course. Let's head now though to the news with Lutzmi Gopal. Laura, thank you. Hello, here's your BBC News summary. Labour and the Liberal Democrats have been taking council seats from the Conservatives in England's local elections. Labour have taken control of Plymouth and Stoke-on-Trent, two of their top targets. They've also replaced the Conservatives as the largest party in Hartlepool, although the authority remains under no overall control. Our political correspondent, Jonathan Blake, has more. Celebration in Stoke-on-Trent. Seat by seat, councillors are finding out their fate. Here, it's Labour that are making gains. Ballots are being counted in some of the 200 or so towns, cities and rural areas across England where voters have had their say on who should run local services. The Tories have had a tough night, hoping to limit their losses, but they've seen control of several councils slip away. Brentwood in Essex was an early loss for the Conservatives here and elsewhere. It's the Lib Dems who are cheering the loudest. Fantastic result for the Liberal Democrats in one of the safest Tory seats in the country. Uh, we've gained three seats, um, we're now up to 17 seats and uh, the council moves into an overall control and uh, it's a time of change in Brentwood and we're really delighted, it's fantastic news. Labour have taken significant steps forward, gaining dozens of seats from the Conservatives and winning control of Plymouth Council. The city's Tory MP accepted his party was being punished. Look, it's been uh, a really terrible night for us here in Plymouth. I think uh, there's a number of factors at play. I think locally it's been very difficult. Uh, the Conservative group here uh, has been through a very difficult time. Uh, we've seen that reflected on the doors in the campaign and we've seen that reflected in the... Uh, results tonight but you know we take it on the chin. In a first for elections in England, photo ID was required at polling stations which left some unable to vote but it's too soon to say what impact the change has had. Only around a quarter of the councils holding elections are counting votes overnight so early results won't give anything like the full picture but in the hours ahead these local elections will be closely watched as a crucial test of the national political picture. Jonathan Blake, BBC News. And of course, all the local results will be available online. To find out who won in your local area, you can use our postcode checker, available on the BBC News website and on our app. 
We will be back in an hour with the latest news updates. But for now, it's back to our special election night coverage with Laura. And just to remind you to see who won in your local area, you can use our postcode checker, which is available on the BBC News website and on our app. And welcome back to election 2023, the BBC News coverage of 230 council elections that took place in England when millions of people had the chance to go out and cast their vote. The first vote of its kind on Rishi Sunak and his time in office. So let's look at what's happened so far. Well, not good news for the Prime Minister. He's 124 seats down. You can see all oh, the numbers spinning through 126 changing as we watch. Uh, Labour gaining 83 seats. We've seen plenty of Labour smiles around the country tonight. And the Liberal Democrats also very pleased with what they have seen so far. Up 34, taking gains in places they thought they would do well, but also doing better in some parts of the country where they were fighting than they might have expected and hopeful of making more gains. And to summarise at this stage where we can make some assessments, not firm conclusions, but some assessments, it looks so far like a very, very difficult night for the Conservatives, potentially losing more than a thousand council seats, which would be a poor, poor local election performance, perhaps worse than Theresa May's dark days at the end of her premiership. A step forward for Keir Starmer's Labour Party with gains in the kinds of parts of the country where they want to see them, but perhaps not a significant leap towards power that would have silenced perhaps some of those who grumble in his party that he's not quite radical enough. And for the Liberal Democrats so far, well, a pretty healthy set of numbers at this stage. But we should remember there are still the majority of results to come in, so it's important not to draw concrete, firm conclusions, but we can talk about the assessments that we can make so far. Two final reminders, elections are not happening everywhere in the country. There are none in Scotland, none in Wales, not happening in Northern Ireland until a couple of weeks time. And the last time these seats were all fought was in 2019. In May 2019, under Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn and Vince Cable, a completely different political universe. But let's pick up on one of the things that has happened tonight. Now, we've talked quite a bit about Medway Council. We've been there on the ground hearing about what's going on. It looks like Labour is going to take that from the Conservatives. That, I think, is better than they'd expected. They were hoping for gains, but it sounds like they're actually going to take the Council. And we can talk to Alan Jarrett, who is the Conservative leader of Medway Council, perhaps the outgoing leader. Mr Jarrett, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Are you sure now of the result? Yes, pretty sure, Laura, because um, although we haven't had many um, seats declared, walls declared, it, it's quite obvious from the counting that um, Labour will form the next administration and uh, we will bring to the end of uh, 23 years of Conservative administration in Medway, which obviously we're disappointed about and sad about. Why do you think that's happened? I think there's two, two factors at play. We've had extensive boundary changes here and what we've seen is where there's been major boundary, boundary changes, uh, Labour has been the beneficiary of virtually all of those. And, and of course there's a relative uh, unpopularity of some of the government decisions. I think those two things uh, have created a perfect storm here in Medway and uh, uh, hence where we're going to be. Which of those decisions have been unpopular for your residents? Uh, certainly, certainly the housing targets that we've seen centrally imposed um, has not, not played well. We've had unrealistic and excessive housing targets and, uh, and that has been, um, certainly in parts of Medway, the major factor. And in terms of other things on Rishi Sunak's list, you know, he came in trying to calm things down, trying to turn things around. But from voters that you spoke to through the course of the campaign, you said they're frustrated about housing targets being imposed on the area. But what else have they made of Rishi Sunak's effort to calm things down? You can just hear a huge cheer. I don't know if that's the overall result being confirmed, Mr Jarrett, or if it's just another ward being announced. 
and another cheer. We're just watching, well, we're just listening to what's well, happening at Medway Council. Gareth, Richard Mighton, Labour and Cooperative Party, 1577. So while we wait for the Gloria cheers to blessing. subside, Just it sounds very Kapora, much like Labour has Gloria taken Lea. control of Medway Council. At least that's the impression we are getting, and that's the prediction of Alan Jarrett, who we can probably hear a bit better now. I mean, Rishi Sunak's supporters, yes. the minister here in the studio, would say, look, he's turned things around, he's stopped the rot, people just need a bit more time to understand what he's trying to do. Do you feel optimistic that that can happen? Sorry, Laura. Perhaps and I we might come back to you in a second or two. Shall we do that? I'm just going to show Gareth you something that's happened in Hartsmere Council. Now, this is another Hertfordshire Council and another one that the Conservatives have lost. Two seats still to declare, but the Conservatives on 15, Labour on 13, the Liberal Democrats on 9. Let's look at why they have lost. Six new seats for Labour six new seats for the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives losing a dozen seats. Now Hartsmere again, that is one of the parts of the country. Commuter belt, people able to get in and out of London relatively easily, relatively affluent. That also is the seat of Oliver Dowden who is the Deputy Prime Minister. It's the council of his, the local authority area of the second most senior Conservative in the land now. The Conservatives have held that council since 1999. They had a big majority and they might have expected to make some losses, but they would have not have been expecting to lose that council. So we'll pick up on Hartsmere perhaps in a few minutes. Let's just see if the cheers have subsided at Medway Council for the Labour Party and see if we can talk again to Alan Jarrett. Alan, you're, thank you for bearing with us and you're managing to look cheerful in these circumstances. Um, we've just heard another council go, Hartsmere in Hertfordshire, along with yours, you expect in Medway. Plymouth going as well, Stoke going as well. How bad do you think this suggests things are for your party? Well, Laura, it, 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 clearly it's not. It's, it, it, clearly it's not great. Is it? Very disappointed. Very disappointed for the people of Medway, and we will have to see how that plays out over the next year, eighteen months, as we move towards a general election. What do you think it will mean, though, for those Conservative MPs in your part of the world? I think there are three Tory MPs along Medway, Tracy Crouch, former sports minister, uh, Raymond Tishti we were talking to earlier, and Kelly Tolhurst, um, also a member of the government. Do you think their seats are now at risk because of that shift away from you? Well, you see, the, the problem is, Laura, they have big majorities and very popular, but of course, what we have is the activists on the ground, the elected uh, councillors, are the bedrock of the support that, around which the campaigns are built. And any diminution of uh, uh, local representation has a negative effect. So we will continue to work hard to support the MPs and expect them to continue to support us. But it's not the best grounding, is it, Laura, Ladies for the general election to come? Do you think that Rishi Sunak has a chance of turning it round? Uh, yes, obviously a chance, but um, it's, it's, it's looking a bit gloomy this evening, isn't it? Um, we've got to, got to stay positive, got to stay cheerful as we can, um, and continue to work hard to um, uh, represent, represent the people that have, have elected us um, and do all we can for them. Okay, Alan Jarrett, thank you very much indeed for sharing our thoughts. Well, you've got. Labour activists cheering behind you. Um, it's good of you to give us your time. Um, Hugh Merriman, I mean, when you hear someone like that, clearly who's given a huge amount to your party, given a huge amount to the public, and but he's laying it on the mess that there's been at Westminster. Do you feel embarrassed? I feel really sorry for Alan and his colleagues. Um, they've held Medway for some time. And has he... As he said, there's been a concerted campaign, particularly around house building. You can probably see that around Hartsmere as well. Um, it's very difficult because as a government, we have to deliver the homes that people need. And I feel really passionate about that. And every incoming government will have to have that policy. But of course, people don't necessarily want them in their area. And I think that's where there's been a lot of pushback and we've suffered 
uh, but I do believe it's the right thing to do to build homes that people so what, need. So are you blaming NIMBYs for um, you losing no, no, seats? No, I'm not at all, actually. And I said earlier to you that uh, we have to uh, reflect on, on what we have uh, delivered in terms of performance over last year. That should be um, you know, our driving force to turn things around and make it better, that we do understand what's happened, that we do understand that the voters uh, have their first opportunity to judge us, uh, and they're not judging us particularly well. Um, so that should be our motivating force, uh, to be humble about it, to turn it round, uh, to show that we're listening. But any government will have difficult choices, and building the homes that people need, particularly young people, to give them the same chance that older people have, like me, uh, or had, um, that's so important if we're to actually continue to sort of ensure that younger voters support us as well. So um, I do feel for councillors who've lost their seats. I've been a district councillor. I know how important the role is. Uh, and I feel really sorry for what's happened. And if it's happened because of government decisions, then I feel, feel even more sorry for those people. I know there you use the word reflect. And reflect is often political code for saying, yeah, maybe we've got some things wrong. Well, I think we did get things wrong last year. I mean, I was looking at John... Redwood's uh, encouragement in terms of what we should do. And actually, when we well, did that... Well, let's show um, that to people. I was just about to do that, but you've, you've, you've captured it off my screen. I've seen, it, seen um, things like that from him before. Well, well, so John Redwood, who, of course, is a long-serving Conservative MP on the right of the party economically, um, a minister some time ago. Um, he's written on social media, if the Prime Minister wants to win back lost Conservative voters, he should try offering some Conservative policies. Cut taxes get better value for state spending, and go for growth. Now, you are a Conservative government with the highest tax burden that people are having to pay for many, 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 many years. By some measure, it's, it's sort of the highest it's ever been, not in wartime. There's clearly frustration on the Conservative benches about that. We know that. But maybe that's also what some people around the country are looking at and thinking, I'm not having a great time, and I'm blaming you for it. Well, I would just reflect that we did try some of those policies uh, when Liz Trust came in, and it didn't end well because the markets were spooked. Uh, because if you look at the total level of our borrowing and our debt, it's too high, uh, and we can't afford that. And again, actually, it falls, the burden falls on the youngest, uh, who I've just talked about in terms of needing homes as well. So, but you know lots um, of your colleagues would love to see a tax cut, an income tax cut, perhaps of one or two pence, maybe not the kind of hugely radical thing that Liz Trust tried to do at speed... Do you think you might end up having to do that? We know Rishi we Sunak would, wants to look, do it before the election We would election love to anyway. do that. It's we've always been the party of cutting taxes, but we've also been the party uh, that's proclaimed responsible financial management. And at this time, when we are having to spend money, uh, the COVID years where we had to inject huge amounts of support in, energy support still going on, we have to make choices. And the choices are either to support people in these challenging times uh, or to reduce, reduce taxation. We hope that once we're over... Uh, the problem with energy spikes, for example, then we can reduce taxes. But you can only do that if you manage the economy sensibly. And we've seen the sort of dash for uh, change uh, last year, and we mm. saw what happened to the markets. Uh, and when the Conservative Party loses the markets, then we'll end up losing the electorate. Um, and so I'm conscious that the decisions we're making now, uh, and of course we test those with the people. The five priorities the Prime Minister has are the people's priorities, and we've got to deliver on those. If we do, people start listening to us again, and that's where I hope that they'll trust us again and we'll be able to deliver into the future. Peter, what do you make of all of that? Uh, well, I think it's quite extraordinary because what we see is, is an unstable government. We talk about planning. We've had three planning bills uh, in the last five years. Uh, Hugh says that he wants a bottom-up approach to planning. Well, we've had a bottom-up approach. We've had a top-down approach. We had, before the top-down approach, we had a bottom-up approach because all the different bills take different approaches. We've had targets and then we've had the targets dropped. So you understand that this complete change, and that's just planning, then we've had the, the hole blown in our economy by the mini-budget last year, for which the public have not forgiven. Because Hugh references the, uh, the reputation that the Tories once had, or at times have claimed to have, for responsible governing of our finances. Well, that's just shot to pieces at the moment. So whether it's planning, whether it's the economy, whether it's running our public services with 7.5 million people waiting for treatment on the NHS, these are all things that touch people's lives in a meaningful way. So right through this evening, you have seen the two words, the two phrases, bad night for the Tories, a good night for Labour, whether that's in Stoke, whether that's up in Hartlepool, whether that's in Teesside, right down through to Plymouth. Tomorrow, we're going to get through down to Dover and see what's happening in Brighton and Hove and Crawley and the rest of the southeast. And the reason is that we have a credible alternative. 
because there is lots of parties out there that are standing. It doesn't have to be coming back to Labour. They could be going to lots of other parties, but the majority are coming back to Labour as a credible alternative. And that's why we're getting it right in the south, in the north, in leave areas, in remain areas. We are uniting our country once again based on a, on a positive vision for a better Britain going forward. That brings hope to people, and that's what people but want. But what we must also remind viewers, the speed of Tory losses could slow down in the next Indeed, few hours yeah. and tomorrow. The speed of Labour gains could slow down, or it could go the other way. I know I keep doing it, doing the health warning, but this story and the narrative could yet switch, and perhaps switch quite dramatically, although from what we have seen tonight, the trend is pretty clear. Um, Chris, when you think about the results that we have seen so far and the Liberal Democrats progress in lots of places. What surprised you? Well, that actually you were just talking through the Hartsmere result and getting plus six there is a great result for the for, for the local campaigners there. And I'm very I'm really pleased for all of our local campaigners who've really worked their socks off all over the country, up and down the, the, the country. And and the point that um, Chris Mason made earlier about the results we get today being a jumping off point for the general election is something that we really must remember because it's not just winning, it's where we win. Mm. And we're winning in the places we need to win. And we'll see later on today as the other results come through. I'm absolutely confident that we'll be notching, not least in John Redwood's seat in Wokingham, where that went to no overall control last year. And I expect further gains to, 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 to move it forward. Tell us, tell us then what that might mean then in terms of a, of a general election. And I know, you know, you were uh, chief executive of the party for, for some time, a very experienced campaigner. And you mentioned there those parts of the country, um, some people would call it the blue wall. It gives me another excuse to mention a Davies tractor driving through that blue wall. But these seats where the Lib Dems do have hope of taking from the Conservatives, from the results you've seen tonight, Put a number on that, what that might mean. Well, Laura, you, 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 you press edge this by saying I'm an experienced campaigner. <laughs> and I would, so experienced, I wouldn't even come close to answering that question. What I will say is that these are the results we needed to, to move from. Without, without the jumping off point that we, that we get through, through these really excellent results tonight, it would have made our job a heck of a lot harder. So... You know, the, those activists I just talked about, they can have their rest and they can, uh, they can uh, recharge the batteries, but we'll be out again and we'll be in the places where we've shown to the local electorate that we can win. We've shown that we are the party that can take on largely the Conservatives, but not always, mm. um, across the country in, in those seats. And that's where we'll will be making our making our taking our fight and, uh, and and working hard okay well let's see let's get back out around the country and i'm going to take you back to stoke and our um political editor in the west midlands lizzie glinko in front of some absolutely jubilant labor people there now we've talked a lot about stoke and we can see the celebrations going on give us a, a, a brief word on what you think happened there um but also if you can lizzie i'd love to know what else you're picking up from the other really crucial parts of the west midlands yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, jubilation. They are very, very happy here. I think what has happened on the ground is that the Labour message that they have been pushing here for the last few weeks of change, albeit that they've been out, you know, they haven't been running this council now since 2015, that message that we are change seems to have got through to voters. I would also say that actually we think turnout has been very low here in Stoke on Trent, so that is a kind of sobering element to it. But, you know, Labour took control of this council when they hit 23, that was 25, and they are saying to us now that they think they could potentially get to 26 or 27, which, you know, at the beginning of the night, if you'd said that to the Labour team here, they would have, you know, not, not necessarily taken you that seriously. They are really thrilled. And I think it kind of, you know, they have poured resources into Stoke-on-Trent. There have been MPs from all over the country, Keir Starmer, a lot of his top team here campaigning. And it seems, you know, it's paid off. They're very pleased about that. Looking at the rest of the region, of course, we don't have 
all the counts, the majority of our counts are happening later in the day, later on today. But from the ones that we've had, the limited picture that we have now, it does look like Labour have had a good night here in the Midlands. So not necessarily taking control of councils, but you know, pushing places like uh, Worcester, like Tamworth, no overall control, Labour consolidating their position, doing the same in places like Dudley, in Warsaw. These are all things that, uh, in Dudley rather, not in Warsaw yet, we don't know, they're counting tomorrow. Um, but these are all things that are positive signs for the Labour Party as they try to rebuild here in the Midlands. You know, after the last general election in 2019, apart from the urban centres in Birmingham, Black Country, Coventry, there's hardly any red left on the map hardly any red at all. So these sets of elections, if, if it carries on tomorrow, as we have seen this evening, that's a very positive sign for the Labour Party here in the Midlands. And just, Lizzie, briefly, again, just to go back to Stoke, lots of the losses there were the independents losing, which was a big part of the picture, not just Labour gaining, but also a big group yeah. of independents there. Just quickly, what's that all about? Who were they and what happened? Well, it's very interesting that the city independents have been a real force here in Stoke-on-Trent for several decades now. They've run this council. They ran it in coalition with the Conservatives between 2015 and 2019. I think what has happened is that some of the well-known local figures who were the leadership of that group have now kind of moved away. They've retired. They're no longer around. And it seems that those that those that are left haven't been able to kind of maintain the position that they've always had and they have faced a much stiffer challenge on the doorstep in places where I think some of these independents have felt for a long time quite secure, embedded in their communities. Labour, as we said, have poured in the resources, going door to door, leaflet drops, lots of big visits lots of attention and it seems that that has you know that's paid off because as i said at the beginning of the night the fear for labor here was that even if they did well it would be those independents who would prevent them from getting that victory they were craving well actually the conservatives took seats from the independents just as they took seats from the conservatives and so you'd have to say that the resources they put in here you know it has worked out for them okay lizzie thank you very much indeed let's take you then a bit north and a bit to the right, I suppose to the east I should say, if we're talking about the map. Um, let's go to my colleague Tim Iredale who knows all about the east of England. I think, Tim, you're in Scunthorpe for us in North East Lincolnshire. Um, what, North I am Lincolnshire. Laura Scunthorpe in North Lincolnshire. Yes. Now there are two councils, confusingly, one called North Lincolnshire and one called North East Lincolnshire and it's 528. So forgive me for getting them the wrong way round. What has happened there? And I'd also like you to tell us about what happened in Hull because we talked earlier in the night about the Lib Dems holding it. Okay, Laura, the situation here is it's nip and tuck at the moment. The last few council seats will be declared very shortly. Labour and the Conservatives are pretty much level pegging here, and that mirrors the electoral history of this council because it's flip-flopped over the years between Labour and the Tories. It's been Conservative since 20. 11. Now, a lot of people w would say this is the kind of area Labour needs to win uh, if it's going to win back you know, the, the red wall seats you've been talking about all night. Because at the heart of this council area is, is the town of Scunthorpe, which went Conservative for the first time in many years back in 2019. But it, it looks like the Conservatives at this moment in time are more confident of retaining control of North Lincolnshire, but it will be very close. Now, uh, across the Humber estuary from here, uh, we had a result a little earlier. The Lib Dems uh, held on to Hulls, increased their majority in the city. Now, that was uh, a council they won last year from Labour with a slim majority. I think Labour will uh, be disappointed not to have made some headway in Hull, an area they've always uh, thought of really as one of their heartlands. Tim, thank you very much indeed for joining us. So not always one-way traffic. So you do see trends, you do see things 
becoming the fashion of the night, but it's absolutely not all one-way traffic ever in any election. And a couple of people who know about those are Katie Bowles, who's the deputy political editor of The Spectator, and also Freddie Hayward, who writes for The New Statesman. Uh, welcome to both of you. Um, Katie, from your reading of what we know so far, how worried will Tory HQ be? I mean, I think it's looking bad, ultimately. Um, we've had lots of expectation management in advance. I think what's worrying for the Conservatives and the figures at CCHQ is you are hearing figures such as John Curtis, of course, saying it's, it's not impossible that Tories do lose close to 1,000 seats. Now, when the Tory party chairman, Greg Hans, was saying that on the airwaves, uh, it was largely because uh, they did not think they would lose 1,000 seats. And they're trying to set it to a point that if you got less than that, you could, let, you could then spin it as, oh, we didn't do as badly as you expect. So I, I think it'll be worrying that that is a figure being talked about still by pollsters. Obviously, it's still very early on in the e uh, early on in terms of the results, there's lots more to come. But I think the other aspect that's going to worry Tory MPs and, of course, Tory councillors is the fact that, um, you know, they're being squeezed from different sides here. So you have Labour uh, making gains, but also if you look at Hertzmere, so uh, the Deputy Prime Ministers, uh, uh, I see Oliver Dowden, and the fact that the Tories have lost control of their council and, from to the, and that's a blue wall Lib Dem push. Uh, look what's happening in Windsor. It's adding to the sense of, you know, where are the Tories particularly safe? And I think that's that's going to um, cause some anxiety to the fact that it's coming from different areas at the moment. And, and just as we're talking, another Conservative Council lost, this time East Lindsay, the biggest town there, Skegness. Um, and that's a Conservative loss there. Now, that's an area with very strong Conservative representation. It's been Tory since 2015. So it'll be interesting to see how that result breaks down. Let's take a quick look. Uh, 26 seats for the Conservatives, 21 independents. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and the change of seats, Tories losing three and the independents gaining three. But another Conservative council actually being lost to them. Um, Freddie, let's think about Labour for a second. How would you predict the conversation in the party will go in the next few days if these trends continue? So, you know, good step forward, but maybe not giant decisive leaps yeah, I think what we're seeing so far is basically that the polls have been broadly correct. I mean, as Katie said, we've got a long way to go, but I think Labour will be broadly happy with some of the gains they've made. They had to make gains in the Red Wall in places like Stoke. But what they'll be looking for is making gains elsewhere because they need to go beyond what they did in 2017. They can't just regain uh, the Red Wall if they really want to get a majority at the next general election. They have to make gains elsewhere. That's why places like Worcester are really important. Uh, but some other interesting trends as well is you know Labour doing quite well in terms of Brexit voters in certain leave areas they're also doing quite well with non-graduates so these are some of the key uh, constituents that propelled Boris Johnson into number 10 in 2019 and I think Labour will be happy that they're making some progress there. Freddie and Katie political editor of The Spectator and Freddie of The New Statesman political magazine thank you both very much for joining us at this late hour. Let's now talk to one of the probable winners of the night, Vince Maple. Good evening. Good morning, Vince. You're the Labour yeah, good group night. leader good in night. Medway. Yeah. Can you Each confirm that you are going to become leader of the council from Simon the results Michael we've heard Curry so far? Cooperative well, party seven nights. well, good morning, Laura from Medway. Uh, at this stage, we haven't had all the results in yet. But from what we've so, um, seen, we've won wards we were targeting, cost, working hard in, and we believe Labour that we're going to have a pretty seismic result here in Medway. We've never had, in the history of Medway Council, a Labour majority Once controlled mean, council. Gandhi, we think we're on target Gandhi, for that as we stand here. But of course, we've got to wait for every vote to be counted. Your Conservative op Mariana, opponent, though, Lama, told us he was pretty sure they're not going to be the biggest group. You are. And he told us he thought it was because of boundary changes and housing targets. Now, is that why you think you're probably going to win? Green Party 174. Well, look, I think we've won because we've had a, an amazing campaign, actually. We've worked hard day in, day out as opposition councillors. Brilliant candidates. We've had great support from the party, both regionally, locally and nationally. Keir Starmer's been down twice. We've had a number of front bench uh, people come and support us on the doorsteps. And actually the reaction from people on the doorsteps was they were pleased to see those um, Westminster uh, individuals come down and support the team here in Wendway. They know that when they have Labour councillors, we deliver for them. And tonight it looks as if, and again, we don't have all the results yet, but it looks as if Medway residents are going to choose change by choosing Labour. What were you hearing on the doorsteps, though, Councillor Maple? Was it 
enthusiasm for your campaign or also frustration with what's happened in the last 12 months? I, I think a bit of both. So I was speaking to people for a 90 year old in Strood who has voted Conservative for 70 years. He lent us his vote this week. That gives, it's pretty humbling, actually, to hear that. We've got people voting for the very first time, choosing to vote Labour. And that's a combination of a poor services delivered by here, the, the Conservative Council. Uh, we know that if we do have the opportunity to serve, we're inheriting a financial mess. But also, that's not the only financial mess. It's the one that we saw last year, particularly from Liz Truss. Again, I've been speaking to homeowners uh, in Medway who are paying hundreds of pounds a month more on their mortgage. So it's a combination of all of those things, as is often the case in, in local elections. Of course, we put forward our pledges. They're deliverable and achievable. But some people will be looking, of course, at the national programme. And again, when Keir Starmer was here, when we took him out in Gillingham, the reaction, people were pulling up to chat to him. People can see positive change. The like we haven't seen here in Medway since we won those three seats back in 1997 and, of course, held them throughout those 13 years. Councillor Maple, thank you very much indeed. And we will keep you posted if we get official confirmation of what we think has happened in Medway. Chris, one of those maybe, you know, names of the night, you know, Medway, Plymouth, yep. Stoke, yep. certainly still with tons more to come. But certainly this first episode of these election results, Labour feeling very cheerful. Yeah, so we've had about a fifth now, I think, of mm. the of the results. So there's still one heck of a long way to go. The night might be old, but the day is young. But yeah, there are plenty of places, crucial places, geographically important places that Labour are able to point to where they are winning, where they absolutely have to be winning if they're going to win those seats come a general election and try and assemble a majority given where they start out uh, from. Loads more results still to come. What's quite striking is, is that in the build-up to tonight, today, mm. whatever we're going to call it, there was a sense from some in the Labour Party that they may only be able to point to what they would see as significant progress once we got well into Friday mm. rather than at half past five uh, in the morning. In other words, they had a sense, and who knows whether this turns out to be true or not, <laughs> but they had a sense as things started out that things might get progressively better for them as Friday went on and that things to the Conservatives might look more bleak. And yet here we are at sort of half five in the morning and, and th the clear thing is, is that the Conservatives have had a pretty miserable night so far, Labour doing uh, relatively well and the Liberal Democrats wearing wearing very big smiles. And just in terms of councils changing hands, I think we're now the tally, the Conservatives, I think, have lost control of five. Labour have gained control of two. Yeah, we haven't yet seen any direct switches from control from one mm. party to control to another. So they've all they've been going in and out of either no overall control mm -hmm. to a political party mm -hmm. or from that to no overall control. And if the Medway result comes through, as it might do, that would be, I think, the first one of those of the night. Let's go to our panel as we are now unbelievably started to wing our way to the end of our time together. Um, Hugh Merriman, I, I want to come back to something that you said before, that you would reflect on the results. Um, do you anticipate that you will change anything as a result of the evidence that's come from real votes, real voters, not national opinion polls? Do you think Rishi Sunak will look at these results and think, you know what, maybe I do need to tweak some of my plans? Well, I believe we already have, but I also recognise that this is the... In the middle of the night. That this is the... No, I mean, w from October when we had a change of leader. But I also recognise that we changed our leader and therefore the Prime Minister three times in a year. Mm. And this is the first opportunity the electorate have had to give their verdict on that. Uh, and it has not gone well so far. But, but I also believe that the policies that he has put in place are the policies that the voters I speak to on the doorsteps want from their government. So I think the test now is for us to be competent, for us to be united, and for us to start delivering on those pledges. And then the electorate will listen to us. They will take us seriously again. And I believe they'll give us a chance because I don't believe they're sold on Keir Starmer. There are a lot of um, sort of don't knows out there right now that have perhaps sort of fallen out of love with us, but they certainly haven't fallen in love with Labour in the way that we saw under Tony Blair in 1997. I think these results, because they're going Lib Dem in some parts, independent some parts, Labour some parts, it doesn't tell me that everyone is shifting towards the Labour Party. It tells me that people 
are frustrated with our performance, and I believe that we've now got it within us to turn it around. But do you honestly feel, sorry, <coughs> you feel uh, more or less confident about your prospects at the general election as a result of what we've seen tonight? Well, obviously, this is a, the wake-up call, but I always expected this because this was the first opportunity the electorate have had uh, to give their verdict on our performance. And we've been in power 13 years. We had a really challenging le- year last year, and we changed our leader three times. Of course, the except, public are going to give their v- that, verdict Mr. on that. Except that, Hugh. Rishi Sunak has had, you know, six or seven months. Some of the tone of what you're saying is kind of as if he took over last week. You know, people have had a fair amount of time now to have a good look at him. He hasn't just moved into number 10. And you're sort of saying, well, I think that voters will come back and see what we're doing is the right thing, rather than you saying, oh, maybe we should listen to them. Look, we do listen to to the voters, but my point is that this is the first opportunity the the electorate have had to give their verdict on our performance. We've been in power for 13 years. Last year was a terrible year. I do believe, though, and you look at the the opinion uh, poll, They've really cut through in terms of his performance. He outperforms us all. Uh, and I think, you know, he's our asset. And so as far as I'm concerned, it's all about delivery now. And to a certain extent, I know I'm talking here, but we public have had enough talk. They actually want delivery and they want us to turn it around. And I believe under him, uh, we are doing so and we will do so. Peter. Keir Starmer launched our campaign in Medway. We've won Medway. Keir Starmer visited Stoke twice. We've won Stoke. You know, Keir Starmer has been down in Dover. Let's see how Dover goes tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to places that the Labour Party has not succeeded in for, for two decades. You know, in Medway, that, that has been a Tory council for 20 years. It's got three Tory uh, uh, MPs. Stoke has got three Tory MPs. You know, these are areas we're making strides in. Uh, I noticed the, the chart where uh, the, the, the national share has gone up for Labour, one percentage point in the last 45 minutes. I think you two need to stop using this language of a, of, of a step but not a leap uh, and start moving towards a leap because we have taken a, a we, we have really moved forward tonight and Keir Starmer's fingerprints are o- all over the gains that we have made. I think that there is something happening out there that is not being reflected in the narrative that's emerging because Labour is doing incredibly well. One fifth of all of the seats that are up for election in this election have been called tonight and Labour is 100 seats up. Uh, the Tories are, are what, you know, all, all, already almost 200 down. So I think this is a really good, solid performance for the Labour Party tonight. It's encouraging. It shows that we're targeting right. We're getting the messaging right centrally and locally. We're getting organ- our organisational act is getting together. The Labour Party is back in business. We're moving forward and hopefully we're moving towards government. Chris, do you recognise that? Do you think Peter is giving an accurate re- reflection of what you've heard? Well, I think we, we, we move in different circles because I think where I've been campaigning is where we're winning and, and, and Labour generally isn't. So I'm, I'm, I know he's an honourable man and I'm sure, and, and I'm sure he <laughs> means what he says. Um, I mean, I, I'm also very impressed with Hugh's Um, chutzpah I think really I I mean he he talks about being on a course and it's all kind of back in track but what are we on a course for when when the deputy governor of the Bank of England tells the the people of the United Kingdom that they have to accept that they're poorer and even if you factor in public sector pay increases they are poorer and they will still be poorer in a year's time when we have the election the GPQs will be longer than they are now and the rivers will, will have more sewage in them then than, the, 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 than they have now. So what are we on course for? And I think that that is what people are telling us, whether they're telling Labour, Labour campaigners or Liberal Democrat campaigners or other campaigners, that's what they, in their hearts, they see. They know that they're poorer. They know that the health service is absolutely against a wall. And they know that mismanagement of things like the environment spell real problems for them and their children. And that's what we're seeing. OK, all three of you, thank you very much indeed for now. Let's go quickly to another couple of keen observers of the political scene. Alita Adu, who's a political correspondent from The Guardian, and Henry Zeffman, who is from The Times. Thanks both for being with us. Um, if you're writing your headlines for tomorrow, or maybe you know what they already are, or headlines for today, I should say, what would they be, Alita? 
Well, I must say, Laura, I was just really struck hearing uh, Hugh describing the situation that the Tories have found themselves in this morning. Obviously, it's very early for us to be drawing you know, some very big conclusions as you know, our headline writers are desperate to at the moment. But, <laughs> I mean, it's as if you know, the Tories haven't been in power for 13 years. And as was rightly pointed out, Rishi Sunak has had at least a six-month stretch to really show that he is the competent and uniting leader that the Tories needed. Unfortunately, you know, throughout the night, we've heard from a lot of ousted uh, council leaders, like the one from War Worcester, who is highlighting the fact that, you know, the, the drama of the, the Tory party that's going on in Westminster, you know, the, the chaos of Boris Johnson, more chaos from, from Liz Truss, and yet another Tory leader is something that kept cropping up on the doorsteps. And ultimately, you know, if we look at uh, areas like Plymouth, where Labour made huge gains also, I mean, we can't really, you know, you know, assume that that gain has been made simply because of the tree felling controversy. I mean, when I talk to activists, people are highlighting the fact that people have really struggled with a Plymouth cost of living crisis that is also being felt drastically across the country. Not to mention issues of voter ID where people feel as though the government has you know, suppressed their democracy, suppressed their right to vote, and that will automatically hit a number of ethnic minorities, you know, people of different uh, religions and races and so forth, because they simply don't have enough money to renew their ID. And this is all in the backdrop of a Conservative government, unfortunately. Uh, so I think Johnny Mercer earlier in the night was right to point out the fact that yes, it's a fight and the fight is on until the next election. And he seemed very keen to keep, you know, a conversation ongoing with his voters. You know, I hope that's something he's been doing, you know, way before polling day. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think the test is now on Keir Starmer and the Labour Party. Is he giving voters enough of a chance to prove that, oh, we're not just voting Labour, or the Lib Dems or the Green Party is some sort of tactical vote, but well, rather let's, because let's we put that believe to, in something else. Let's put that to Henry then. I mean, one of the uh, Tory leaders who lost tonight uh, told us he felt it was a protest vote. Do you think that's an accurate summation? It's definitely a protest vote. It's just a question of what they're protesting against. I mean, are they protesting against the last year of Conservative tumult, as Hugh Merriman uh, was arguing, or are they protesting against the last 13 years of Conservative government and saying they want uh, a Labour government afterwards? Um, I think there's plenty of grounds for optimism for Labour politicians from these results so far that the answer is the latter, and that this is a precursor to Labour getting into government uh, in a year or 18 month or so's time. Uh, I think, you know, we were expecting the better results for the Labour Party to come round about midday today, a bit later today, from the councils which start to count a bit later. But actually what seems to have happened is that the Labour Party has done better than they expected to overnight. And look, I think fundamentally, you know, you can get quite complicated about these things. Fundamentally, a terrible night for the Conservatives, which this is shaping up to be, is a good night for the Labour Party. Because uh, in the two-party system that, we've, that we have at Westminster, or two and a half parties, or however you want to put it, um, you know, if the Conservatives are losing support um, to the Lib Dems in, in the South and sort of commuter belt territory and to Labour, not just in the South West in Plymouth, but also in Stoke and the Midlands and other parts of the country, well, that is only going to uh, benefit the only other party that can form a government or can lead a government in Westminster, which is, of course, the Labour Party. Henry Zeffman and Elisa Adu, thank you very much indeed for waiting patiently and for speaking to us as we come to nearly 10 to 6 in the morning. Time to have a last check-in with Rita about something that we've been talking about on and off through the programme, how all the numbers from the net today and tomorrow will be fed into a huge, big projection of something really important, the projected national share. Take us through what you're seeing. This is the vote share over time, a projection based on the results that we have in now of how the parties are doing overall. It is, I hasten to say, a projection, but this is, if the direction of travel continues as it has done, this is where we are estimating the party's land. So Labour compared to last year, uh, really pretty much the same actually, just uh, a fraction of a percentage point up. The Conservatives down sharply, minus 5%, the Lib Dems up 1% and others up 
4%. Now, you might look at this and think, well, how is it then that the Labour Party has been picking up seats tonight? And that's because we have to compare their performance there to the performance four years ago, which is the last time that these seats were fought over. Uh, so it's that and also the fact that the Conservatives have dipped and where the Conservatives dip, the Labour Party is able to pick up more seats. But there is food for thought here for the Labour Party too. Um, not advancing much on last year is perhaps not an ideal scenario for them. And if you go back to 2012, you'll see here when Labour was led by Ed Miliband, actually they picked up a higher, they were higher up in the projected national share than they are now. Let's take one final look at the councils to watch. Uh, we started off with a very different screen, didn't we? But look at all the changes that have happened. The Conservatives have lost Brentwood, Northwest Leicestershire, East Lindsay in Lincolnshire and Hartsmere as well. Uh, that is uh, the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden's uh, constituency there. Uh, Labour have hung on to all of these councils here. The one or two that you see in grey or white have still not uh, declared. The Lib Dems also have hung on to all of those councils. North Devon, they're still counting counting and two gains among those that are hung for Labour, Plymouth and Stoke-on-Trent. So more red, quite a bit more red on this screen than blue and quite a bit of yellow as well. Will that change in the hours to come? We shall see. Thank you very much, Rita, because a reminder, of course, the losses for the Tories could slow down or speed up and the gains for the Labour Party could slow down or speed up. And of course, the Lib Dems, also their tally could go up and down at a rate of knots. We'll see what the next few hours brings. Let's check in for the final time before we go to breakfast news with Sir John Curtis, who's been feverishly working on all these incredible numbers. Um, John, what are your closing thoughts towards the end of episode one of Quite the Box Set? Well, I think if Conservatives were hoping that the message from the ballot boxes was that the party wasn't perhaps in quite so much electoral trouble, not quite so much in the slough of electoral despond as the opinion polls have been suggesting, then I think so far at least those hopes don't look as though they're going to be realised. We are, look at the moment, looking at the Conservatives recording fewer, a lower share of the vote uh, in our key councils than they did four years ago. And four years ago, it was already pretty bad. What is a little less clear is how much we should say that the plaudits go to Labour and how much the plaudits should go to the Liberal Democrats and to the Greens. Now, certainly when it comes to seat gains, it's definitely Labour who have made the, the biggest advance. But I think Labour will just be a little bit niggled about the fact that, again, when we add up the votes, the party doesn't seem to have made, at least in these local government elections, much of an advance on last year. I think it would at least like to have been at least up a point or two. In contrast, the Liberal Democrats are up a point or so. And in the end, if the Conservatives do, as they still seem to be at risk of uh, being uh, a 1,000 seats down on where they were at 7 o'clock uh, yesterday morning, uh, then it may well be the losses that the, Liberal the Conservatives suffered to the Liberal Democrats that will be a crucial part of that equation. And we may find the Liberal Democrats have just, it's not great progress, it's, it's slow progress, but the Liberal Democrats may have recorded their best performance since 2010. The Greens pretty much managed to hang on to the support that they uh, had in 2019, which was a record level, have done particularly well in the wards where they best had a chance. So, I mean, there are two ways of then looking at this so far as the opposition parties are concerned. One is to say, well, English local government is not like Westminster. It's more variegated. And therefore, don't be surprised that, that, that voters have sometimes used the Liberal Democrats and the Greens to express their dissatisfaction and not just Labour. The alternative way of looking at it is perhaps there is a message here that voters are not yet necessarily fully enthused about the Labour alternative, even if they are clearly disenchanted about the current Conservative government. OK, so John, well, we're always very enthused by your insight and wisdom. And thank you very much indeed for that. We are running short of time, but a final word to each of the panel. Um, so John, suggesting to you, Chris, that this could be your best performance in a long time at local council elections. Uh, well, I think it will be. And uh, when I left my house in Windsor, it was represented by three Conservatives. And when, by the time I get home, it'll be represented by three brilliant Liberal Democrats. 
And that's happening all over the country, north, south, east and west. And um, that's great. Sir John suggested that you might be a bit niggled, Peter Carroll. <laughs> I'm not niggled. Actually, uh, I'm quite ecstatic about the progress that we've made tonight. Uh, we, it, it's, not, it's not the right thing to do to compare last year's local elections to this year's local, local elections. This year's local elections is just in England and it's not including London. It's not including most of Manchester. You know, these are, are parts of the country that actually are quite challenging for the Labour Party. It shows that we're reconnecting to parts of the, the, to the country, to, the, to we England that we've the lost to. Words, but let's not have so, a, let's not have a round about so, statistics. Yeah. But, the, but the point he's making that I'm asking you to, to, to for your comment on is whether or not there is a bit where you just would like to be just a bit further forward to look more decisive. I think we are making really solid progress today. I mean, we're, we're really happy. This, we shouldn't equivocate about mm -hmm. this. I mean, the, the Tories have lost almost, are go on course to losing almost a third of mm -hmm. all of their seats that were available to win uh, tonight, the ones that they already held tonight. Uh, we're we're really gaining really substantially tonight. And then let's see what happens throughout the day because will, there's some we'll really important carefully. ones for us throughout the day. Um, we're, we'll watch, we're happy tonight. We'll watch that carefully. And Hugh, are you in the slough of despond, which Sir John suggested you might be, or maybe you ought to be? A, a really difficult night. It could get more difficult for us. Uh, but the reality is this is the voters sending a message to us. We need to listen. Of course, next time when they vote for a general election, it will be which of these two people do you want to run the country? That hasn't been the case for the elections we're going through. So I think we've got it all to turn it around. But we need to be humble. We need to listen and we need to deliver. OK, Hugh, Peter and Chris, thank you very much for being with us here. Chris, final word to you. So the party leadership teams are waking up before their big noises come out and talk to the Today programme and Breakfast TV and, and all the rest of it. Conservatives acknowledging it's been disappointing. Ed Davey, the Lib Dem leader, describing their results as groundbreaking. Uh, and Labour saying that they reckon that they would, uh, they would com be confident that with the equivalent vote share lead, uh, they would be on track to win the general election. Wow. So that's the take from those three big parties at, what, four minutes to six okay. and still shed loads of results to come. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Well, quite the prediction there from Labour HQ to take us out because in a few minutes we will hand you to the team at BBC Breakfast. They will be with you for the next few hours. Then later, a Politics Live special will have all of the latest results with my colleague Jo Coburn. She will be on BBC Two and BBC News from 12. But results as they come in are, of course, on the BBC website, where the results and the trends are constantly streaming in. A huge thank you in the meantime to all my guests here around the country and, of course, to our teams who've burned the midnight oil, staying up as the story has been developing across England, unfolding in front of our very eyes. It's been a very difficult night for the Conservatives. They predicted they might lose a thousand seats and it looks like that prediction might have been right. While Labour has taken councils like Plymouth and Stoke, although their share of the vote so far at this stage is barely up on last year's local elections. But remember, a huge amount more to come. The picture is as yet incomplete. It's the first big public verdict on Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister and an important marker for Keir Starmer, he hopes, on the road to number 10. But lastly, most of all, thank you for your company. It's been great to have you with us for the last few hours, but from, for now, from me and from BBC Election 2023, goodbye and I'll see you on Sunday. <laughs>